Hey guys, welcome to the channel. I hope you enjoy this mono recap. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks. We are introduced to a small cast of characters seemingly all in the same situation. Carl, the mercenary, Lai, the woodworker, Grit, an antique salesman, Jenna, a girl living in the forest, and Han, a farmer. All of these people are confused on where they are or how they got here. The landscape is unlike anything they've ever seen. Is this some sort of dream? The group tries to figure out the situation, but no progress is made, and they only start to argue. But all of a sudden, a mysterious fairy-looking girl asks what all the commotion is about. She tells them that their master is about to open a rift, so get ready to fight. This just confuses the group even more, as no one here seems to have any battle experience. She informs them that if they listen and stay in line, they won't be hurt. Carl gets assertive, wanting to know if this fairy is the one who brought him here, as he readies his sword. He will get the answer from her, even if it requires force. The fairy tries to warn him not to touch her, but Carl wants to teach her some manners. He winds back his sword to swing, but the moment it makes contact with the fairy, his throat is slashed, severing his head from his body. A notification appears that the two-star Mormont has returned to the embrace of the goddess. The rest of the group now knows the severity of the situation, and the fairy reiterates her words with a sinister look. If anyone lays fingers on her, they will die. The group panics, they weren't prepared to see someone decapitated like that, and asks what she wants. The fairy isn't the one in charge here, as she looks up to the so-called master. He forms a party with five one-star members of the group. She tells the people to get ready to fight, and she calls out to Lyle, Lanto, Marlin, Kaloud, and Jackson. She points towards the weird blue gate and tells them, unless they want to be headless like Carl over there, they should get into the fucking gate. They hop in the portal, and before they can continue, Han calls out to the fairy. He seems to have a basic understanding of what's happening. He knows their master wants to climb the tower. Why doesn't he summon a weapon? One stars without a basic weapon going into a dungeon is practically suicide. Jenna has no idea what this guy is talking about, but Han seems to be the only one who knows anything. He mentions that their only two-star hero was just murdered. The fairy agrees with his assessment and writes to the master asking for equipment. The guy uses 10x equipment summons and grants each of the members of the party with a weapon. Some people begin questioning Han and how the hell does he know anything about this place? But he just responds saying he doesn't know much. He's only been here for less than an hour, and the only thing he knows for sure is that if they don't catch on quick, they will be sure to die. He tells them to grab a weapon and get ready for battle. The party members start to panic, and none of them have any battle experience. But Han yells at them to first pick a weapon, then worry about what happens after. The group struggles over what weapons to pick, but eventually walks towards the gate. They notice that Carl's body is gone, and they approach the ominous blue gate. They stand there questioning where it will take them, but the fairy just urges them to walk in already. Jenna is still watching Han, inspecting a shield, wondering if he knows something that she doesn't. She asks him why they need weapons and what's with that fairy, but Han just answers vaguely that they need to go into the battlefield and kill enemies, and tells her to go figure out the rest herself. Damn, we already started this mano and our boy ain't no sim. Interrupting their conversation, one of the party members has already died and the rest of the party follows suit. Party 1 has been entirely wiped out. You lose. Jenna doesn't understand what is happening, but Han just sits there and ponders the situation, while the fairy is extremely mad. A new party is selected, Han, Jenna, Dazil, Grit, and Gale, and now it's their turn. The old man says he cannot fight, he has arthritis. But Jenna just drags him along, and the new party of five walks towards the blue gate, wondering if it will lead them to their deaths. The fairy wishes them luck, and they step inside the new landscape. They wonder where the hell they are now, some sort of tower? But Han warns them to get ready. The door is opening and the group is thrusted into a large field, called the first floor. The quest is subjugation and they need to eliminate all of the enemies. We see a pack of level 3 goblins, each equipped with a sword and shield. Han tries to ready his comrades, but everyone besides Jenna just throws up their weapons and runs away. Didn't the old man just complain about arthritis? He's sure running really fast. All three members are frightened, reducing their stats by 30%. They cannot run too far apparently, as they smack an invisible wall. They try to claw at it, but it won't budge. Han is not pleased with his group, but Jenna seems to be brave enough to help him kill the goblins. Han asks her if she can use a bow, and she says she can. Her father was a hunter. Han will fight close range while Jenna uses her bow. Han tells her not to worry about the other three, and focus on the incoming goblins. Han thinks to himself that he's never really used a sword and shield either, and his in-game name is Han Slap. 
but his real name is Han Seo Jin, and he thinks he ended up being sucked into a shitty ass RNG game. The goblin smacks down on his shield, but he braces. We are introduced to the mobile game that Han has been placed inside, called Pick Me Up. It was developed by Studio Mobius, and the goal of the game is to raid the 100 level tower by using heroes and establishing a base and building and collecting materials. Clearing the tower requires numerous resources and many clever tactics. It was only yesterday when Han was on his couch playing this game, and it seems it was the first time the game had an interesting event. You see, heroes range from 1 to 7 stars. Han was an unlucky guy. Even after thousands of free pulls, he was never able to unlock above a level 5 hero, and the item he wants from the event cannot be cleared without a 7 star one, so it looks like he can't participate. Pick Me Up was different from other games, it had a much more hardcore rule set. No matter how much you love the character, if they died, they were gone forever, regardless of their level. So scouting out difficult dungeons with a disposable party is a must. Han is doing this exact thing inside the new dungeon, and all of a sudden his heroes immediately get frightened, reducing their stats by 30%. His heroes start panicking and he sees a level 999 monster. And that's pretty ridiculous, it must be some sort of bug. Han just sighs thinking he lost 5 heroes, but it was to be expected. He zooms in on the boss monster to see its wicked face. It screams and says, it has found you. Causing Han's vision to go dark, he sees a system prompt, creating new account. Please choose a name. Han isn't the one typing, and whatever is chosen for the name. It selects it, and Han is thrusted into the tutorial. The quest is to defeat the goblins who invaded the village. Han is in this burning village environment and has no idea what is going on, as a goblin starts rushing at him. Reality sinks in that he's been transported inside the game he is addicted to playing. He catches on just in time and blocks the goblin strike. Multiple prompts give the player instructions on what to look out for. While Han is in a fierce battle with the goblin, he disarms it and deals a finishing blow. The system congratulates the player for passing the tutorial, and Han has leveled up. He looks around and sees a familiar place, and he is really inside, pick me up. The master is prompted to summon more heroes, and he gets one premium summon. He packs a super rare 4 star hero, Shay. Han understands the situation, he's just been summoned, just like her. The new 4 star hero introduces herself, and her class is Knight, with some pretty impressive stats. She greets Han and seems to already be okay with what's happening. Han does the same telling her his Korean name, but Shay just laughs at this weird last name, Seo Jin. The master, whatever, parties the two up and thrusts them into a dungeon. Shay is butchering the monsters while Han is having a hard time adjusting. She comments on his poor form, but it's to be expected of a level 1 hero, and especially someone who has never fought in his life. They clear the next dungeon and Shay is the MVP and leveled up. Han knows the difference in their power, but his next worry is what would happen next. One way to strengthen heroes in this game is through synthesis. Han realizes what is taking place, as the fairy orders him to get moving. Han knows her as Yasel, which startles her since no one should know her name. He introduces himself, which doesn't match his new character name, Han Slot. Yasel is confused, but Han explains that he always played this game, and he wasn't born here. Yasel asks if he came from Earth. That's impossible. Han answers sarcastically, but Yasel starts losing her mind. She tells him to get into the synthesis machine, but he protests that he's gonna die. But she yeets him in there anyways, telling him not to worry. The master starts the synthesis, and Han looks at his hands turning transparent. Synthesis works by combining two heroes together into one stronger one. Usually, the higher level hero would always keep their sense of self, and the lower one is destroyed. Right now, Han is a one star, while Shay is four. He curses this idiot player. Who the hell synthesizes a 4 star into a 1 star? Despite Han's thoughts, he wasn't in fact synthesized, and he gains the stats of Shay. He looks over to the poor girl as she accepts her fate and dissolves into the system. Han protests that this isn't what's supposed to happen, but Che gives him a soft smile, telling him it's all up to Han now. This was the events leading up to the beginning of the story, and now we're back at the battle. It seems the idiots who ran off begin dying one by one. Han tries to warn Jenna not to let her guard down, while the other two idiots are running away from the single goblin. In any case, Han has survived and the hero made an error with the system. The way to synthesize heroes is to drag and drop them, and it's meant to be used in a way where you drag a hero onto an Another. This moron master fat fingered the button, and that's the only reason why Han is still alive. He curses this shitty RNG game and yells to Jenna, what about the last two goblins? She only dealt with one, while another sneaks behind and strikes Han. He turns around in a fury and crushes the goblin's skull with his shield. He doesn't know how he was summoned here as Han's slot. 
But right before entering, he encountered that laughing level 999 monster. It must have been that bastard. But unknowing to that monster, it messed with the wrong guy. Jenna and Han survive the battle, but Han's arm is badly damaged. But he knows it will be healed when they return, so it'll be alright. He informs Jenna that heroes have little say in the game's combat, and battles are done automatically. The game that they're in has 100 million players, with the appeal being that one could watch over the battlefield like a god. As Han looks up to the giant eye of his so-called master, he smiles and asks him if it's fun. He also enjoyed this game, crafting items, coming up with strategies, discovering new spells, and different equips. He tells the master not to give up, even if it is a shitty game, because he's unlocked a special player. Han was ranked 5th in the world with the name Loki and is a master of mysteries and vows to survive until the very end. The stage is cleared and Han is the MVP and the master gets some basic materials. Han has come to accept his new condition and there's no time to lament. He was reborn as a level 1 hero and is currently making use of the training grounds. There is two ways to die in this game, through synthesis or through combat. He needs to raise his level. One star heroes are basically useless in this game. They have low stats and growth values are also very low. At this rate, he won't escape the fate of being combined. We see a picture of Han's stats and he's a one star, level five, his class is a novice and he has 15 in strength, intelligence, vitality, and dexterity. He trains vigorously in order to get stronger. And if he doesn't, he might not survive. All of this is reminding him of his mandatory military service. He needs to change his mentality as well. He needs to be calm on the battlefield. Han managed to survive in the real world without any help. This should be no different. He continues his workout and Jenna approaches confused on what he's doing. He says he's training to kill monsters. And it seems Jenna is in the same boat as Han and pondered all night on what she should do. Since they can't leave, she will try her hardest not to be in Han's way and grabs a bow and begins training as well. Nothing's gonna change if she sits around and cries. Han gets up and asks Jenna if this was her first real combat experience, which it was. He asks her how good she is with a bow and she answers that she's pretty okay. Jenna's stats are similar to Han's and she has 11 points all around and is at level 2, but has a prerequisite skill despite her 1 star status of beginner archery. Even though she's sloppy, she is able to snipe monsters which will be useful. Also, she doesn't seem to be the type to wallow over the game. This is exactly the kind of person that Han needs on his team. Jenna's father always told her that if she wanted to survive, she had to pick the right person to follow and extends her hand to Han. Han grabs it and a prompt shows that a friendship between the two has started. And now they will get bonuses in a party together. Han calls to Yassel and she pops out saying she's busy, but still showed up pretty fast. She tells Han sternly that all the answers he wants are inside the tower, but he just ignores her and asks if he is the only one that can see the status screen above her head. She tries brushing it off, but Han clearly sees that she is level 257. She doesn't know the answer and just assumes that he can since he has a weird existence inside of two worlds. Han thinks to himself that based off that reaction, it seems that he is the only one who can see these status bars. He asks Yassel what would happen if the master quits the game. She tells Han that he better pray that doesn't happen. He thinks about the situation that that moron master did. It was about a 1% chance to pack a 4 star hero with a free summon, and accidentally combining it with Han was a huge blunder that would make anyone quit. This game is linked to the phone and can't be reset and it's already been a week since he logged on. He asks Yassel another question. Does time flow differently here? But she is getting fed up and yells at him to stop asking these questions. But Han thanks her for her response, and he now assumes that in fact, it does. Han knows that the fairy can't mess with him and can only do so in self-defense, or when the hero rejects the master's order. He needs to find out the exact nature of the rules so he can adapt, otherwise he might be killed. Jenna asks what the two are talking about, but Han tells her their objective is to raid a hundred floor tower. And he explains the basic rules of the game, and if they manage to complete it, they will be released. Jenna wonders if that's even possible with just the two of them, and Hans informs her that the master will summon a lot of people just like them, and their actions will determine how long that they will live. But ultimately, their lives depend on the master's actions. After training for one day, Han found out a fun rule. All food and supplies will refill every day, and if he thinks about things that he wants, they will appear the next day in a drawer or a closet. This rule is limited and he can't just wish up weapons or guns, but also he found some things out about training that he didn't understand while playing. Oftentimes there were heroes with the same rank but different combat abilities. This has to do with how serious one took training. It does not directly impact one's skills, but it refines combat ability. There are three things the master will look at in new heroes. First, mentality. He will quickly dispose of heroes that are too quick to panic. Second is skills. 
High rank heroes are summoned with skills, while low rank ones have hidden talents that need to be trained and discovered. Third is physique, and that's the one Han is currently working on and it's been 3 days since he started his training. And the master logged back in. Han has received 2 skills through all of this training. Beginner swordsmanship and shield proficiency, both at level 1. He tells Jenna to get ready, the master is here, and he begins by summoning a party. Five are needed to create a party, so three new people should arrive. Aaron, Toby, and Yelson's all one-star heroes are summoned. Also wondering where the hell they are. Jenna yells that they need to be prepared to fight and to come close, but this news obviously doesn't sit well with the new recruits. The gate opens and the three are added to party one. Han tells Jenna to pick up a weapon before it's too late. The master gets a tip to equip his heroes with weapons, to better the odds in the dungeon. Yassel orders the three to hurry up, but they scream to be sent home. This is some cruel joke. Jenna tries to hold one of the men back, but he just wonders what side she's on. Was she the one who summoned them here? They all have lives they need to return to. Han doesn't seem interested in them and just hopes they don't touch Yassel. The party is thrust into the gate and Yassel tells the new people to just listen, like the other two over there. The gate closes and she tells them to have fun. They're transported to the second floor and the quest is also subjugation. They need to wipe out all of the enemies. The three immediately begin to panic and Han calls out to Jenna, who is ready. They are surrounded by goblins and wolves and the three new heroes all become frightened, reducing their stats. And so is Jenna. Han tries to calm her nerves which clears her of the status effect. The monsters begin charging in but Han strikes a wolf down, but is unhappy with his shitty weapon. Another wolf flanks Han but he manages to block its bite and he slashes at it. It jumps back but Han closes the distance and decapitates the wolf. He asks Jenna about the goblins but it seems she took care of them, but she keeps filling their dead body with arrows. She snaps back to reality and stage 2 has been cleared, and the master gains some more rewards and 5 gold. The whole party managed to survive, but the three immediately start panicking. Han thinks on the situation. If they get thrusted into the third floor right off the bat, they might sustain casualties. But to his surprise, the master has logged out. Han wonders if it's one floor per day for this guy, and he thinks if his theory around the time is correct, the guy should log in in another 3 days. Han leveled up and his stats improved slightly, but his intelligence has gone down one. His stat growth is still 4 points, but his leveling efficiency has gone up probably due to his training. He likes that the master isn't rushing either and if he gets time to train he can properly handle the next floors. The three new recruits start yelling at Jenna and why the hell do they have to fight? It seems one star heroes are just regular people, you can't expect them to do well on the battlefield, they never even held a weapon, but expectations don't matter in this game, it's either fight or die. Han remembers a 2 star Mormont and 4 star Shay. It seems higher ranked heroes start off with combat efficiency, and also have better mental capability, making Han think that they must have been summoned before. Jenna asks Han to help with the newbies, but he is uninterested in helping this useless trash. Jenna argues that they should at least make them their teammates and it's better than nothing. Han argues that they're going to disappear soon anyways, and Jenna is confused on what he means. But Han explains that 1 star heroes that don't improve, most likely will be combined. He tells Jenna not to worry about them. All of a sudden one of the guys wants to ask a question, but Han tells him to keep it to himself. But the man grabs Han, but is met with a fierce right hook dropping him. Han reminds him that while they were shitting their pants, it was he and Jenna who were fighting and spilling blood which seems to get the point across. The next day comes and Han and Jenna continue their training. Han's skills level up to 2 and the other 3 still didn't seem to come to training, and instead use the entire time to find an exit. The next day comes and Jenna and Han are back at it yet again, and Jenna accidentally shoots Han in the leg and asks if he's okay. He tells her not to worry about it, natural rules don't apply. He pulls the arrow out and his wound is instantly healed, and he gains a new skill pain resistance, and continues the training. The two continue their spar and Han levels his skill again, and they synthesize into a new one. He gains beginner sword and shield proficiency, and the master logs in again, and Yassel orders all the members to come to the square. Han and Jenna are ready to fight, while the other three have been in constant torment the last couple days, begging to be sent back. This just enrages Yassel and she sends the cowards flying, and vows that they will die today. The three get in line pretty quick and they're sent into the third floor. The quest is subjugation. Han tells Jenna that the goblins are smarter and have better gear, and also are stronger. The third floor ended up being no big deal, with Jenna being the MVP this time around. The master gets his materials in around 7 gold, and the two are getting the hang of it now. Jenna questions why the other three won't fight, but Han doesn't really care, and doesn't want to split XP with them anyways. A tip pops up saying when dealing with disobedient heroes, he can spin the Wheel of Fortune, and they will become better behaved. The master challenges floor 1 again and the party is transported back, 
and it's the same group of goblins and the stage is cleared easily, with Jenna being the MVP. The master is not going to let them rest if they keep clearing the floors so easily, and goes to this first floor yet again. They clear it and the master challenges the third floor right away. After this, Han and Jenna are exhausted but gain tons of XP. They exit the tower wondering how long they will have these three useless teammates, and as Han has predicted, the master has grown tired of them too, and has opened the synthesis chamber. Han bids these morons farewell. If you can't adjust to the situation, then this is your fate. Han thinks that in this cruel life, you need to take the chances that you have been given. The master is not clueless and can see who is active in battle, and who doesn't contribute. He adds Han and Jenna to his favorites and they are ordered into the synthesis room. Han reassures Jenna that nothing will happen to her, but the man from before asks what will happen to them. Han coldly tells them that they are being judged. But the man yells in despair, he never asked to be here or to fight. But Han reminds him that the same happened to him, and tells him the outcome may have been different if he at least tried to fight. The older man begs for his life but is synthesized into Jenna, and she levels up gaining a new skill, Hawkeye. She wonders where the other guy went, but Han tells her the dark truth of that chamber, and now it's his turn. Toby is called and the man's face drops in despair, but in his madness he thinks that now he will finally be sent home. The synthesis is complete, and Toby turns into light and disappears. Han levels up and gains a new skill, Composure. He passes by the remaining hero and tells him that he's lucky, and reminds him if he's gonna be useless, he's gonna be the next one in there. Han asks Jenna why she looks sad, didn't she say she wouldn't be left behind? But she cannot help but think about what will happen if the master gets bored of her. Han just tells her that the higher that they progress, the more likely it will be that they will die in the tower, so stop worrying about it, it won't do you any good. Han tells her if she really wants to live, follow what your father said, get close to those who are strong. The next day comes and Han continues his training, and Jenna comes and bows asking Han to take good care of her. She listened to his advice from yesterday and swears to listen to him, without question. Han doesn't know how to react to this, and tells her as long as she is diligent, there shouldn't be anything to worry about. But all of a sudden, the remaining player, Aaron, yells asking to join the training. He apologizes for his mistakes and knows he was only being an anchor to the team. For now on, he will trust and fight with them. He doesn't want to die. Han asks how he can trust this man, but he says he will beg on his knees if he has to. Han hands him a spear and asks if he's fought a monster before, and he hasn't, before coming here, just like Han. The spear is the easiest weapon to pick up due to its long range. Han asks if the two know the difference between long, medium, and short range. Jenna excitedly answers that a sword is for close range, a spear is for medium, and a bow is for long. Forming a party of these different ranges is the most effective way to survive. Han readies his sword and tells the man to get ready. He did ask to be taught, and Han never used a spear, so the best way to learn is through battle. Just be thankful you have an opponent to fight. Han only had scarecrows. Aaron closes his eyes and swings his spear, but Han kicks him in the chest, telling him not to close his eyes during battle. Aaron grabs his stomach in pain, but Han reminds him that if he was a monster, Aaron would have died just now. Jenna wonders if Han is being too harsh, but Han reminds the two that they will be left behind if they can't keep up. He asks Aaron if he has a family, and Aaron tells him that he has a little sister at home. He points his sword towards Aaron's neck, asking what would happen if he's unable to return. It'll be painful to die to a monster, or to be combined. If you don't have the courage to survive, give up. Aaron grits his teeth and Han is happy with a spark the man has in his eyes. The master logs in and builds a forge for 500 gems. Han has unlocked free roam and goes into a quiet corner and calls to Yasel. She gets angry with Han making her become his little assistant and tries to punch him. Han is tired of these useless beginner tips and asks if Yasel has the ability to go on the internet and interfere with the system. Yasel's hobby is actually surfing the web and she sends the master tips that he is using to progress the game. Han tells her to send him a tip that is popular on the forum, one posted by Loki. Yasel is shocked that he knows who this is, but Han reminds her that he was a user after all. She mocks him saying he was probably a noob and is nowhere near her idol Loki. Han just laughs and asks if she really likes Loki, and she confidently states that she does. He is the best player who cleared all of the impossible content. Han apologizes for the news, but he is in fact Loki. Yasel laughs nervously, asking what the hell he's talking about. But Han tells her his account number, and due to the risk of being hacked, only the master and the server admins have access to this code, and tells her to check it for herself. She does and realizes that what he's saying is true, and asks him for an autograph. She is even a VIP member of a fan guild Ragnaloki. This is the first time that Han has ever heard about that, 
and she tells him that it's Loki's fan cafe, and his signature is needed to become a VIP member. But this is the first time Han has ever heard about it. Yasel is now questioning her entire life and regrets the way she's been talking to Han this entire time. She apologizes, but Han doesn't care. He's a one star after all. But Yasel just yells saying, hold up, what will happen to his base, Niflheim? Without him, Han doesn't know. Niflheim was the name of his waiting room. There is 13 floors of nothing but waiting rooms, and it has the capacity to hold 20,000 people. He has the best of the best equipment and infrastructure, at level 18 to 22. But the master is now trapped in the game. Yasel wonders what will happen to his troops, but Han tells her that if she's concerned, then get him out of this game. She doesn't have the power to do so, and Han figured that much. Anyways, back to the main point. The owner of this room is a human from Earth, right? And the summon heroes aren't AI. Yasel confirms his assessment. The master, whatever, doesn't know he's controlling real humans, and is just a regular guy enjoying the game. Han asks if Yasel knows if he can climb to the 100th floor, and if he does so, maybe he can leave. She also doesn't know the answer to that question, but Han asks another. Who brought me here? Yasel can't answer that question also, and Han sighs. He thinks he'll have to find these out for himself after climbing the tower. He asks one last question and how much authority does Yasel actually have within the game. And all she can do is give advice and open and close facilities and assist with the automated activities. Han asks if all waiting rooms are the same, and Yasel says that they're all similar but not quite the same. Han ponders if there's really 100 million of these waiting rooms along with his. Mobius Summon is a system to create an endless supply of heroes by mixing together thousands of patterns, but that was a lie. The heroes that are summoned are actually real people. Han can't believe the disinformation that he's discovering, and all of his decisions led to countless deaths of real people. He calls to Yasel and tells her if she wants to climb the tower, she better listen to his instructions. Jenna is a genius. Her growth can't be associated with a one star, and she is gaining skills with the dagger, despite never using it. Aaron, on the other hand, is sluggish and might die soon. Han goes back to the two, and Jenna just finished whooping Aaron's ass, confident in her own ability. Jenna asks if it's time for him to teach his number one student, but Yasel pops out of nowhere saying, who the hell does Jenna think she is? Yasel is his number one student, and the two begin arguing. Han grabs Yasel and tells her to get back to work. And Yasel keeps screaming inside of Han's hand, and he is regretting telling her the truth. Nighttime comes and they approach the warehouse and ask Yasel to open it. Han enters and takes six iron ore, three leather, and four wooden planks, and asks Yasel to open the forge. It's time to upgrade their equipment. After speaking with Yasel, Han learned that his existence in the game is half that of a hero and half master. He approaches the forge and Yasel questions what he will craft. He selects a very difficult weapon. He receives several penalties that the forge is a low level, an artisan is not present, and he has no blueprints, and the success rate is atrocious. Would you like to proceed? Han says to switch it to manual and the game prompts him to choose a puzzle difficulty to improve the odds of success. He picks the hardest one, Ultra Hell, and the puzzles are mini games that the masters play. Not all of them do this, but the rewards are quite worth it. Han sees a different computer-like environment and has a time limit of 3 minutes. Han doesn't know what shape to make at first, but he has done this many many times. The system prompts him to start and he begins grabbing small cubes at a rapid speed. And after some time he gets a system prompt, super success. Han has made a well forged iron longsword, Yasel is in awe of his creation, a very good early game weapon. Han continues crafting and has an ultra great success and crafts a balanced short bow. He continues and crafts another ultra success and finishes a sharp long spear. And for his last piece he crafts a solid steel shield. He stretches after a hard night's work and all the weapons he made are C rank. He can't be too disappointed with the materials that he had available. Any more crafts than this will be too noticeable. He doesn't want the master getting any misunderstandings. The next day comes and the three are thrusted into the fourth floor testing out their new weapons and Aaron and Jenna are shocked with their new equipment. But nonetheless the master is asking too much of this party of three and not even giving them two more heroes. Han asks Jenna to take care of the harpies as they rush in at them and Aaron gets to frighten the debuff. But Jenna smacks him back to his senses, warning him that he'll die if he panics like that. Han charges in telling the two to get their head back in the game and they clear the stage and Aaron levels up. The master gets some materials and 10 gold and they return, and Aaron is visibly exhausted. Aaron was now registered under favorites and just when he was questioning what would happen to him, Han informs him of what just happened, and it looks like he won't die just yet. Aaron shouts at the top of his lungs and after all of his hard work, it's finally paid off. 
Jenna tells Han that his second student is coming along well. Han goes to the equipment shed and thinks to himself that technically his first student is Cyrus from Niffle. The five members of Party 1 are all six stars and level 99 with divine weapons that Han personally crafted for them. He had high hopes that maybe he could meet them one day in this cruel game. At this time his base must be idle, but Cyrus should be fine on her own. He trained her well to take care of things while he's gone. But now that he thinks about it, they aren't AI. We shift to Han's base and we see Cyrus in a full suit of armor, conversing with someone behind her. They are worried about their master, and Cyrus is going to investigate. Back in our boys' new waiting room, the residence has been upgraded to level 2, and with that, the hero capacity has gone up, and the residence will allow heroes to have high quality meals. The training grounds has also been upgraded to level 2, and the effectiveness of training has been increased. The armory's three auxiliary buildings, the forge, woodshop, and refinery, have all been synthesized, producing the equipment workshop. And finally, the town square upgrades to level 2. Jenna is shocked at what just happened and Aaron thinks the master is some sort of mage, but Han is the only one who understands that the master just splurged some real money upgrading everything. And really, he had no choice. This is when the game starts actually getting fun. As the group clears more floors, the waiting room will get better and better, and the master gets more excitement from watching his heroes fight. Han notices that this time the master is online more consistently, which makes him think he has a 9 to 5 job, and has no problem spending money on the game. Yassel comes to Han and shows him the new $65 package that the master has purchased. Pick Me Up is a game that awards gems for completing tasks, and doesn't have events that give extra ones. Because this number of free gems is limited, and being able to buy gems is always a available, it makes this game pretty much pay to win. But Han is happy that his master is down to throw money. Interrupting his thoughts is a hero summoning, and it's time to greet their guests. There are two ways to summon, regular free summons and premium summons, with premium summons being more valuable in game, and a large group of people arrive, confused on what's going on. But Han can't stand seeing the same thing happen again. He points his sword towards the first person who approaches him and tells the group that he will only explain what's going on to those who have their shit together. Yassel gets right to business asking if any of these folks are carpenters and starts dividing them based on their professions, further confusing the bunch. Jenna is confused, but Han tells her that she's just dividing up jobs, and it'll be better for these people to work instead of fighting. Han thinks to himself that if the people who died in the past were summoned now, they might have not been sent out to fight, because now there'll be a new system in the waiting room. The Master forms a new party with Zid, Hanson, John, and Teddy, and Han thinks that the Master is getting better, and is already categorizing useful heroes, and weeding out the one stars by sending them into a dungeon. The newly formed party enters the dungeon, and one of them immediately dies. Han notices and Jenna thinks that he should at least have prepared them for what was going to happen, but Han doesn't see the reason for this, since they'll die sooner or later. Another member dies and Han estimates that at least two should come out unscathed. The young boy calls out to his friends and they need to fight but are unsure if they can do it. Aaron sees this and volunteers to join the third party which is comprised of these young men. Han delivers a tip to the master explaining why he should allow it. Han gives a last piece of advice to Aaron as he walks into the dungeon, telling him that helping is fine, but make sure they can take care of it themselves. Aaron nods his head and enters with party 3. Jenna yawns and complains about eating potatoes all day, but Han scares her, letting her know that the god of this world is always watching them, but tells her not to worry too much about what she says. The master cannot directly hear their voices, but gets a condensed message, as we see one star Jenna and Han complaining about the food. Party 3 comes back without any casualties, and Aaron didn't do much, he only killed one goblin, and lets the kids get used to battle. Han signals everyone to go to the residence to take a break and eat, and everyone is in awe of the new building, that actually resembles a real kitchen. Maybe now they can eat some steak. Han reminds them to calm down, don't expect too much just yet, and the man designated to be a chef brings out a bowl of potatoes, and it seems he was lying about his culinary ability. Han looks over and sees his stats and notices he has no culinary skill. He looks around at the crowd and sees a fine girl named Chloe and promotes her to chef. Dolph was demoted, but Han makes sure to remind him not to lie about his skills again, or he's gonna end up like the party that just died. After a while, Chloe comes up with a variety of potato-based dishes that leaves everyone excited. Han calls to all the new people, telling them to listen, and they better repeat these words to anyone new. That is, if you want to survive in this world. We don't see what he said, but the new group seems very nervous. Jenna tries to cheer the mood, saying that she's never fought before, but with Han's help, she's getting better every day. Han appoints Eek to be a carpenter and Chloe to be the chef, and it's ideal for people to have jobs within the settlement, so they don't have to risk their lives in the battlefield. Dolph tries to secure another job, but Han warns him about lying. He'll be good material for synthesis if he is. Han tells the non-combatants that they're safe for now, but don't get too relaxed. If someone is summoned with a better skill, they'll be demoted back to combat. 
The next day comes and the three teenage boys join training and Han is a little disappointed, but he was getting bored of whooping Aaron's ass all day. Aaron is also not a good teacher for them, since the difference in power between him and Han is that of a child versus a man. So the boys were in for a rude awakening. Han thinks that this level of growth that he has is impossible in the real world. The game can make one exponentially stronger. Jenna is already level 5 in archery and 2 with beginner short sword. Aaron is only level 2 with the spear, but he's struggling to get any progress, even though he works the hardest. After some days of intense training, the three boys obtain level 1 swordsmanship. They seem to be tied together since they are the same age and they now refer to Han as boss. Han likes them better than the other cowering idiots and another few days pass by and a 10x free summon was used. Aaron takes responsibility to explain the situation to the new recruits and only one person has died in the last coming days. Jenna asks Han why the master hasn't sent them to the 5th floor and Han thinks to himself that the 5th floor is completely different than the previous 4 but he tells Jenna that party 1 hasn't been finalized yet. Every 5 floors of the tower, the difficulty rises, almost like a boss floor. There's even a chance that Han himself doesn't survive. Who knows the casualties they will have in the future. He doesn't see any reason to tell Jenna any of this information and cause her to panic prematurely. Two of the boys join Han, Jenna and Eren inside of the fourth floor. The monsters start rushing in while Han watches with his arms crossed and reminds the two boys that they are the shields. No need to get reckless. They block the oncoming assault from the harpies and goblins but Han thinks that even the weak have their way of fighting. The best thing to do is utilize a group rather than each individual. Han didn't even participate in this battle but they still managed to clear the stage, with Jenna as the MVP. The master gets the rewards and the boys manage to return unharmed. The situation is starting to look up. The master has been logging in more and more and in the next free summon they got a blacksmith and tanner and activated the equipment workshop. All these new additions work together with the carpenter to produce E-rank swords and shields that are distributed to the new recruits. But only the main party received the high tier equipment. Three people including Dolph who didn't train and tried to run were used as synthesis material. A few days pass by and the boys are anxious to try the fifth floor. The group walks towards the gate confident in their abilities and they travel to a new location in a torn down city. Han is looking over the landscape and thinks to himself that this situation isn't ideal. The quest type isn't subjugation. Zit screams after seeing a decomposed corpse and Aaron and Jenna ask why this level is so different. But Han coldly reminds the group that the previous floors were just a warm up and the real battle starts now. He asks if Jenna can climb the bell tower and she does so but sees an army of goblins rushing towards them. Han asks for the exact amount and she just screams that there's over a thousand of them. The quest type of this floor is to survive and Han orders Jenna to come down. He tells the group of the new quest type and they're looking around but it seems they're unable to hide inside of buildings. Han is desperately searching to find a defensible position and he tells the group that they need to survive for only 10 minutes and it's doable. In his mind however, Han curses his luck as the real timer is 30 minutes. He doesn't want to share the exact information with his teammates so they don't lose morale because when this type of quest is offered at lower floors, the survival rate is only 9%. It isn't hard for higher floors but right now it's known as a hero grinder for level 1 heroes. Han quickly tries to take the group into an alleyway trying to find something to work with. They enter and Han says that this is where they'll hold their ground. Han says that the number of goblins don't matter if they're forced into choke points. Han will handle the left entrance, Aaron will handle the right, and the two boys will take the back. He tells the boys to fight in turns and take time to recover. Jenna is on standby for each entrance and is instructed to save arrows, and not to fire until told. He quickly orders the men to try and build barricades. If one side falls, they all will die. The timer will only start once they come into contact with the goblins, and right on cue, the first one sniffs them out. The barricades aren't finished and they'll have to use the goblins corpses to make a wall. Han cuts down the first one but a horde begins to fill the passageway. Han notices their attack pattern and tells the group to exploit this weakness. The goblins keep rushing in and Eren desperately confirms with Han that they only need to hold for 10 minutes, right? Han yells telling Eren to trust him but in reality there's only 26 minutes left. He hopes he doesn't die in a place like this. Han continues his assault and tells Zid to switch with Hansen and Han himself is starting to lose stamina. The others are already drained. Han needs to conserve his energy and he kills each goblin goblin with only one strike. He tries to comfort his party telling them that the goblins are weak and not to let up. But there's too many of them. The goblins don't feel fear no matter how many of them die. They just keep swarming. Han calls for the boys to switch again and tells Jenna to assist them. Eren continues chopping down goblins wondering if it's been 10 minutes yet. Han lies saying that only 5 has passed but all of a sudden Zid is struck and is bleeding. Han calls for Hansen to switch and tells Hansen not to worry about Zid if they survive. 
they will all be healed. Just hold off the goblins. Zid starts to cry, but Han comes in telling him to man up or they'll all die here. He tells Jenna to stop his bleeding and continues his assault on the goblins. Hanson's sword is beginning to dull, but Han tells him to use the blade regardless. And if it breaks, use your shield. He orders Jenna to switch with Aaron, and he tells him that there's three minutes left. He orders Hanson to switch with Zed and Jenna to assist them. She uses her remaining arrows on that side and Zed tries to call a switch with Hanson but he's pierced in the stomach and is in a critical condition. Jenna starts losing her control. She doesn't know how to help Zed. Hanson tries to call for the switch but doesn't know that Zed is still on the floor. Han is desperately trying to hold his side down but is getting overrun. He tells Hanson to take care of the other passageway but a message pops up that Zed has died. He lies to Hanson saying that he's only resting and to get back into the fight. He tells Jenna to forget about Zid and continue fighting the goblins as well. She gets a skill awakening, increasing her short sword level to 3, and gained nimble movement. She asks how much time is left, but Han says that he cannot check and just keeps fighting. We get another notification that the spirit of heroes awaken in the most dire situation. Han, beginner sword and shield raised to level 5, his pain resistance to level 2, and his composure leveled twice to 3. Hansen is stabbed and is bleeding, begging to be saved, but a swarm of goblins descend on him, and he too has returned to the embrace of the goddess. Han quickly orders Aaron and Jenna to move with him, there is no time to mourn. The two wonder if they are going to die in this dungeon, but Han orders Jenna to climb the wall behind him. Han and Aaron hold the enemies at bay and Jenna reaches the top. He tells Aaron to get up there too and he will hold the line. As he's climbing, Aaron is stabbed in the leg. Han leaps at the goblin killing it in a single blow and he cuts off Aaron's leg to free him so he can move up. But now Aaron is bleeding and will lose health quickly. Han tells Jenna to pull Aaron up, but the goblins are swarming on top of each other to reach their position. The goblins are about to overrun them as Han and Jenna try to stab at them as they climb up. Jenna drops Aaron's spear in her own panic and tries to use her feet to kick the goblins down, desperately trying to know how much time is left. Han says 30 seconds. He tells them to hold out a little longer, but a pair of hands grabs Han. He goes to slice at the goblin, but he is stabbed in the stomach. He is shocked but regains his grip and uses his anger to kill the two goblins that are on top of him. That's not all however, because Jenna is also bleeding and the entire goblin horde starts to descend on Han. He laments in his despair, only being able to get to the fifth floor. This isn't fair. He struggled this whole time just for this. Why? Why me? He screams. As his eyes fill with rage, they turn black and he catches a second wind. He won't die like this, not on the fifth floor. He starts butchering the goblins around him as he gained a new skill awakening, Berserk. He orders these bastards to come at him and his body is screaming in pain and every breath is becoming hard. But he yells to these little shits to come at him. If they want to kill him, he won't break and will never fall. He slashes at the goblins wave after wave until eventually his sword breaks. But even that won't stop him as he lunges in again. But the timer reaches zero. And right before he was surrounded and killed, the floor is cleared. The master receives five golden materials and Han, Jenna and Aaron level up. Han is the MVP and a new daily dungeon has been unlocked. The three return to the waiting room and Aaron passes out. And all Jenna can do is laugh. She asks for a hand and it seems they survived after all. She asks if the next floors will be just as hard, but Han tells her that that one was just unique. Han curses himself. If he trained Zid and Hansen a little bit longer, they would have been fine. But even a seasoned party would have struggled. The three come out, and the last of the group of boys goes to greet his boss, asking where his friends are. But Han just informs him that they died. Now, party one has two vacant slots. Han goes to his room and collapses on the bed. He never intended on being sentimental when someone died. Death will be with him every time he goes to these floors and he needs to get used to it. He did gain a new skill, Berserk, but he thinks to himself that Composure and Berserk cannot coexist. The fact that he has them both has to be a bug. Composure lets him hold on to his sanity, but sacrifices it in exchange for more power. This is probably because he is a master and a hero, but he can't think about it anymore today. Tomorrow, he will train again. For now, he just needs some rest. The next day comes and Jenna is training hard and Han is surprised that she's up so early. Usually she sleeps in. But after the fifth floor, Jenna realized her own weakness and she also gained skills through combat. Aaron struggled through the entire dungeon and didn't get a skill. Han begins his training and thinks that his growth is limited to 5. We see an update of his stats and he's level 9 with 23 strength, 11 intelligence, 21 vitality and 21 dexterity. And once he hits level 10, he should advance to a 2 star. But interrupting his thoughts, Jenna starts feeling his abs but our boy ain't no simp and just bonks her on the head for interrupting his training. He questions how she can be so shameless in public, especially after what happened yesterday. Aaron didn't come to training and he's probably mourning his two students deaths. 
He was close to them after all. The boys and Aaron were the only ones training with passion. The others in the grounds only do so to avoid being synthesized. Sid and Hansen have some potential, but they're gone now. Aaron joins Han and Jenna, apologizing for being late, and curses himself, saying if he was just a little bit stronger, maybe his students would have survived. But Han reminds him that they died because they were weak. There's nothing else to it. We zoom out and Han has been in this world for a month. But most likely, only 10 real life days have passed. He analyzed the master's login windows, and the time difference between the two worlds is about a factor of three. The master whatever logs in three times per day. When the group goes into the tower, the time goes back to normal. His son appears and congratulates Han for surviving the mission with only one star heroes, as expected of Loki. Jenna wonders why she's acting like that, but Han tells her that it's a secret. She goes to a new batch of summons and tells them not to be lazy, if they want to live. A new party is formed. Han, Jenna, Louis, Joffrey, and Owen is the new party one, and they're going to go into the daily dungeon. Jenna is confused at these three new additions, but they enter the daily dungeon anyways. Owen introduces himself, nervous at the prospect of fighting, but Han reassures them that no one will be fighting here today. The group enters the daily dungeon, Kenout Forest, which is rated super easy. It will return after collecting materials. Jenna wonders where the enemies are and thinks that it's the same type of quest as the fifth floor, but Han just pinches her cheek and says that their objective today is quite easy. All they need to do is collect materials. He points to the portal and tells the team to think of it as a shopping basket. Throw all the materials they collect in there. He adds a branch and a tip appears that a hundred branches can be made into lumber. The three new recruits wonder if that's really it, but Han reassures them that it is, and orders Jenna to come with him. They are gonna go hunting. And she's excited to finally get her hands on some meat. She spots a deer and her eyes light up. She kills it in one shot and Han asks if she knows how to butcher this creature, and she says she does. She begins the process and Han reminds her to throw all the materials into the gate, and not to miss anything. He goes on further into the forest and spots a beautiful waterfall. He checks the time and he has about 32 minutes left, and when that timer is up, they'll automatically be transported back. He looks around the pond and spots his prey, the queen of the forest. A rare monster that only appears in the forest in this time of day. It contains a low grade attribute stone that is a useful material. They don't always spawn but Han memorized all of its spawn points. He pounces on the group of beasts and kills the lesser ones, leaving him and the queen one on one. Han points his sword at the monster, urging it to come at him. The three stooges see something approaching from the forest and scream thinking that it's a monster, but are surprised to see that it's only Han, returning with the corpse of the queen. He drops it down and asks Jenna to help him butcher it, and she's in awe of this deer's size. She tells Han that she brought two deer and a boar herself. She questions why Han brought the head as well, since it's not so tasty, but Han is interested in the horn, and he can't cut it himself. Jenna starts butchering the creature and gains another skill awakening, acquiring Hunter of the Forest. Han is noticing her progress and he himself receives the low grade wind attribute stone, rank D. Some time passes and we shift back to the waiting room residence and for the first time, a real meal is being served. Han isn't excited like everyone else and just tells Jenna to come with him when she's finished. Daily dungeons are based on a system where the location changes depending on the day of the week. Today is the Simro Plateau, a dungeon where Han can get another one of those attribute stones. Han and Jenna enter the dungeon and Jenna questions if she can really get stronger gathering materials. Han tells her that they will need attribute stones from this place to do so. But Jenna zones out and admires the amazing view. Han looks over as well but spots a plant of life, a herb that is the main ingredient in recovery potions. He makes a note to collect some on his way back. Jenna and Han finish off a single dire wolf that they were fighting and Han tells Jenna to hurry up and butcher it before the pack arrives. As he contemplates what to do with the claws and fangs, Jenna says how she wishes that she could do this every day, live in the wild and hunt. It would be so peaceful without the master here. Han feels a little guilty since he was once a master and as he wonders if his own heroes felt that way in Niflheim. Han asks Jenna if she doesn't want to fight. It's not like she's forced to. He can set her up with a profession. But Jenna is steadfast and will follow Han until the very end. We time skip to a few days later and the newly formed party with Dika is being sent to the sixth floor. The quest type is search. They need to investigate the landscape. Aaron is confused and starts questioning where the enemies are, but Han tells him to be quiet and stay down. His three party members take this order too literally and start crawling on the floor. Han scouts the area and notices that it's clear for now, and wants to get an ambush on three level 8 goblins camping out. Before they do, one of them has a horn and can alert the others. He asks Jenna to climb a tree and she sees a goblin village, and there's about a hundred gathered there. 
Han needs to be careful not to alert that village. He orders Jenna to snipe the goblin on the right, and Aaron to throw his spear at the goblin that he baits in, and tells Dika to be on standby. The ambush begins and Jenna and Aaron kill their targets, and Han slices the head of the goblin trying to use the horn. We get a stage clear notification and awards are given. Dika wonders if that's it and Han tells him that there's still more to do, and goes forward to scout ahead. Even though this is a random floor, they haven't been teleported out, and exploration is still available. There must be more to this stage. He approaches the goblin village and then quickly returns, and escorts his party back to the waiting area. For hints to appear in main dungeons, it usually means that the area has some sort of side quests called streams. Being able to analyze and complete streams depends on how competent the master is. As he returns, Chloe tells Han that there's trouble. Some strange people have arrived. Han takes a look and instantly knows what's happening. Some high rank heroes have been summoned. The pulverizing wolf mercenaries. The group of five have a strong bond and gain bonuses for being in a party together. Han asks Yassel if the master spent money and is informed that he did and purchased the newbie starter pack. Han tells Chloe to go back into the kitchen and don't do anything rash. He reassures his team, saying that nothing changes, because they arrived. Jenna aggressively approaches one of the female mercenaries, saying hello, and she's taken off guard, but introduces herself as Edith. Edith is a 3-star hero with the class Thief. Han analyzes her stats and is impressed with the dagger-using hero. Han skips the BS and asks to talk. They go into the residence and sit down, and Edith asks if Han knows where they are. He just answers vaguely, saying that he only knows some things, but first asks Edith on what she knows prior to being summoned. She only knows that she's been summoned to fight and her memory is a little hazy. He questions her if she knows something about synthesis, trying to find an information gap between lower and higher level heroes. She remembers being part of a mercenary group, but that's the last thing that she remembers and ever since then she woke up here. Han is impressed with the group that was summoned, but Yassel interrupts the conversation, telling the mercenaries it's time for them to be useful. The master is calling. Jockin, the big dude with an axe, is asking who the hell is calling for him as he eats a drumstick from the kitchen. Chloe tells Han that Jockin is carelessly taking food from the pantry and is eating enough for five people. Jenna gets frustrated and Han bites his lip, knowing how this group will act moving forward. Party 5 is renamed to the Pulverizing Wolves and they're being sent on their first mission, with Avant being their leader. One of the villagers starts getting worried, telling Han that something feels off about this group. They spawned in with weapons. Han says that he also has a weapon, but the man continues that it still doesn't feel right. They don't look like good people. Han thinks that this causing commotion is not ideal, but the group is strong. They are sent into their first assignment while Han watches, asking Jenna what she thinks. She seems to only like Edith and Han asks the man what he wants him to do about these new arrivals. Protect you? The man loves that idea, but Han isn't about to protect anybody for free. Han reminds this man that he is one of the people slacking off in training, so how dare you ask for help? Is begging the only way you know to survive? He looks at some of the useless villagers and none of them are even close to Tika. All they do is pretend to train and eat all of their food. Han begins getting angry at this useless garbage and he tells them to get lost. Han looks towards Aaron and tells him while his leg was being chopped off, bleeding his life away, these were the same people slacking off and eating their food. Don't have pity for them. Dika approaches with a pretty roughed up face and it seems he tried to duel them. Han just sighs and tells the group to go rest. Jenna sticks around just to bother Han and shortly after the mercenary group comes back. Their leader asks who Han is, but he just tells him that that's none of his business. Jaqen starts getting angry on how Han and Jenna are talking, but the leader of Vant introduces himself formally. He asks if Han is also a mercenary due to his stature and weapon but is shocked to hear that Han is a simple farmer. Avant also asks if the people gathered here was the total population of the town. Interrupting their conversation, the master starts summoning more heroes and immediately begins synthesizing them into his new 3-star mercenaries. The new summons are not surprisingly confused at what the hell's going on, but they die quickly after. Jenna is taken aback by this, but Han just stands and watches. Jockin grabs people by the neck, dragging them in to their certain deaths. But this is Han's first time seeing paid summons. They act with no regard for other heroes. Jenna voices her concerns, but Han just stands there with his arms crossed. While it is true that one-star heroes can grow and have potential, this is the reality for the majority of them. But nonetheless, the master is using one-stars as material without even examining them first. Jockin exits the chamber feeling stronger, while more summons are used as materials. Avant orders his men to stop the new summons from trying to run away. Avant turns to Edith, wondering why she isn't following his orders, but she reluctantly draws 
draws her daggers. Han quickly talks to Giselle, telling her to send a tip to the master. The tip is to examine one stars for potential before using them as synthesis material. Han thinks to himself that he has seen so many things in this new life that it could probably scar him forever. But Jochen interrupts his thoughts overhearing the tip, asking if Han means to get in their way. Han smirks and answers sarcastically, and Jochen is enraged. He swings his axe at Han, but Jenna sends an arrow right past the berserker's head, warning him not to continue. The next one won't miss. Avant feels disrespected, asking if Han means to raise his weapon towards their group, asking if he knows who they are. Han replies that he does. They are a group of trash. Four out of the five members of the group instantly become hostile with Han. Giselle tries to calm the situation, warning them not to continue, but Han tells her not to intervene, but continues talking to Avant. He doesn't think their group is real mercenaries, but instead, just some petty thieves. Avant gets serious, asking if Han wants to be cut down, and Han tells Giselle that these type of summons will only get in their way. Sometimes, these personalities are summoned regardless of rank or level, and they only cause chaos in the waiting room. Before Giselle can speak, Han challenges Avant to a duel. A tip is shown to the master and that duels happen to resolve disputes in the waiting room. Avant thinks Han is crazy, but sees he's determined to fight him. Han knows why they are acting this way. They look down on everyone in the waiting room, and they think no one is strong enough to take them on. Han makes a simple wager for their duel. The winner will consume the other through synthesis. Avant smiles and accepts this condition. Han stretches his arms, ready for the fight, but whatever, the master, declines the duel. He doesn't want to lose a 3 star or Han. Han tells Jenna to take all the spectators to the residence, and sends a tip to the master telling him that he's feeling quite confident. The master accepts the wager after a second request and the duel begins. Han tells Avant that this will only end when one of them surrender. The man agrees since he wants a fresh offering, and Han asks Yassel for one last favor, to conceal the duel so no one can interfere. Avant rushes in while Han analyzes his stats. The man's strength is at 20 and his swordsmanship is at the third stage. However, Han has a trick up his sleeve and activates Berserk. All of his stats are increased by 5 and Avant tries to slash at him but Han slips past, grabbing his head and plunging him into the ground and driving his sword into the man's shoulder, causing him to screech in pain. He whispers into his ear that he can surrender now but as the man is trying to ask for mercy, his head is bashed into the floor repeatedly. One of his party members asks to let the man go already but this just makes Han laugh. Did you want to let the other summons go, when they could have been used as food? The man tries to yell that it's not relevant, but Han thinks that it is, telling him not to butt in. Avant agreed to this duel, and it will only stop when he surrenders. As Avant tries to muster the word, his head is repeatedly slammed again and again. He grabs him by the mouth, telling the group that Avant is his prey. Him living or dying should be of no concern. One of the members of the mercenary group grabs his sword, yelling that Han is a crazy bastard, and he won't get away from this. Edith looks nervous, but Han asks them if the group really is mercenaries. Edith looks nervous to answer, but reveals the truth, that they are nothing more than bandits. Han asks Edith why she's hanging around this trash, but she nervously answers that she was only listening to her father. Han stops her and tells her to listen to him now. She has two choices, to join him or stay with this trash. Jochen is enraged that Edith is even contemplating this and threatens to kill this whore, and Han is enjoying the chaos. Avant tries to reach for his sword, but Han just reminds Edith what happens to Trash and thrusts his sword deeper into Avant's arm, causing him intense pain. He looks at her coldly, saying to join him. He needs her. Jochen warns her about the price of betrayal, but she steadies herself and joins Han's party. He is happy with her decision, but the three remaining members are enraged. Avant tries to surrender yet again, but Han cuts him off asking if that's okay. If he does, he will be consumed. Avant curses him under his breath, but Han asks him to speak up. He can't really hear him. The mercenaries have seen enough and can't control their rage, and charge in to help their leader, despite Yassel's warning. They yell at Yassel to move, but it seems Han has played them right into his trap. Yassel puts on a devilish look and kills the three men who are trying to touch her. No hero gets warned a second time. Avant finally gets the chance to surrender and Han releases from his berserker state, but it feels an intense headache. This must be the side effect. Han defeats Avant in a duel, but the master is aggressively tapping the screen, and I don't blame him. Han just killed like three three-star heroes. That he paid for, by the way. He's probably pissed. Han just laughs at these idiots, they had no idea how the dueling system worked, and he gets to level up and an increased level in his sword and shield skill, and pain resistance. Yassel is a little worried because the master could fold after losing his pay to win heroes, but Han has some faith in him, since he didn't quit after misclicking 
the four star Shang. Han hits the level threshold and increases his rank, and thinks that the master even did a 10x summon, hoping to increase the level of those mercenaries. But he will thank Han in the long run, he doesn't know what he was saving him from. Han thinks that after this synthesis, he will be a higher level, and if the master wants to mess with him, climbing the tower will be impossible. He looks up at the sky and wonders what whatever plans to do. If he wants to fuck with Han, you can do your worst. And now, the only remaining member of the mercenaries is Edith. All of the people in the waiting room surround Han in awe of what he just did. Dika starts the praise by calling his boss awesome. Han immediately pinches Jenna's cheek, and he thought he told her to send everyone away for this sole reason, not to gain attention. But she was just so excited to keep her mouth shut. Some of the normal people in the waiting room begin to thank Han, but he just coldly tells them that they are misunderstanding the situation. One of the townsfolk say that they know that, but even still, they, they want to offer thanks. But Han interrupts. The people he wanted to save were the newbies who had just arrived. He had no intention of helping any slackers. What Han has done completely enraged the master, as six people's names are called. The people start panicking, assuming that they're being called for a dungeon, but six were called and the party maxes five. Han knows that this is for a synthesis. Now the guy thanking Han becomes angry. All of the people tried their best, he yells, but Han isn't buying it. He asks Aaron Dika, he asks Aaron and Dika who worked hard when they were spilling their own blood, but neither of them have an answer. Han asks Jenna if anyone helped her with her hunts, but she too can't think of anything. Han compares these people to livestock, and one bald guy gets enraged, but Han turns into Bruce Lee and roundhouse kicks the guy in the face. Yesup comes into the room yelling for the six people that she just called, come outside now. The people called start losing their minds knowing what is about to happen, but Han folds his arms and says that the master is synthesizing them into Edith. The people start complaining but Yassel is at her wit's end and forces all of them into the chamber, and Edith and Edith levels up and gains a new skill, Disarm Trap. Han is outside the chamber looking at everybody and reminds them that if they think they can just chill around while others do the work, this will be their fate. You need to prove something in order to survive. Some of the people, after hearing this harsh truth, begin to break down, since not everyone is able to fight. But Han calls out to all the craftsmen and tells them to see if they can find some people that they can use. The blacksmith jokingly replies that learning a craft isn't that easy, but Han only wants them to pick people eager to learn. Han tells anyone who is interested in fighting he will train them, and maybe beat them senseless. If you want to learn to hunt, follow Jenna. When working, go to Enoch, and there's other ways that you can survive, you just need to pick one. Jenna just tries to reassure the people that ever since she's listened to Han, she's been improving every day. Han thinks to himself that technically she isn't wrong, but some people, no matter what you do, will not have the talent to survive and will be synthesized anyways. And also, the 10th floor is approaching. A second combat party will be necessary, one that can match the first. The next day comes and Chloe brings out a delicious pastry. She got help from another woman who was a baker before she was summoned, and now they have access to this type of food. Han is impressed since things like these can help reduce stress among the people. Han goes to Edith's room and tells her to come outside. He orders Jenna to spar with her, only using daggers. She isn't excited at first, but rushes in at Edith. The mercenary is taken aback at the fact that Jenna is so young but already so good. Edith realizes how serious this fight will be and prepares herself. The two go back and forth and after a fierce battle, Jenna merges victorious. Edith wonders if Jenna was also a mercenary but is shocked to find that she's just an average daughter, and tells Edith that when they first got here, they were weaker than her, but they trained every day to reach this point. Han chimes in that Edith is weak right now, but her potential is much greater. So if she trains just as hard, the sky is the limit. We hear Aaron in the background training, cursing his luck, and no matter how much he trains, he can't catch up. After hearing all this, Edith has a determined smile, and will keep that info in mind. Maybe because of the mass synthesis, but more people showed up to training, because nobody wants to die. And all of them work hard in their own ways. The only way to survive is to increase your value. But Han thinks that even though more people are inspired, there still isn't enough fighters. If everyone wanted to be a helper, there's still only two spots available per role. Han approaches a black haired boy training hard asking for his name. He says that it's Ursher, and he more or less understands the situation after yesterday's display. Han says his form is great and asks what the man did before being summoned, and the man explains that he was a porter from a mercenary corporation. He was only used to carry stuff around, and Han is curious since the man looks like he can fight, and the reason for that is because Ursher always wanted to become a mercenary. Han smiles and prepares a practice sword, ready to spar with Ursher. That same night, the master continued thinning the one stars and he assembled party for a dungeon, and declined Aaron's request to help. 
Two more people ended up dying and two more were synthesized into Ursher and he leveled up to three. Another group was transported into the daily dungeon and the next day comes and Han stands in front of his five fighters. He tells them to shut up and wonders if anyone knows why they were called here. After an awkward silence, Dika raises his hand to choose party members. Jenna questions this since the master is the one who chooses the party and Han can only give suggestions. Han prepares a cup of papers and say they will draw from their spots and they will decide two parties of three based on this draw. Dika is worried but Han reassures him that no one is being thrown away. The team leaders will be Edith and Han, which makes Jenna upset, since she thought she was the second best. Edith is concerned splitting up their fighting power like this and questions what would happen if one party gets wiped out. Han sighs saying that that will be up to the master to fill out the remaining slots. The fifth floor was an example to the master. The gaps in the party can be huge and put everyone in danger. They need to start preparing different parties. There are special party quests that could take up to hundreds of heroes, so they need to quickly build up two squads in the meantime. Han thinks to himself that he hopes whatever knows the trick behind paid summons. Han prepares the lots and red will go with Han and blue will go with Edith. No need to be happy or sad, the situation will be more or less the same. He has everyone draw and Aaron and Jenna are back with Han, the OG trio, and Dika and Ursher are with Edith, which makes her a little concerned. She sighs, but she has faith in the men that Han trained. She's going to have to trust him. Han looks over Edith's squad, telling her that if she slacks off, she's going to be left behind. And the two parties have been created. Han's party is transported into the seventh floor, and the quest is subjugation. Aaron is confident in this one, but Han tells the two to step back. He'll handle this one alone. Han enters Berserk and kills every goblin but one. It seems he has a plan. He's thinking about the side quest he experienced on the 6th floor, and it's a good chance it might be a quest chain. Han tells Jenna to leave the last goblin and they'll go searching for clues. Han notices the heavy rain and spots a river, and finally notices a fallen dam. It seems that this was all he wanted to check out, as they killed the last goblin. Aaron levels up and the master gets 10 golden materials. The group returns and Jenna and Aaron want to go sleep and train, but something pops up that alerts Han. It seems the master purchased another newbie package. Han tells Jenna to bring the drawing papers from his room and orders Aaron to get Edith. The master selects a two times premium summon. Han thinks to himself that he assumed the master would do another premium summon. People who pay once hardly ever stop there. Once people get hooked on the game, the rest is history. Seeing the reactions of their heroes and buildings and supporting a community can bring a lot of entertainment. Thinking of strategies, PvP, there's so many aspects to this game to enjoy. Two premium heroes are summoned, the hero Yavolka and Roderick, both 3 star. Roderick immediately questions who everyone is and Yavolka trips over her own dress. Jenna returns with the lots and questions why this lady is already on the floor. Han tells her not to worry about it, but it seems Edith recognizes her. She's a noble. Han questions what that means, and Edith explains all the while Yovolka is listening from the floor. Roderick picking things up quickly, but still is unaware of things like level and skills. He was a knight in a big city, and he only feels a strange sense of duty to fight unknown enemies. Han tells the two that he will explain everything after they pick lots. Between the two, the better option is apparent. Jenna hands him the cup, and it seems that the red lot is on the right and the blue is on the left. Han thinks Edith may have tampered with it and he puts the cup on the ground and Han and Edith rush to pick a paper. All of a sudden interrupting their race is a fire spell that alerts Han to her abilities. It seems Yavolka is a mage. We get a snapshot of her skills and she is an intermediate flame mage. Han and Edith start glaring at each other since the power balance has just been tipped. But Han already chose her tab. Warriors and rogues can be advanced to 1 stars, but mages are different. They're only acquired through paid summons and they are very rare. Yavolka questions what's going on but feels that she's being appraised. But Han explains to her that what he is doing is deciding which group she will be joining. She starts to protest but the knight tells her to calmly think about the situation. Jenna redoes does the papers and tells the two to pick but fairly this time and they draw again and the result is the same. Han gets the mage and Edith gets the knight. We see another man being dragged away by his cell screaming that Han said if they tried their best they wouldn't die. But Han never guaranteed anything and tells Yavoka to head into the chamber as well. Two people were synthesized into her and she levels up. Han tells the two newbies that that can happen to them if they fall behind. Han tells Roderick that he's up next and he also levels up. The master wastes no time and opens up a rift and tells party two to enter. Edith asks Roderick to follow her and they enter the rift. Han asks Yovolka what spells she can use and she doesn't answer. Han starts to get serious and tells her to answer the question. But it seems she's not okay with the idea of being summoned to a place and being forced to fight. But Han just coldly reminds her that if she doesn't fight, she'll end up like the man that were just synthesized into her. 
Han asks again, what spells can you use? This time she answers the question and says she only knows fire magic and can cast up to the third circle. Han already knows that she can use fire magic and asks if she has any support spells. Yvoka gets cocky and says she would not learn such useless spells, those are for beginner mages. Han just assumes that she can't but she confidently tells him that he'll fall in love after seeing her fire magic. Han is disappointed since defense spells have great value in the game. Party 2 exits the dungeon and they handled it pretty well. Based on Edith's expression, it seems that Roderick is pretty strong. Now it's Party 1's turn. Han assumes that they'll be sent to the 4th floor to test the mage's skills. He informs Yavoka for what to expect and this whole raid is to test out her abilities. Han tells her not to worry since the 4th floor can be handled by the 4 of them. Yavoka has a nervous sweat but tells Han that she is special and he is going to be surprised. Hesel closes the gate and wishes Han good luck with a concerned face. Han curses the master and they were thrusted right into the 8th floor. Panic builds but Han tries to calm everyone down. He smiles nervously. This must be his punishment for screwing over his 3 star heroes. Interrupting his thoughts, he sees a projectile flying at them and yells for everyone to dodge. Yavoka is a little slow on the response and Han rushes to bring her down. The arrow misses and we see the 8th floor. The quest type is subjugation and this floor is filled with bow wielding goblins riding wolves. Han orders Jenna to start firing and he overlooks the uneven landscape. He tries to come up with a plan and looks towards Yavoka trying to cast a spell. He defends her while being hit on all sides and a wolf riding goblin sneaks behind Han ready to slash him but he barely manages to dodge. He gets up slicing the goblin in two but more are on his tail, giving him no time to rest. Han calls out to Eren and he takes out the goblin on top of him. An archer shoots at Eren but Han blocks and he calls for Yavoka to cast but she is still casting. She tells the group that she needs more time and in one minute she'll be able to cast her spell. The horde keeps attacking not letting them rest for a moment and Eren is at his wits end telling the mage to cast already as he's slashing down goblins left and right. She begins her cast again and Han is perplexed on what he's seeing and orders Eren to block any bolt being shot at Jenna and for Jenna to continue firing. The group tries to defend to buy as much time as possible and Han asks if she can cast at the enemies but she is still standing there in a trance like state. Jenna yells if she keeps standing still like that she's gonna get killed but Han notices that this mage can't use mobile casting and the enemies are about to tear her apart. A wolf rider attacks Han and knocks his shield back. He slices the head off of the goblin but the wolf continues its rampage. Han then slices the wolf down but is alerted to Yavolka facing death. The blades are about to split her open but Han grabs her at the last second. She protests but Han called her a headache. How could she cast without preparing a barrier? He now knows her skills and tells her to start casting again inside of that forest. He repositions the group to defend her and he yells for Yavoka to get in there now and the three turn to face the pursuing enemies. Yavoka is mad that she's being treated like some sort of object but obviously she doesn't understand the severity of the situation. Han kicks her ass into the forest and activates Berserk. This is the second time today. He needs to buy his mage some time. The goblins start pouring in and their attack patterns are more sophisticated than floors prior knocking Han off guard. While he's down, a spear wielding rider tries to finish the job but Han readies his stance and targets all the wolves these goblins are riding, killing them in a quick movement. Han is surrounded and hit in the back, releasing him from his berker state. The wolf slams his foot down on Han and right before the goblin can finish him off, he manages to roll over and pierce his spear through the wolf's mouth. More riders begin to pounce on Han, making Eren want to join but Han orders him not to come. He is grouping them all in on purpose. Jenny yells at Han telling him that the spell is complete and he's barely keeping up the defensive effort. He realizes that it's time to go and starts running past all the goblins in his way, vaulting over two of them. He uses one's face as a stepping stone and gets out of the way for Yavoka to cast her spell and with a slight pause she manifests all the surrounding mana, Ignite. Han manages to get out of there by the skin of his teeth and Yavoka casts her spell unleashing a huge column of fire at the incoming goblins, leaving Han impressed with her firepower. Jenna and Eren are in the forest also in shock that this is magic. Han realizes that there's still some more goblins left and orders Eren and Jenna to help him finish them off. They continue the fight and Han is desperately trying to defeat the goblins. He's so tired and being pushed back but he can't be killed now. He can't let them overpower him so he needs to use his skill with the sword instead. He bashes one goblin's head in with his shield and another one is behind them but Jenna pierces its head with an arrow, happy that she saved Han. Eren comes in and stabs a wolf before it can get to Han, saving him too. The two tell their leader that they'll always protect him. More goblins are coming in and Jenna lunges into the air and brings out her daggers and takes one of them out with ease. The wolf is still riding towards Yavoka however but Jenna quickly switches back to her bow and arrow and pierces the wolf through its eye socket. She yells for Yavoka to wake up and run away but Yavoka is deep inside of her trance. 
Jenna then yells at Aaron and Han to run away as Yavoka's eyes light up and her spell is complete. Burn away. An explosion is made in the center of all the incoming goblins, turning them to ash and dust. This display of power leaves the group completely stunned, and Han is hiding under his shield, hoping he won't be swept up in the blast. He turns around to see the landscape completely charred, wondering if this is the end. But not yet. Another goblin rides through the flames and they're still coming at him, but Yavoka prepared another spell and it summons a flame tornado to take care of the remaining goblins. The flames and gust of winds are so intense that Jenna is holding herself from a tree, barely managing to hold on. The flames subside and Yavoka stands there in the wake of her own destruction. Han usually is full of composure, but right now he's lost for words, seeing the crater that was just created. The stage is clear and the master gets his reward in 20 gold and Aaron and Yavoka level up. Aaron is shocked that someone could kill more than 20 goblins in a single blow and Jenna is in awe of her fellow comrade. Yavoka starts laughing and gets a little cocky and she told them that they would be impressed when they saw her magic. She is the witch of Rivel Countship after all. Interrupting her parade is a gust of blood coming out of her nose, and it appears she ran out of mana. Han laughs, but he tells her that her mana is lacking, and even though she can cast such big spells, it will leave her completely useless for minutes after. On top of not being able to use any protection or support spells, her other stats besides intelligence are very low. And even Han has got magicians back when he played the game, but he has never seen one quite like this. It's almost like she's a glass cannon. But even though she has her imperfections, Han definitely can make it work, and knows that her firepower will be useful. The next day comes, and the first thing the master does is make the mage only building the magic research lab, and its function has been unlocked. He also constructs the alchemy lab and library, and these three buildings synthesize with the training grounds to make a magic hall. Yavoka is seen running alongside Han, complaining about this torturous training, wondering why a royal like herself even has to do this. Han thinks that if she's going to be stationary while casting, she needs to at least have the agility to dodge attacks. Han tells her to stop whining and continue running. It's important to build stamina on the battlefield. Han thinks she looks better in her workout clothes, but Yavoka explains that her robe is a magic item that increases flame potency, and it was passed down within her family. Han mocks Yavoka that this stamina training is cake compared to what he usually does, and he speeds up, telling the girl that she must want to eat potatoes for dinner if she can't keep up. But Han looks up to see the master, looking down but not doing anything. The tenth floor is approaching, and the master improved the waiting room with the magic hall. And thanks to this, Han was able to farm the three different daily dungeons. A lot of materials are waiting in the storehouse for Han to use, to make better equipment. But now, it's time to make use of the alchemy lab to create some potions. Whatever logs out and Han tells Jenna to watch Yavoka run while he goes to craft. Making potions usually requires a high level and pharmacists and alchemists are needed, but it's just like the weapon creation in the fact that Han can make stuff without the skill or the blueprints. He enters the magic hall and picks up a book and he can't seem to understand the language. He goes to a pot and pulls up the manual challenge and it seems this time it's a rhythm game. Han successfully makes some low grade health potions and mana pots. Han thinks the master might get suspicious, but it's better to try than not have them and die. Han meets up with Aaron and Jenna and puts them around the blazer. With a wicked gaze, he tells them, with a fire mage in their party, they're gonna have to get used to the flame. He plunges his hand in the burning coals and Han endures the pain for 10 seconds, and removes his scorched hand. But he is immediately healed right after. They need to build their flame tolerance when Yavoka has such wide AoE attacks. The two get scared at having to torture themselves like this, but Han tells them to endure it as long as they can. They need to repeat this insane act until they gain the fire resistance skill. Remember the fifth floor? We need to be prepared for the tenth. Aaron tries to plunge his hand into the fire, but Han stops him. He doesn't take pleasure in watching him suffer. What he did today was a demonstration. He tells the two to do this with no one around. Jenna is too scared, but Han has a devilish smile and volunteers to help her. He stops teasing Jenna and tells her that if they can't protect Yavoka, there's a good chance that they will die. He gives Aaron another piece of homework, pain resistance, and hands him a knife and tells him how he does so is completely up to him, but he needs to figure it out. Han knows these methods aren't ideal, but it's necessary for survival, and he doesn't want his comrades to die. Fighting while enduring pain is a must, and Jenna is scared to learn pain resistance as well, but Han tells her that she won't need it, but instead, she should focus on her switching ability. This controls how fast she can switch from her bow and daggers. Their formation they had up until this point is useless, and now they will adopt the triangle formation around the Evoca and protect her casts, and there will be times where only two melee in the front won't be enough. Han says it's basically like a minigame, to protect the princess. He thinks to himself that the most efficient party in the game is a dual mage setup, with the second one being more support oriented, but he can't control who he gets. 
The ninth floor is coming up but will most likely be given to party two. There is also the chain quest that Han was investigating, but he thinks by now the master should have picked up on it. The tenth stage will have a mission where at least two parties need to work together. If it's a cooperation quest, the danger is unlike what they experienced up until this point. Han prepares the blazer and continues his fire resistance training. He can't afford to slack off now, and after hours of this torture, he unlocked the fire resistance skill. We shift to the next day and Han starts it off by immediately telling Yavon that she's pretty much useless. She needs to learn to decrease the power of her spell to shorten the cast time and work more on conserving her mana. The girl is insulted but Han looks at her coldly and she accepts and begins her training. There is three layers in her fire magic. The first layer is ignite to send flames outward from her hand. Second is scorch which explodes flames at a given point and the third is raise which creates an updraft of fire and the more layers she adds on the more mana the spell will consume and the effect is more destructive. But if they miss their one shot it could spell disaster. While Yavoka works on that Han begins training with Jenna and they need to squeeze every ounce of strength they can for the 10th floor. Han is seen continuing his arrow blocking training and eventually stopped using his shield and put more restrictions on himself during this type of training. Jenna is noticing his progress but Han isn't in the mood for compliments. He gains the skill projectile defense and raises his sword and shield skill to 6. Han gets the desired skill and Jenna rushes in with her dagger barely missing Han. She quickly switches to her bow which impresses the man but he was always one step ahead. He thinks that even though Jenna is a one star her potential is insane. If he didn't know life the game he would be way weaker than her. Han praises her which makes her blush and joke around but Han goes to grab her cheeks. He thinks to himself that a normal one star is closer to Eren. Even though he leveled up his spearmanship is only at level 3. He comes out to train for a while but most of the time he's in his room trying to learn pain resistance. Yavoka also spent her time training in the Mage Hall special facility learning how to use less mana in each cast for different situations. The training grounds were also getting filled with a few one stars but Han hasn't found anyone interesting yet. Both of the main parties haven't found their fifth and the master hasn't been summoning more people. He must be planning to put those slackers in. We time skip to the next day and party 2 comes out of the ninth floor, seemingly exhausted. Han assumes that some limbs were lost in that floor and asks about the quest. Edith says it was subjugation of about 50 goblins but Han asks if she noticed anything special about the area. Edith recalls her hellish experience and noticed that the floor turned to mud after it rained. Han collects this information and it now seems like it's their turn. They are sent to the fourth floor but Han worries if this isn't good enough practice anymore. But Yavoka ended up leveling up. Han clenches his fist that currently they leveled up as much as they can on these low floors and they also upgraded their armor from F to D rank. And Aaron and Han both got sword swords as secondary weapons. Two people from the training grounds were added to the two main parties but they weren't anything special. But it's better than nothing. Yassel greets Han with a good mood and asks if he knows what quest will be in the 10th floor. It's random so he can't be sure and wonders what this fairy is doing here. Yassel asks why he's worried since he's like a god of this game but if that were true he would already have beat the 100th floor. Even though he is the master of masters even Han was only able to get to the 88th floor after two years of playing and dozens of parties have been wiped out. The people who play this game go through countless defeats. If they go on like this, one failure could mean Han's death. Both parties arrive at the square and the master prepares to try the 10th floor. Han thinks he sharpened his skills to the max but still has an advance to a 2 star. There's no time to think however, this is just a game. The master prepares the 10th floor and even if they die he'll just summon more heroes. He tells their 5th party member to hide in a corner somewhere and his skill is too low to be of any help. A warning text pops up telling the master to fill his parties before continuing because this will be a difficult dungeon. Also another hint pops up to use the tactics room but Han thinks that that feature might be too complicated and makes Yassel give a tip for the master to take along consumables in storage and he can equip these to his heroes. Han splits up the six health potions and asks Edith if she's prepared. The mana potions will be exclusively used on Yavoka. Han tells Edith that it could be possible that they're separated at the start and if that's the case they should group up fast. Come to the center of the level. Yassel angrily tells the two bozos to get a move on already but folds when she talks to Han. He just confidently tells the fairy that he'll make sure to climb this damn tower. The group is transported in and they are greeted by an NPC, trembling for his life. Han tries to kick him but the man seems to be unable to see him. Jenna is confused but Han knows that this is an NPC. These appear during quests 
and Han always wondered why they didn't work well with the heroes. And this must be it. Han looks around to the cityscape and feels a sense of familiarity. Aaron also feels this way and then it hits them. This is the city from the fifth floor, before it has been ruined. Han is confused about the timeline, but there's no time to sit here worried about it. The only important fact is that they were summoned, and they need to complete their quest, and it hasn't started yet. They have some time to gather information, and he gives each of the members five minutes to scout and then return. Han climbs the bell tower trying to overlook the city. The morale of the soldier NPCs is already broken. Han looks over to see the goblin army with almost 3,000 of them running, and they also have siege towers. And to the east, there's another 900 goblins, but these ones have no siege equipment. Lastly, Han notices that there's 353 human soldiers within the castle. The manpower difference is 10 to 1, and one can tell at a single glance that this is a hopeless fight. But the quest text hasn't been revealed. If it's a survival quest like the fifth floor, Han is confident that they can do well. They can use the NPCs as bait. And now that they have a mage, it works well in these type of situations. Han meets up with party two, but all of a sudden, a triple warning message appears. This means the level is high difficulty. And their mission is to stop the city from falling. And the quest type is defense. With 350 NPCs and 10 heroes, they're gonna need to defend against 4,000 goblins. Han takes a breather and orders everyone to share the information that they gathered. And Han will instruct them on how to proceed. Jenna tries to talk to some NPCs, but no one seems to be able to do anything with them. Aaron tells Han that the people evacuating are gathering in the center of the city, and the goblins are attacking from the north and east gates. There are no gates to the south and west, so they're all trapped. Edith gets worried, and Han lets the group know that the quest type for this dungeon is defense, and their goal is to defend the city. They need to eliminate all the enemies. Roderick has the idea to wait it out and use guerrilla tactics, but they need to stop the city from falling, so that isn't an option. Jenna notices a glowing statue that alerts Han's attention. This twin goddess statue is an objective that usually appears in special quests. This is their failure condition. If that statue is destroyed, they lose. Roderick sighs and comes to terms with the assignment and Han gives the harsh reality to the group that if they fail this quest, they will all die. Han thinks that this is a truly outrageous mission and looks almost impossible. He thinks upon the situation and the goblins do have the number advantage, but they only have siege equipment on the north side. If they can hold off the ladders from the north, they should be able to buy time. Han orders Edith's party to go to the north wall and help the defenders, telling her to target the ladders on the wall. Edith doesn't seem to enjoy this plan since adding an extra 5 people to a force of 300 won't change much, and Han agrees that it is a reasonable assumption, but the fighting force of party 2 is about 50 people. The good part about this defense is the only way the goblins can scale the walls is by using ladders. Han tells Edith that if they strategically hold special parts of the wall, the defense will increase significantly. Edith is concerned with this plan since they do have to kill all the goblins and this plan for right now is only good at buying time. The 10 to 1 difference in numbers, it might be too huge. Even if they join, it hardly makes a difference, and based on the fifth floor, they probably won't retreat no matter what. Han thinks back to the previous floors and there has to be some sort of hint. The raining on the seventh floor, the broken dam, all of these hints are pointing towards the east. There should be a reason everything is hinting towards that direction. Han tries to understand, but what advantage would they have from breaking a dam? But Jenna finally remembers something. When she was next to a river, she heard the sound of horses. Han gets an epiphany and pinches Jenna's cheek for only telling him this now. Han tells Edith to buy as much time as possible and to use the NPC soldiers and citizens as bait if necessary. No matter what, keep that gate locked until party one returns. Edith smiles and accepts her role and the two parties split off. Jenna wonders if that concludes the strategy meeting, but Han just tells Jenna that unlike her, Edith is actually smart and gets things quicker. He instructs his party to get ready and to go towards the eastern gate. Aaron is worried about why they are leaving the castle, but this is their only option. If they stay here, they will be annihilated. The hoarse sound that Jenna was hearing is their reinforcements. The reason the city was destroyed in the future is because these same reinforcements weren't able to arrive, meaning that they need to change the future. They need to break past the goblins and prevent the dam from being destroyed. Han and his party make their way through the fleeing citizens towards the eastern gate. Han tells Yvoko to prepare to cast as soon as the gate opens, using stage 2 flames. Han notices their fifth member is also here. He orders Aaron to open the gate which startles the soldiers as they rush to try and stop it. Aaron is worried about the goblins that will swarm them if they open the gate, but Han plans to turn them into dust using fire magic. Han moves to stop the soldiers from interfering as Yavoka prepares to cast her spell. The first goblin arrow is shot through the gate, but Han intercepts. The soldiers are confused on who is hitting them, wondering if there's ghosts. 
The rain begins to fall, and as the gate opens, the goblins flood in. Han gets Eren out of the way, and Ignite is cast. Han tells her not to destroy the gate and aim her spell outside, and Yavoka kills countless goblins. Han instructs her to drink a mana potion in between casts, and if she's up to the task, she is the main player today. She answers confidently that she's ready for a hundred more casts. Their fifth member is shitting his pants already, and Han asks him if he's really ready to follow him. Shern has his stats reduced by 30%, and Han just tells him to run to Edith. She will tell him what to do. The gate closes again, and with that, their escape route has been blocked. They get in formation around the goblins, and Han orders for stage 1 magic. The rain is getting heavier, and the group defends for 20 seconds, while Yavoka casts. They count down from 20, and each second passes, and the party is desperately trying to defend their mage. Five seconds remain as Aaron and Jenna take out multiple goblins. At zero, Yavolka casts Ignite, sending a wave of fire out of her hands, dealing massive damage, and after the heat resistance training, it's easier for the group to run through the flames, taking advantage of the path that it creates. But the rain is putting them at a disadvantage. The flames dissipate quickly. Han orders for another cast, and after another 20 second countdown, the group defends and prepares for another blast of fire. The group moves forward again, using fire as a shield. But regardless of their efforts, the goblins number in the hundreds, staring down at our heroes. Among the swarm of goblins stands a towering figure, with a red flag menacingly hovering above him. He speaks in the goblin's native language, and we can assume that this is the goblin chieftain. We shift back to party one, continuing their flame tunnel strategy, and Han noticed that the goblin's attack pattern is changing, and now they are charging right through the fire. Han rushes forward to deal with the incoming enemies, but is alerted to the chieftain. It's because of him they are being bogged down like this. He is more intelligent and is ordering his troops. Aaron and Jedha are holding out, but they can't handle much more of this. Oxygen decreases the more one spends around fire. Han cuts a path and tells everyone to gather behind him. He will say the plan once, and they're only going to have this one shot. Aaron is concerned, but Han tells him that they need to take care of the goblin leader. Yavoka continues the cast as the goblins amass on both sides. They lunge into the fire, but are taken down one by one. The cast is complete, and a huge wave of fire takes out hundreds of goblins at a time. But it might not be enough, as Yavoka prepares stage 2, and erupts a huge explosion in the middle of the goblin horde. Jenna and Aaron continue their assault, but Yavoka faints from mana depletion. Han catches her and tells her not to talk, her magic is strong. But there is way too many for her to kill at once. If they surround them too soon, it'll be the end of all of them. The goblin's ultimate goal isn't the party of four, but rather the fortress. And after losing so many forces, they decided to focus on their main goal and rush in on the fortress. The team sneaks past the horde and gets somewhere safe to hide out momentarily. The group is relieved because they were sure that they were about to die. He gives everyone a sip of a health potion, and this is the start of the real battle. The north is still being sieged. Han approaches the gate, but it signals an event, and 20 goblins spawn. He orders his party to get ready, and among the goblins is a level 23 ogre staring at our heroes. Han begins to assign roles, and Yavoka is ordered to cast a fire wall, and to stop the goblins alongside Eren. She's worried about the ogre, but it seems Han will take on this beast. It slams his hammer down, creating a massive crater, and one hit can mean certain death. He continues to dodge the ogre's strikes, and in this situation, his shield is useless. The monster reaches out its hand, but Han slashes it. Jenna tries to put some arrows into the monster's back, but it only enrages it more. But over time, Jenna can stack up damage on this huge target. Han takes the monster's attention again, as Jenna wonders where this thing's weak point is. And to make matters worse, Jenna alerts Han to the presence of yet another ogre. Eren has his hands full right now, and the party is stretched thin. The longer this goes on, the worse it will become. Han needs to take the risk. He he puts his shield in front of the ogre's attack, taking the brunt of the blow. He ignores the pain and plunges his sword into his crotch. That's a low blow, dog. The ogre smacks his weapons down, but Han manages to leap over it, trying to pierce his sword into its neck. But the cut is too shallow. But he has to finish this. He takes his shield into both hands and nails his sword in deeper, killing the monster. One ogre down. The second one starts charging at Yavoka, but Jenna shoots arrows in the back of its neck and gets its attention. The monster doesn't change course. Han thinks that he's too late and is about to stomp its foot down on the small mage. Han calls out to her, but Yavoka isn't his target. Ogres have the ability to destroy walls and other objects, and the goblins don't have siege equipment. This means it's going for the dam. He yells for Jenna to intercept as she tries to slow it down, but Han rushes in, swearing to kill this beast. Right before it destroys the dam, Han and Jenna kill the ogre, sending its body into the river. Or 
That is what they thought. The ogre lifts its hand from the water and destroys the dam with its last remaining energy. Han stands there defeated. They failed. All the time they spent planning, all the information he tried to predict is all a waste now. The soldiers won't be able to cross the river at this rate, and everyone in both parties, along with the civilians, will all die. Han's party calls out to him, but he struggles to think of what they should do next. Aaron calls out to Han repeatedly as he stares at the broken dam. He tells the group that they need to go back and come up with another plan. Yavoka stops everyone and begins casting another spell, and Han can't believe his eyes as Yavoka summons a huge boulder. She slams the boulder into the broken dam, filling the gap that was created. Han is taken aback as she brags that telekinesis is a basic spell, and of course she knew that. But Han just gets angry that she didn't tell him that she had this ability. She's confused on why he is so angry and he just pinches her cheek, telling her not to hide anything else from him. And he thanks her for her effort, and knows that without that spell, they would have all died. The only thing left to do is wait for the reinforcements. But the goblins start rushing in at them again, almost like they know what is coming. Han tells Yavoka to drink the rest of the potion, wondering if the reinforcement that he is waiting for even exists. A goblin rushes right at her, but right before it can touch Yavoka, a soldier intercepts it midair. A knight in silver aura and a red mane, riding a horse with a matching attire, stands in front of the goblin army. He orders the Iron Lion Cavalry to show their might, and crosses the river. Cavalry? Allied NPCs, Iron Lion Cavalry, join the battle. Han takes control of the situation and orders his party to group up. The cavalry are only 500 in number, but they are much stronger than the city guards, as he sees them chop down waves of goblin infantry. It looks like Han's role here is done, but he looks towards some horses from some dead cavalrymen left behind, and asks his group if they know how to ride. It seems Han is the only one who doesn't know. As a master, you can't control such things, but you can impact the battle. For example, Han requests a skill book. It costs 500 gold, but the master quickly purchases it. It's a book on sale in the combat shop, and although he can't learn the skills that are directly related to combat, it is possible to learn other skills using this method. Han absorbs the book and gets a skill awakening. He mounts the horse like he's always been able to ride it, and the group moves out. With these reinforcements, they will even the playing field. Now, it's time for the counterattack. Han continues to ride and knows the force on the eastern side isn't a threat. They cannot scale the walls. The big challenge here is dealing with the siege equipment on the north side, and the cavalry are heading that way as well. But no way just following them leads the group to victory. It would be too easy. There's no way it would end just like that. Han orders his party to fall off to the side. They are moving away from the battlefield. Han doesn't think this will end well and shifts his direction towards the northern forest. The rain finally stops and Han spots the goblin raiders that were going to intercept the lion cavalry. If they use fire magic to deal with this force, they might have a chance. In addition to this, there are three ogres. Han tells Aaron his plan and if they cannot deal with these troops, the cavalry will fall. He asks Yavoka if she has enough mana to cast another spell, and she has just a little amount left. Han tells her to focus all her energy into this last attack. They move into the forest and they plan to set it ablaze. We shift to party 2, desperately defending the walls, and Dika is holding his own, but almost falls into the swarm. Edith swings her dagger, killing the goblins, and saves the young boy's life. The group defends, but they hear a cry from the lion cavalry. They charge in and Edith is alerted to their presence, and knows that Han succeeded. Party 2 gets momentum as they hold off the goblins, and Yavoka charges up her last spell, and sets the forest on fire. Han is concerned if she uses any more spells, she will go into mana overflow. So her job here is done. The defense of the city continued. About a hundred soldiers fought desperately on the northern walls. The city's men suffered many casualties, and half the cavalry died fighting the ogres. And if Han didn't take care of the goblin raiders, the cavalry would have been wiped out before they even arrived. Apart from all of that, the cavalrymen are much stronger than the goblins. They suffered an overwhelming numbers advantage, but they still managed to persevere. And after the remaining goblins were killed, the mission was over. Glory to the goddess, the soldiers yell. No one in either party died as the group breathes a sigh of relief. They are much stronger than they were from the fifth floor. Han wonders why the mission isn't finished yet, but it finally hits him. Even though they dealt with the monsters, the stage is not clear what is going on. There's nothing else to do. All of a sudden, a system prompt appears, now loading. Han looks around, wondering what's going on, but another message appears. Restoring. A system error has occurred. Reconnecting. Please wait. Everything stopped and someone calls out to Han. Look behind you. Han turns to see the level 999 monster that brought him into this game. Han looks back knowing what is about to happen. And the master whatever gets the same shock that Han did. Han remembers this bastard from before, but what can he do now? With a party of max level 6 star heroes, Han was the first player in Korea to clear the 88th floor, not even using real money to progress. 
he still hit rank 5th in the global rankings. All of the aspects of the game was luck based, and all battles were done automatically. The master can only give general instructions, but the heroes are the ones who decide how to use their abilities. For an unknown reason, things that were impossible to do during a battle are allowed as well. If the game was really decided by star ranks and luck, Han would have never been able to rise to fifth in the world. The biggest reason he was addicted to this game was that with skill, you didn't need luck. But what skill can he use against this level 999 being in front of him? Even 7 star heroes have a max level of a 99. This is ridiculous. Next to this monstrosity is a level 15 dark priest who whispers to Han, we will be waiting for you. The two disappear into the ashes and it seems Han was spared for today. The system reconnects and everything returns to normal. Jenna wonders what the look on Han's face is and why is he so scared. He yells at the top of his lungs for the group to ride the horses into the castle now and he tells his party to hurry up. The dark priest he saw was a monster that isn't used to being in lower floors. We see energy flow into the corpses from the battlefield and they grow into a hulking monstrosity that begins eating the soldiers. The strategy for fighting these dark priests is to run away to the place they came from. A living corpse appears with an unknown level, absorbing all of the fallen goblins and humans. The dark priest has an ability, corpse resurrection, and they will continue to attack unless you destroy their head. This type of enemy isn't something that should ever appear on the 10th floor. Party 1 opens the gates and Han throws Yvoka to Jenna, saying he leaves her in their care. He orders them to regroup with Edith and protect the goddess statue. Hold on until I return. Han rides off with Jenna and Aaron screaming at him. How can he possibly deal with this enemy? He tells the group to wake up. Do you want to be zombie food or do you want to live another day? The two understand their orders and Han casually walks outside of the gates with a smile on his face. It wasn't even a question to him, they'll survive this floor. The door is shut behind him as he is alone against the horde of undead. With determination in his eyes, he stares them down. The enemy looks scary, but alone they are easy to deal with. Han rides through their ranks, slicing one after another. The only strategy Han has is to deal with the priest himself. A zombie ogre begins bashing the gate, alerting Han to his time limit. Zombie dogs begin to chase after him, but two arrows pierce their skulls. It seems Jenna wasn't ready to let him die. The soldiers hear the zombie ogre breaking the castle gate as they tremble in fear. The gates break and the horde flows in. The soldiers try to run, but it's only a matter of time. Han continues his mission and rides towards his target. He disappeared into the burning forest, and he's been waiting for him. If he is this confident, Han will have to end this himself. The undead are following two objectives, to destroy the statue and to eat the living. Their fighting abilities are worse than the hosts they occupy, but their strength is in their numbers. The undead also grow the more flesh they consume. Han thinks that Edith's leadership is much better than he anticipated, and even now she is calmly ordering everyone around. The only thing they need to prioritize is the safety of the statue. The walls are breached and the situation is similar to the fifth floor. The only saving grace here is the number of NPCs still around to act as shields from the wave of undead. Han has a time limit to deal with this black priest before everyone dies. Han gets a skill awakening increasing his fire resistance to two and zombies come out of the fire. Han slashes them down and uses the last bit of his health potion. He reaches the end of the map and he notices that Makin and Shuron are both scared decreasing their stats but it's to be expected of the newbies. Mackin dies shortly after and Edith is bleeding. Han needs to finish this now. As Han begins his fight with the sorcerer, a shadow bolt is fired at him. He blocks but the strike is heavy. Black priests are vulnerable in melee, so he needs to close the distance. A volley of dark arrows are fired at Han, but he barely manages to evade. He blocks one using his skill, but now Han himself is bleeding. He would have died without his projectile defense skill. The situation is looking dire and he can't find the priest in all of the smoke. He has to take a risk before he loses loses more HP. All of a sudden, a voice whispers, I want to take you. Han has no options and speaks back, and the voice continues, that Han is different from them. But another arrow is shot at him, disarming his sword. He goes to his dagger and enters his berserker state, running in the direction of the shot. He cuts through the arrow and spots the priest. An other arrow pierces his stomach and leg, leaving gaping holes in his body. But with the last sliver of life, he continues his attack, and in his berserker stance, he plunges his dagger into the priest, ending its life. But the damage takes its toll as Han spits up blood. The stage is still not clear and Han accepts his fate and closes his eyes, fading into the darkness. A notification pops up that Shuran has died, but Han still hasn't moved on. What kind of shitty death is this, he wonders. He got dragged into this mess and didn't even get a fighting chance to win. We see a shot of his comrades all in the brink of death themselves. But all of a sudden, the statue turns green, and the stage has been cleared. The master gets 70 gold and a low-grade fire attribute stone, and the MVP is Han, and he levels up. The master gets a notification to use his materials to progress Han to the next level. 
A new dungeon has been unlocked and the master gets a congratulations, and his waiting room name changes to Tanoir. Han opens his eyes, surprised that he even survived. He goes into the residence to spot Eren sitting around the table, looking lifeless. He asks why he's so gloomy, but it seems everyone was worried about Han. He was sleeping for quite a while. Eren asks the reason why they fight. He watched countless citizens be eaten alive by the undead. Han thinks Eren's stress tolerance increased, but the man gets up to leave. Han tells Eren he better not show up with that face tomorrow, and the man gives a light smile before leaving. We shift to the kitchen and it seems Chloe whipped up some amazing food, and Jenna is ecstatic. Han ordered Chloe to make the best food so it can increase the mood of the survivors, and that's the only thing he can do for right now. He notices Dika struggling and it's gonna take him a couple of days to mentally get over what just happened. The master logs in and again is notified that Han is awaiting advancement. He upgrades the synthesis building to the advancement room and synthesizes his three attribute stones into a low grade advancement stone. It's a success and Yasel goes to tell Han the good news, telling him that this is the start and he will be a 7 star hero before he knows it. But even in Han's long hours of playing this game, he himself has never had a 7 star hero. He enters the chamber and knows the master cannot see him inside. He places the attribute stone and knows that this will propel him to 2 stars. A light shines that blinds Han and for a second he sees a vision of a mother holding a child. He draws his sword but it seems that he is blocked by an invisible wall. Han doesn't have any family, so that baby cannot be him. And it has to be the character that he replaced, Han Slot. He can't be stressed over this and returns to the waiting room, but something is different. There's no buildings here. Yassel comes out of the rift, but she too looks a little smaller. What's going on? The fairy can't speak and Han is urged to go into the rift. He realizes what is going on and the portal begins to shake. The advent dungeon is opening. An incredible pressure is felt and Han, for the first time, is frightened. He goes into his berserker state to snap out of it, emerging from the portal. But emerging from the portal is the twisted creature that put him into this game. It thanks Han for finally sparing the time to meet him. Han points his sword towards this bastard and tells him that he will kill him. But even his max level party wasn't able to land even a scratch, so he stands little chance. The monster laughs at Han, asking why he's not charging right at him. Aren't you angry? Han just tells this thing to send him back if it's just gonna talk nonsense. The monster laughs, impressed with Han's self-control, but Han starts to feel a terrible headache. The being starts moving forward, telling Han that he is a special existence, and this waiting room is a gift for him. This stage was prepared for the most glorious player in Pick Me Up. The shadows around the monster begin to fade, revealing a human. Han, holding his head, can't understand what he is seeing, desperately asking the figure who she is. This person resembles Yassel, but doesn't know how to introduce herself. But Chad Han just calls her a bitch. She laughs and knows Han thinks that she might look like Yassel, but that's not really the case. Yassel looks like her. And in reality, the duplicate that Han knows is her 100th million 479th, to be exact. And that number is similar to the player count of this game. She throws Han a card and it's revealed that she is the president of Mobius. Han thinks that this is some sort of cruel joke. He throws the card down, stepping on it, demanding to know why she brought him here. She smiles and tells Han not to get too upset. It was not expected for him to be summoned. It was really just an accident. Han threatens her and demands to be sent home, which makes the girl smile. A mere one star threatening her? Don't make me laugh. Han says that in time he will be strong enough, which makes the woman think that killing him now might be ideal. The spear is sent flying, but stops right before Han's heart, almost like a cruel joke. And the girl laughs again, saying how fearless Han is. Han asks what this woman wants from him. She must have some sort of goal for bringing him here. She says she only wants to talk and in reality she's a fan of Mr. Loki, number 5 in the world. And Niflheim is a top priority of the company. She brought him here to tell him the truth of this world. Loki, what do you think of this mobile game? Usually people don't pay much attention to gacha games, but you are different. Loki always prioritized the content. The overarching story isn't that interesting and there's not much to find out in the world. She snaps her finger switching the location that they are at and asks Han if he knows where this is. This is the Tananir continent in the Heim Peninsula of the city Nelsa. Although it's the city from the 10th floor, as Han can see, it's completely destroyed. She shows him all the remaining areas of Tanoir and all share the same fate. She asks Han if he thinks Niflheim is any different. This is what the game has become. Over a hundred million continents facing annihilation all at once. 
This game has a story that only has one end. Even though characters try to change it, the result is always the same. The only thing to do is bring someone outside of the book into it to rewrite and fix the story. Even if space and time as they know it collapses, a higher dimensional being can alter reality just through observation. This was the reason Pick Me Up was created. Han smiles and wonders what the grand story behind it all even is, and this takes the girl off guard. But she extends her hand towards Han. She needs his cooperation to save the world. But like I said in the first chapter, Han ain't no simp. He throws his dagger at her head, interrupting her, and he isn't a fan of this bullshit that she's spouting. The girl has a twisted smile as blood drips from her face, asking again if Han accepts or rejects. She made Han suffer, and now she wants his help? What kind of bullshit is this? He declines and promises he will crush her with his bare hands. This makes the girl laugh and she's hurt by those words and walks towards Han. Han knows in his mind that he's hopeless right now and he can't possibly fight her. He tells her that they're done talking and asks to be sent back. The girl smiles yet again and she messed with the system to bring him here and actually has a lot of respect for Loki. Compared to the other masters in this game, even if people are ranked higher than him, it doesn't explain the true difference in their skill. And that is because Loki has a unique achievement that no other master has. She puts the status screen. Master, trust your bond with the heroes. Han remembers these words from the tutorial. The girl continues that Han is the only one who truly knows what that phrase means. Among the hundred million masters, he stands alone. The location changes again and she asks Han if he remembers where this is. And this is the stage of the 80th floor. The place he was the master of a couple months ago. Out of all the players, only him and four others were granted permission to raid this stage. Ranked 6 and below are stuck on the 79th floor. Han recalls this area and it stressed him out for weeks. He asks why he's being shown this and the girl summons two chairs, telling him to come watch the scene play out together. She asks how it feels to watch from within the space rather than from a phone. The 80th floor was the first conquest type floor. Even though the objective was hidden from the players, Pick Me Up had a random stages and the difficulty was always random. But after getting to the 80th floor, every ranker failed miserably and it was nicknamed the Wailing Wall. Han also struggled but again questions the point of showing him a video of him clearing this floor. She doesn't answer and tells him that maybe he can find out from watching. Han thinks that to clear this floor he suffered humiliating defeats that resulted in the death of most of his heroes and only his main party was able to complete it. This is hell. The only word he can use to describe it. We see the number of enemies and there are over 7,000 level 100 and above monsters. The fragments of chaos. These were the biggest challenges on this floor. The woman smiles and asks Han if he knows. Pick Me Up's difficulty is altered depending on the account. And the difference in summon rates are like night and day. Han is shocked after hearing this. Do you think it was a coincidence you never pulled a hero above 5 stars? It's not that you were unlucky, it's just Niflheim had no heroes within it. We see small groups of level 300 monsters in this floor as well, and the server Niflheim was reviewed as an S rank difficulty, and was the worst in all categories. And it's still a mystery how Han managed to climb to the 88th floor, after being handicapped from the start. A light flashes and Han's main party is summoned. These are the strongest heroes in Niflheim. From rank 5 to rank 1, they're all gathered here. The monsters begin flooding at the heroes when a spell is activated. The effects of the tactics room begin to apply. Han played the game manually by using the tactics interface, guiding his heroes to the best possible outcome. Because of this, new tactics and strats were invented by him in this floor alone. He took one objective after another before attacking the enemy. The plan was complicated but the goal was simple. She tells Han to watch closely at what kind of existence he is to his heroes. The five stand around a ball shaped map and this is why Loki is unique. The five await their orders and like always they are amazed at the master's perfect plan. Failure is not an option. The tactic mode ends in 10 seconds and the group prepares for battle. Each hero has a different legendary artifact and we have Nihaku, the king's bow, Muden, the king's spear, Ritagan, the king's sword, Yurnet, the king's eye, and Cyrus, the king's flame. The mission starts and Cyrus sends a huge wave of fire, decimating the incoming enemies. The girl loves watching this part and Han's heroes sure are impressive. They are the strongest 6 star heroes to exist. Only 7 stars can hope to match them. Han still doesn't understand the point of this, but this isn't what she wants to show him. What she wants him to see is how his heroes think of him as they climb the tower. They come to truly understand and despair their existence. After learning they're being used like some sort of toys. But Han's world was the only one where that was different. He was considered Niflheim's king. And after he disappeared, the heroes started frantically searching for him. And even are aware that he fell into their world. 
Think about it, Han. What kind of hero would jump from dimension to dimension, searching for their master? Do you think any others would do the same? And Han was a master that did not once use synthesis. Normal masters abuse this feature when heroes don't listen to their commands or are useless. Normal masters get rid of people without a second thought. And because of that, the waiting room is ruled through fear. Even if a low rank shows potential, typical masters just use them as fuel for their main heroes. But for Han, he has only ever pulled one four star and people called it the doomed account and even told him to remake it. But despite this, he held on. His whole life he was used to the irrationality. Han corrects the girl that he used synthesis, but only when he really needed to. The girl smiles because comparing him to other players, he's a saint. They would use synthesis almost daily. Before Han was famous as a Loki, most masters treated Hero like toys and threw them out when it wasn't fun anymore. Han never threw anyone away if they had any potential, and if he ruled through fear, he would have never got to where he did. And his rewards is evident in his accomplishments. But now Han knows the reality of this game. The heroes are human. And the president has no idea how Han knew. It would be impossible to play like that if he didn't this entire time. That is her conclusion. The lady wants to know how it feels to know that all of Han's heroes were human. But her conclusion is that Han couldn't have ever played the way he did without knowing that fact. Even though the game was ultra realistic, he never assumed that they were real people and his playstyle was the most efficient strategy. He crosses his arms asking the girl if she put him through all of this just because she liked his playstyle. She smiles and laughs saying how she would have much rather met him on earth but Han coldly reminds her that if he ever saw her in real life he would bury her and swears to the lady that she has earned his hatred and he won't rest until he has his revenge. He is not from this game and he is from earth. She laughs this off again and Han thinks on the situation. If she wanted him to climb the tower, there would be no need to call him here. And Niflheim's group is still diligently proceeding with the attacks. There was no casualties up until the 88th floor and he could taste the 90th. He tells the girl that he won't help her and all he wants is for her to disappear from his sight. The CEO sighs and says that Han could have been the hero to save Mobius. But it doesn't matter. All she cares about is that Han reaches where she is. So she can withstand these insults for now. Han asks if the Dark Priest was her surprise on the 10th floor, which it turns out it was. But she promises not to interfere from the 15th floor and on. But the continent he is on will shock him, even if she doesn't. It's an s rank difficulty, just like Niflheim. The chance the Master quits is 90%. But if Han accepts her help, she might change that. She swears on her name that if Han can climb the tower, he will be returned to Earth. And he will receive half of the shares of the Mobius company and become a mega corporation shareholder. She asks if he accepts and Han does as long as he doesn't have to see her face. He can't trust her, but he doesn't have much of a choice. But as another fuck you, he lunges a dagger into her face. He'll climb the tower without her bullshit promises and he'll return with his own strength. And that is his answer. The girl starts glitching out as she's bleeding from her face. She will forgive this disrespect but has a gift to show him. As he climbs the tower, two gates open, and an ominous purple gas emanates and a light flashes, and we are shown the town near Continent, a place where humans and demi-humans live together, but an unknown enemy attacks. The Continent is drowned in darkness and torn to pieces. The reason Pick Me Up's difficulty is so high is because the players have to reverse the battle that ended with failure. Turn back fate, Loki. You are the only hope. If he wants to save the world, then climb the tower. Many heroes will be on this journey. Trust your bond and carve out your future with your own hands. Do you think you can do it? Han thinks this display is full of shit, but the girl leaves a final message. I know we will be waiting for you. Han tells her to fuck off and whatever gets a notification. The hero's forgotten memories have awakened and Han leveled up to two stars. The stat limit has increased and he exits the chamber. He is greeted by Aaron and asks what happened and Han just says it was his advancement. Not getting into the psycho lady that he just met. He asks Aaron if anything interesting happened but nothing too crazy was going on. Han thinks on the girl he saw alongside Aaron and that must be his sister Nina. This is the reason for him to return. And Han's goal hasn't changed. If anything's different, he has a renewed determination to repay his debt. The next day comes and a game announcement alerts the masters. Apologizing for the server downtime a few days ago, the masters on the lower level floors suffered a loss of connection. Han knows that this has to do with his encounter with the CEO. We see the air compensation and each master will receive 500 gems, 50 gold and one gift ticket. And all daily dungeons will remain open for 3 days. Yasel congratulates Han on his advancement but he immediately tells her that he met her main body. She is confused but Han says he knows that she is the CEO of Mobius which makes Yasel's jaw drop. 
Han just casually says it's okay and just help him as she's been doing so. She pulls out a gift ticket and gives it to Han and he asks why he's getting this, but is told the master gave it to him. Even he realizes how OP Loki is. A gift can be given to a hero when they do something worthy of praise. Gold will be spent depending on the price of the gift. Higher level gifts require more gems and material. It's done using a premium currency. But if you use a gift ticket like this, everything is free up into the value of the ticket. Han's ticket has 10,000 gold and he thinks on it but gives it back to Yassel. He doesn't need it. And a status screen alerts the master to this rejection. Yassel starts freaking out. There's so much that he can do with this ticket. What's your problem? Han just says that any decent item in the shop costs more than 10,000. So he's just going to go to sleep. The master opens the ticket and Yassel summons a warhorse statue and gives it to Han. He wonders what the hell this is and just throws it to the side. It breaks and Yassel is heartbroken. He says that only giving a gift to one hero will grow resentment from the others. Giving out gifts for achievements is what makes a good master. And depending on hero's personal traits, what they want will be different. Just giving them something isn't enough. Not using this mechanic properly is worse than not using it at all. In Han's case, he memorized all the personalities and hobbies of the top 100 heroes in Ifelheim. He thinks of the warhorse statue and asks what the master is thinking. Did you panic? We shift to the next day and a rift opens and right now their master's incompetence is their biggest weakness. Han needs him to improve. Yavoka's stress is at the max and because of the training and the 10th floor. A proper master would have taken care of these things first as we see her angered expression, asking where they're going. It's not a good idea to try the 11th floor and they should probably start with the 8th or 9th. Whatever doesn't understand the game just yet but Han sees he selects the 11th floor and has a horrible realization that the master thinks he's too good at this game and he will try and take risks. I'm so good at this, itis. This is the worst feeling for new players. By not trying an easier floor and sending them straight in, it confirms the master thinks this game is too easy. And at the moment, the heroes are transported to the 11th floor, and the quest type is subjugation. This is a bad sign for Han. The master isn't a good player. How can they get to the 100th floor like this? They are sent into a graveyard and immediately attacked by 14 level 11 skeletons. Han has no time to think and orders his troops around. They need to deal with these enemies. One of the reasons Pick Me Up is a shitty RNG game is because the difficulty of the early stages are all determined by luck. If one pulled the good hero, then everything is a breeze. But if you are stuck with one stars, it takes a lot of effort to climb. Han begins his assault destroying the skeletons and thinks back on the high level heroes whatever had access to. His luck isn't too bad having a lot of heroes over 3 stars. And the master was diligent in the early stages of the game, developing the waiting room, training heroes and crafting items. Jenna is seen kicking some skeletons and the master was using a similar strat to Han's but it changed after the 5th floor. He cleared a mission that should have ended in failure thanks to Han's leadership and this spoiled him. And now he began to deviate. Without the right conditions, he used 5 premium summons, and without even getting 2 quality 5th members for both of his main parties, he thrusted them into the 10th floor. These mistakes are getting more and more apparent. Han might die if the master doesn't get a grip, and realize the true difficulty of this game. The team clears out the skeletons and rewards are given. The MVP is Han. He thinks it's been a while since he leveled up, and we see a snapshot of his skills. Back in the waiting room, Han calls to Yassel and has a question for her, and she is eager to answer. She can't say too much, but Han interrupts her saying that he already heard most of the situation from her main body. Yassel gets annoyed at this and makes an exception for Han, and he asks what her main body's name is. Yassel says that the director has many names, numbering over 100 million. It changes based on the world that she is in, but in Tanoir, she is called Tail. Han thinks about this and her name in Niflheim would be different as well. And after the 10th floor, this account was given the name Taonir. Hans was Niflheim and rank 4's was Raglancid and rank 3's was Ezekiel. If what Tail said was true, then she has a different name in over 100 million worlds. Han asks his next question, what is Mobius? Yassel starts talking about the company but is interrupted, not the company, and he's now informed that it's a spiral universe connected in parallel to many other worlds. Han analyzes this information and this must be why each account has different heroes and quests. He asks Yassel if each master is assigned to a different world, and now he's starting to understand. He asks if whatever their master is a regular human, and is told that only humans from Earth can become masters, but that's not what Han is asking. He wants to know if Tail messed with whatever or not. Yassel begins to freak out, mess with a master? She teleports out to check and Han lays down and he'll try to figure out this Mobius thing later. Yassel pops back in saying whatever is 100% just a regular dude, and Han wonders if he can even trust this info. But Yassel says that she got confirmation from another director. Doing something like this requires incredible conditions and would take too much risk. 
Han closes his eyes and we are taken to the training grounds, and Ursher is seen training diligently. Han is alongside him training as well, and he needs to find a way to survive while the master is riding this high. He can't have any miscalculations. Han is sparring and he dodges Roderick's barrage of blows. He quickly turns his shield to block a strike from Ursher, and Edith rushes in behind him. He barely manages to dodge and a 3 on 1 still is too much for him. If he plans good enough measures, he might be able to survive. Aaron and Jenna join the fight and Han thinks the best way to cure the master's cockiness is to get rid of the heroes that he relied on the most, which unfortunately is Han. Party 1 is called by Jenna and they wonder if they're going to the 12th floor. This pace is too fast. They climbed the 11th yesterday and didn't even get one full day of rest. Yassel opens the gate and Han realizes that the master is trying to speedrun two floors in one day. Han asks what floor they're being sent to and Yassel says the 12th. Han realizes the situation and knows that heroes can demand and insist against the master. And Han rejects his order to participate. Yassel is shocked and the party is shocked. They didn't know he could just refuse to go. Han doesn't tell them the part where there is consequences with this. Yassel tries to make Han reconsider but he stands firm, not moving an inch. Han knows what Yassel is trying to say. A hero can refuse to do a dungeon, but can't refuse being synthesized. If the master gets too mad, then Han can be turned into food. But still, like a man, he rejects the order. Ivulka starts to panic, and what about the rest of the party? They can't fight without Han. He just tells the group that it's up to them as well. He won't stop them. Aaron grips his spear and says if his boss isn't going, then neither is he and Aaron refuses to participate. Jenna just yawns and joins in, leaving Yavoka stunned, and she too refuses to participate. Party 1 is now out of control and a tip is shown that heroes can go on strike, and you can solve this by listening to their demands or by punishing the leader. Han reads it and smirks at Yassel, but she swears that she didn't write that. Jenna asks what they should do now, but Han smiles and tells them all they can do now is wait. Whatever is stunned. Party 1 can't be operated. He never thought that a hero would refuse his commands. Han looks up to see his reaction, and if he read the online tutorials, then he would have known this could happen, but of course he didn't. Yassel calls for party 2 and Edith comes out, confused on why Han isn't going. He tells Edith that they refused, which takes her off guard. Some time passes and Han explains his plan. Edith knows it's dangerous, but Han knows the dangers, and he might die if this doesn't go right. But Han asks if Edith plans to kill herself if the master orders it. She sees his point and thinks on it, and there's no reward to pointless loyalty. They are fighting not to die. Edith tells Han that her party will go, they want to get stronger, and Edith doesn't want to be synthesized. Party 2 enters and Jenna wonders what will happen to Party 1, and even Han doesn't know. It's all up to the master to decide. Han tells Jenna if he ends up being synthesized, she should give up this act and never disobey again. The group looks back at Han and they know he isn't going anywhere and Han just looks back and smiles. He's happy on how far his group has come, but is alerted to Dika getting a bleeding debuff. Ursher is next, and now Dika is in fear, reducing his stats. The 12th floor is much more difficult than the 11th. Edith returns with an angry look and asks Han on how she can disobey orders, and Han tells her that it's pretty easy, just refuse to participate. And she does just that, as Roderick carries out the two injured boys. Now, Party 2 can't be operated, and Yassel is trembling with fear. Han realizes that now, whatever is forced to solve the situation. Han says that even though they are misbehaving, they still need to train. The three daily dungeons are opened as compensation, so they need to refill their potions. Also, Jenna and Eren need to level up. They can enter the weekday dungeons at will, so they'll need to do that first. Yassel is concerned about the master. What if he quits? Han knows his problem, but if he can't handle something like this, then he was never meant to climb the tower. Yassel stresses even more, and what if Loki gets synthesized? Han just smiles, and he would prefer to die painlessly anyways. It's not even that hard to solve this issue, just synthesize the hero who started it. Yassel is about to cry, but Han tells her that the master needs to learn to manage hero's stress levels. If he can't, there will be many problems. The next day comes, and party 1 went in to collect materials, and they split into two teams, and they were able to obtain a basic fire stone. After that, they continued to train, and Han's sword and shield skill hit level 6, and now he is at a stage where he would need to train extraordinarily to reach a higher level. He needs to find better sparring partners or add penalties while training. Han orders Yervoka and tells her to train her telekinesis magic only until she learns a new skill. She protests since fire skills are her forte, but Han threatens to only feed her potatoes. That entire day, the master didn't log in, and neither the next. Yenisel goes over his shoulder, wondering if the master really did quit. But all of a sudden, just like that, he logs back in and Yassel lights up. Edith wonders if the master changed his mind, but Han doesn't think so. He knows that his confidence isn't that easy to erase. 
Han thinks that he's going to use real money again, and right on cue, the master does an advanced summon and spends 1500 gems. We get three rare three star heroes, Stein, Mazel, and Tasir. Han gets up and now it's time to greet the new recruits. Edith wonders how they will draft them, but Han says that they don't need to worry about that. They won't be able to join either party. The three arrive and Tasir is trying to sauce up the lady, but she is not having it. Tasir doesn't take this lightly and draws his weapon, becoming hostile towards Mazel and she returns the favor. The two form a hostile relationship, but the only smart one of the three runs to Han, asking if he was here before them. He introduces himself as Stein, a knight in training, and politely asks if Han can stop these two from fighting. They won't listen at all, but they do agree on one thing, that Stein is a noob, and no one should listen to him. He's lucky his parents spoiled him. This enrages Stein, and now all three new recruits are hostile. Edith asks what's going on, but it seems all three don't fit well together. Hero chemistry is important, some heroes receive bonus stats when in a party together, and the inverse is also true. But Han thinks it's rare for three heroes to begin fighting right after they were summoned. The brawl begins, but Yassel pops in, telling them that it's pointless. Do they want to die? She tells them the rules and to obey the master. But as usual, they are confused, and Mazel says if she wants to join a party, she wants to be with Han. But Yassel says that only the master can choose a party, and the three new recruits are fused into party three. The rift is opened, and Han goes back to his room, leaving Edith surprised. He knows they won't be coming back. They enter the rift, and Tazir is in a state of frenzy, and begins attacking allies. Stein begins bleeding and all three of the heroes start fighting each other. Stein ends up killing an ally which prevents Han from sleeping due to all of these notifications. Shortly after, all three members of the party return to the embrace of the goddess. Yassel pops back up next to Han and the master is about to quit the game and Yassel comes crying to Han, wondering what they should do. What will happen to them? If the master doesn't log in for 5 months, they'll automatically be deleted. They can't let this happen. Han realizes that if that's true, he will have about 1 year and 6 months to live. Yassel starts freaking out. She hasn't been alive that long. She isn't ready to disappear. Han tells her to stop panicking. He didn't quit just yet. If he was going to stop playing, he would have stopped after synthesizing Shay into Han. Yassel calms down and trusts him, but he asks why she's so stressed. Are you going to die if they don't climb the tower? But Yassel replies that she actually will, which shocks Han. If they don't finish this game, she disappears. Han immediately gets to realization and his own world, Niflheim, doesn't have much time. The next day comes and the master logs in and buys a gold triple package, 5,000 gems and 3 gift tickets for 90 bucks, and does another premium summon. He gets 3 new rare 3 star heroes, Nokin, Weinard, and Jelen. Han looks at them and knows that they need to be taught some manners first. Nokin gets cocky asking if Han wants to die, but he just tells him to meet him in the training grounds. Nokin isn't that patient and swings at Han, but Han just beats the living shit out of him. Edith does the same with the other hero, and Han thinks he bought another triple pull. He's not learning from his mistakes. He might be planning to throw these in with two random 1 stars and hope he can clear the 12th floor. This isn't ideal. You might as well pull for 5 heroes instead. But despite that, a new party 3 is formed, with the 3 heroes and 2 1 stars. Han welcomes Nokin saying he wanted to train him first, but he's being sent to fight immediately. The gate opens and party 3 manages to come back alive. Only one of them was in critical condition. These people did better than the others, and Yassel gives one ticket from the master. A few days pass and the new recruits are training alongside Han and the boys, and he thinks to himself that his spot might be taken as the lead party. Nokin looks over menacingly at Han, but is bonked on the head. Han continues to run and more time passes. Even though party 3 doesn't have a mage, their team comp isn't bad and continue to climb floors, and whatever's plan seemed to be working. Nokin lifts his feet on the table, laughing at the other two parties. They've been abandoned by the master. If they can grow more, they will be able to consume them, except for the magician girl. They will add her to the party. Gellin wonders how since they're already full, but Winard says they have two useless punks and they can get rid of one. Han appears behind Nokin, scaring the shit out of him, saying how good their plan sounds. He asks what Han is doing here and he just wants to get some water. They can continue scheming. Nokin starts stuttering and Han thinks that they won't last long. They have poor teamwork and two one stars in their party, and they're not being treated as human. But whatever is satisfied. After a few hiccups, party 3 broke through the 14th floor and seemed to have an easy time, or maybe they were lucky. There isn't a single member of party 3 or level 10. The moment they get to the 15th floor, the master will look to synthesize for them. Yavoka wonders if they should try and do something before this happens, and begs Han to do something. Han says he is doing something, but if she wants to change parties, he won't stop her. Yavoka doesn't want to and will stick next to Han. He asks her if she was practicing telekinesis, which she was, and she knows her progress. She learned silent and mobile casting. Han is happy about this, but she is about to pass out. 
But on the other hand, the master is not improving at all. The waiting room is well equipped, but there is too many heroes. Some facilities were unlocked, but never constructed. He needs to upgrade the waiting room, but doesn't seem interested. It seems he only has his focus set on Party 3, as we see them training, preparing for the 15th floor. Party 3 seems to have realized that they are receiving the master's favor, and started to get cocky as a result asking for more privileges in the waiting room. If they clear the 15th floor, they will grow more violent. They are called and each are given a health potion. Han and Jenna sit down to watch and she is mad the master gave them the health pots. The rift opens and Noken turns around, cursing Han, and tells him that when he comes back, the master will punish him. They enter the rift and Edith wonders why Han is so popular. But they all know if Party 3 manages to clear this floor, they need to stop their strike. And if not, they might die. They have a chance to clear it, no matter how small. There are times where the weaker party prevails, and if this happens, whatever's confidence will grow, and they won't be needed anymore, and Han will be synthesized. It's a gamble, but Party 3 is sent to a city, and confused on why it isn't a kill quest, and we see Noken's stressed expression. Five minutes pass, and everyone is eagerly awaiting an update. No status messages have been seen, but all of a sudden, the whole party is annihilated. This shocks Han, and he realizes that this must be a special quest. They died after five minutes? The world shakes and it seems the master threw his phone and logged out. Han tells everyone to go back. Party 3 was wiped out. He thinks on the situation and they were killed so fast, he didn't even get a chance to get any clues from their deaths. After this, whatever didn't log in for a long time. Isella's panicking, asking Loki on what she should do. But all they can do now is eat and train. It's been 10 days so far and Isella's worried. The One Stars are getting lazy. They don't even want to go into the daily dungeons. Han realizes that 10 days is really 3 days for the master and right on schedule he logs in again. He takes a screenshot and logs out. Isella's in despair but Han knows what he is doing and asks Yassel if she has access to the internet. She does and Han has a sinister look. We skip a little and Yassel is protesting Han's idea. He doesn't care if she doesn't want to do it. She has to, unless she wants to die. She says that what he's asking for is not easy, and she can't interfere with information from another dimension. She says that his idea needs to pile together interactions left behind by the master, but to send an article or a reply takes much more work. Han gets up thinking Yassel is useless, and it seems he'll have to do this himself. Yassel starts to sweat profusely but smacks her cheek, ready to take the risk. If it's for Loki, she must do it. She puts a hologram with a keyboard and screen, but Han just wonders if she needs to keep that weird pose, and she says she does to keep up this display. She asks Han to hurry up, and he begins going online, and goes into the pick me up forum. He clicks on progress help and finds whatever's post, which shows his problems with his current setup. Han sees his own hero portrait and is impressed on how well he looks. Who drew him? He sees that he is getting grilled in the comments, being called a noob, and Han notices that Yassel is getting to her limits. So he quickly needs to send the documents on his cloud. He sends them to whatever to help him succeed in raid. He sends him an email from his account, Loki, and everyone is freaking out, wondering if it's really him. Han wanted to post anonymously, but not much can be done. Yassel quickly falls over trying to catch her breath, but Han finished what he had to do. Yassel asks, what he sent over and Han sent his own player record and some other things on top. Yassel gets a renewed vigor. The Book of Heaven? She starts geeking out on this since everyone knows that that is the key to all of Loki's attack patterns and methods and some people would pay millions to get their hands on it. Loki just tells her to back off and she's only half right. Han sent whatever his player record documents over two years and a few theories. Han doesn't know if it contains everything in Pick Me Up, but it's everything that he analyzed and wrote. He can't guarantee if whatever will read all of the documents that he sent. The length and scale is like multiple books, and it wasn't meant for someone else to read. However, if he does read everything and is able to adopt Loki's style, this might become interesting. Will the master quit or become better than he ever imagined? Some time passes and he logs back into the game and immediately gives Han a horse statue. Han messed with the document before sending it and added at the end that the master Master needs to gift the Warhorse statue two or more times to the hero he likes best. So this confirms that Han is the top hero. In the waiting room, a notification appears that Han is delighted by his gift, but wonders if he managed to read the documents. He doesn't need a lazy master. They need to climb to the top. He might not get everything now, but if he listens to the guide, it will come in time. And now Party 1 is no longer out of control and ready to clear the 15th floor. Yassel asks Loki what will happen if the master doesn't change. But after getting this horse statue, Han thinks that that is impossible. 
and he asks Yassel when the next time he can use the internet is, but is told that that depends on how fast the intervention points are collected. Han questions what that even means, and it is explained that this is the technology that Mobius uses to mess with cause and effect. When a master logs in, it creates an intervention point, and the points build up faster the more one climbs the tower. And what can impact this as well is gems. Han is surprised that real money had this much impact, and Yassel even tells him that cash is best. If you bring some to the headquarters, you get a 1% bonus. Han doesn't seem interested and walks outside to greet his party, and he tells them that it's time to go, as party 1 becomes ready to fight. Han asks his party if they're excited to get back into battle, but Yavoka doesn't seem too happy. Eren still questions if they will go out as 4 people, but Han tells him not to worry about that, as Edith is temporarily moved to party 1. She comes in and asks Han what's going on, and after she is caught up, Party 2 becomes ready to fight as well. The rift opens and Edith tells Han that she won't help him for too long, as the group prepares to enter the 8th floor. It's time to show off the fruit of their training, as they are up against 27 level 9 goblin riders. Evoca casts her new spell, Invert, and most of the goblins lose their footing, as they float in the air. Jenna starts sniping the goblins one by one, and Yavoka follows up with Ignite, burning them alive. Han notices that Yavoka shortened her cast time from 40 to 10 seconds. Her progress is amazing. Han begins slicing up as well, and the stage is cleared. Edith wonders why she was even called, and Aaron and Yavoka level up. Han thinks that Jenna can shoot much faster now, and he can rely on her to watch his back. And Yavoka is also becoming a lot more reliable with controlling her magic. The group exits, and Han drags the mage with him. There's much he needs her to do. They go to the research lab and the master gets a notification. There's a member available for research. Yvoka questions why she was even brought here, but Han tells her that she doesn't need to physically exert herself. She just needs to do some research. We see a pop-up screen showing the three options the master can choose, hero, facility, and dungeon, and Yvoka is recommended as a researcher. The master accepts and Yassel pops out of nowhere, scaring the shit out of the poor mage. Yassel just tells her to get used to it and points to the desk in the room. All Yvoka needs to do is solve problems and put the paper in the container. Yvoka looks at the first problem and it just reminds her of all the stuff she learned in Magic Academy, and is dreading having to do more homework. But Yassel tells her that she has no choice. Han picks up a book but still can't read a thing, and Yavoka begins her work. And one research point is earned. The current research speed is 10 gems per hour, and Han notices that that is a very bad rate. The master sets a research time, and Yavoka is ordered to do 3 hours per day. Despite her cries, she immediately expresses her discontent. But Han has an idea, and asks for Yassel to request a gift, a fur coat. 3000 gold is spent, and it appears Yavoka is in love, and changes her entire tune. This must be her down payment. Han tries to take it from her, but she loves it way too much to part ways. Some time passes and the master continues to prepare for the 15th floor. He sent members into the weekday dungeons and had the craftsmen continue to make better equipment. Party 3 has been made of mostly newcomers and the master has definitely changed. Han is still sitting next to Yavoka and she just starts some conversation saying that she's good at magic theories and thinks Han is talented and asks the hero if he wants to learn magic. Han questions what she means and she says normally it would be hard for her to teach him herself but with the books in here he could gain some new skills. Han thinks that at 2 stars his class is still beginner and at 3 stars he can choose a new one and on his current trajectory he's going to become a warrior but if he can do some special conditions he can become one of the secret classes, the magic swordsman. But just because it's a hidden class doesn't mean it's strong and declines her offer. He just wants to focus on one thing at a time. Han just mocks Yavoka for wanting to teach him so he can help her solve these problems. But she just blushes denying that thought. She sighs and changes the topic and asks Han how life was before coming here. And he says he was just a simple farmer. But even Yavoka doesn't believe him. Han knows that this girl is the daughter of a renowned family. A family that was ruined due to the war. But all of a sudden, interrupting his thought, a lightning bolt hits the research building. Yavoka is shocked, but Han seems to be prepared. The research is complete, and here our reaction is now level 1. The goddess has blessed the waiting room, as blue orbs travel into each hero. One enters Yavoka, startling her, and Han explains that there's three options in research. Whatever chose to unlock the hero reaction research with 30 points. The mage is confused, and she doesn't feel well, but, but Han tells her to say, that window. She does, and a window appears showing her level and attributes. Han explains what this even is, and party 3 failed the 15th floor because they could not see the system. 
and couldn't find the objective. This research makes it possible for every hero to see. Yvoko begins reading her skills and Han tells her to come with. They should go and tell everybody. He steps outside and Aaron is seen running away from a blue light, thinking it's a ghost, but Han grabs him, holding him still, as the blue light enters his body. He gets a little moment of pleasure and hold up, pause, and Jenna approaches, already understanding the stat screen. Han is impressed and we time skip to later that evening. Han is sitting with his party as they talk about this new trait that they have, and Yavoka asks Han how he even knew about this, but he just says he found out just like them, but no one is convinced. But Jenna just takes his side saying that Han was here before all of them, and he has a lot of experience, but Yavoka is still suspicious. She sighs and tells Han to keep his secrets to himself. His advice so far has been helpful. Jenna continues to praise Han and the two girls begin to argue. And man, I'm getting jealous again. Every MC has this amazing problem. Han thinks to himself that if they survive this game, he will tell them everything. But if it comes to that, he's gonna have to say goodbye. The next day comes and the info on the stat window is now shared to everybody as you see Roderick and Edith taking a look. But not everyone could see the entire stat window because the research is still low. We shift to the training grounds and Jenna is firing at Han, annoyed that she can't get a single hit in. And she asks if that's a skill and Han says that it is. And he asks Jenna if she thinks there's a skill to counter the one he is using. She is interested and Han uses her hesitation to get behind her, ready to strike, but she ends up ducking down, asking if Han is trying to kill her. Han says it'll be fine as long as he doesn't one-shot her and to get her head back into the fight. She's only gonna level up in intense situations. He continues his assault and Jenna is dodging his strikes. She separates and draws an arrow and Han tells her that there is no rules. This is their new training method, to fight until someone is at death's door. Some villagers are looking at the fight shocked that Han really was just a farmer before this life. They think it has to be a lie and the two continue their fight. Han asks if the girl wants to surrender and he needs to train with Eren as well. And we shift to him saying that it's fine. We see that he fought Han 32 times and lost every single match. And Jenna fought Han 19 times and has only won once. They continue the duel and Han charges in, but right before he can get there, a dagger is thrown into his face, taking him off guard. We see a light shine in Jenna's eyes and she gets a skill awakening, weakness detection, and begins firing arrows that stagger Han back. He's confused, wondering how she just learned that skill, but Jenna says she thought of it just now. Han is impressed that she actually got a skill just from thinking about it and smiles ready to continue the fight. An arrow is launched as Han barely moves his head to dodge. Jenna is now firing to make Han dodge and sending secondary shots towards his compromised location. Han is being pushed back and now the arrows are becoming way harder to move around. Jenna levels up her archery to 6 and Han notices that she is getting stronger, but he can't back down either. He blocks the barrage with his shield and the onlookers are shocked at this fight as Eren watches on, gripping his spear. So this is talent. Han is trying to close the distance but is having a difficult time. Wants to only use his shield in emergencies and needs the most stressful situations in order to level up. The barrage continues and one pierces Han's hair. He needs to predict the trajectory of the arrows and now Han himself gets a skill awakening, insight, and he also levels up his throw defense to 3 and his swordsmanship to 7. He blocks everything and rushes in at Jenna, ending the duel, and this marks his 19th victory. Jenna thinks that he's a monster and the two check their stat panel. Han notices his new skills and Jenna asks what skills Eren has. He lists the few that he has and Jenna just makes him feel like complete shit. But Han tells Eren that he shouldn't worry about the number of skills. Sometimes they actually can hurt someone, depending on their synergy. But he thinks to himself that Jenna has 9 skills and is a top tier hero. We shift to the mage building and we see an item combination of a fire, water, and wind attribute stone to create a basic promotion stone. The master proceeds but the combination fails and he loses the materials. He tries he tries again and it completes and he gets the promotion stone. Han thinks to himself on everyone's level and he is around level 12 now, and he thinks back on his own promotion. It was special since Tail decided to interfere, but assumes Jenna will see her past just as he did. The hero's forgotten memories have awakened. Jenna transforms to two stars and she comes out depressed having a similar dream. The forest she used to live in is on fire, but Han tells her that that was a fake dream and not to worry about it. But still, it does bother her. Han asks if she felt anything else and she says it was like a weight getting lifted off of her shoulders. He assumes that heroes are in a state of amnesia and only around the 4 or 5 stars do they really realize the truth of why they were summoned here. 
the truth of their world. Aaron was next to be promoted, and he too reached two stars. And after this promotion, he was more driven to train. Han leaves the grounds, and Aaron asks where he's going. But Han says he has something to do, but reminds Aaron not to overtrain. He's gonna ruin himself. Han activates Berserk and strikes the dummy as Aaron watches, but Han is not satisfied with his own power. He thinks his technique is not finished. When he activates the ability, he becomes stronger, but he loses efficiency and composure. If he can get these two skills to synergize, he will become even more powerful. Edith watches Han training and Han asks why she's here, but she asks him about his party. They are made up of people who had no combat experience and coldly asks Han if he has ever killed someone before. Han asks if she is questioning his determination and she agrees. Han is here at the cost of other people's lives, the ones that were synthesized into him. She should have already known the answer. She looks down and thinks that that is true and remembers that his plot killed the four remaining members of the Pulverizing Wolves. Han turns to continue training, angry at this insult, and all he had to do in this bullshit game is kill monsters. But Edith says that Han is different than his party. It seems like he remembers. Han tells her that he's just like them and not to worry, and we time skip to the next day, and party 1 is being taken onto another mission. They wonder if it's the 11th floor again, but Han notices that it's actually the 12th. Han tells Jenna to fight as she's been doing, and the group is transported to the 12th floor, and the quest is subjugation. This time a voice screams at them to stop, and it's 13 level 11 human soldiers. They're asking for their name and identity, and the group is entirely confused, and Edith looks worried. The group is confused by their new enemy, but Han looks determined. Aaron protests that these aren't monsters and just normal people, and they should try to get some information. Han understands his feelings and wanted to avoid a situation like this, but he knows they won't be able to survive this raid unless they kill these men. These are different than normal NPCs. They can see and interact with the heroes. They are enemies. Han orders his party to raise their weapons, but nobody wants to fight other humans. Han raises his sword, asking them if they will try and stop him instead. The situation is tense, but Han allows Aaron to try and speak with the soldiers. Aaron says he wishes to speak and the enemy soldiers agree, but ask Aaron to come closer while their spears are still raised. Aaron looks at his spear and places it on the ground, but Han grabs his own man. He can't just listen to everything they say, and yells for the soldiers to do the same. The soldiers don't want to drop their weapons at first, which causes anger in Han, but after some conversation between them. The soldiers drop their spears and hope to talk this out. Everyone drops their weapons and the leader approaches, hoping to have a proper discussion, but says that he can hear a voice endlessly inside of his mind and he can't stop it. And that voice is saying even now. Han knows what is about to happen as the veins of the soldier begin to turn black and he turns into a wicked fiend, taking his dagger out trying to kill Eren. The voice tells him to kill everyone. Han knew something like this was bound to happen. Heroes who were hesitant to attack were always annihilated. He grabs his sword ready to intercept and pierces a soldier. Jenna is shocked but Han throws a dagger hitting another soldier with a crossbow. Han says no matter who they face or how they look, the only thing that greets them in these floors are enemies, as another crossbowman is hit in the head by this time Edith's dagger. Aaron's still standing completely shocked, but Han asks if he still wants to talk. It's kill or be killed. Aaron regains his composure ready to fight and Jenna does the same. They made up their mind and Yavoka begins her cast. The type of enemy doesn't matter. The most important thing in creating a party is in strength but mentality. A wave of human soldiers rush in and Han prepares his party to face them. The fight begins and Edith notices that these guys are not normal, as her and Han are slashing them down. Han calls for Yavoka and she casts Ignite, engulfing dozens of men in her flames. Jenna and Aaron continue their assault through the fire and Han vertically slashes another soldier. He notes that the soldiers have good armor, but no organization. One of the men begs on the floor to be spared. He has a wife and daughter. He needs to return. But Han just asks the man plainly, how he plans to return, and he screams and is put out of his misery. Edith thinks that these people have been brainwashed, but has never seen it done on this big of a scale. The group notices that the blood of these humans is black and thick. Han inspects and thinks to himself that it's similar to Tails. There is too little proof and he can't say much yet, but the stage is cleared and Jenna and Edith level up. And the party returns, Han tells his group to get used to these type of battles. Aaron wonders if Han means to get used to murdering people, and he is exactly right. There is no difference in this game between humans and monsters. And as expected, there were human form monsters on the 14th and 15th floor. The equipment and number of people and formations were all different. But one thing was the same, their unnatural hostility towards the heroes. This helped them kill without hesitation though, but fighting these type of enemies builds stress faster. But the master did seem to notice this and gave the party some extra time to rest. 
and after a few days, the group level up enough to attempt the 15th floor. Evoca and Edith don't gain as much XP due to their high ranks, and that's the only drawback with getting 3 stars so early. The equipment workshop produced a new item, a leather pouch, and Han was able to carry more items, and he is equipped with a couple health potions. Yassel tells Han to be careful since those are expensive, but Yassel herself drops one, making Han give her a death stare. Yassel begins to scream, blaming the master, but they shift back to the group. Everyone now has 3 health potions, and Yavolka has 2 mana pots. Yassel tells him to listen to Han, and that's the only way to survive. And finally, they will attempt the 15th floor. Han has no idea what kind of quest it will be, but doesn't think it's a chain quest like the 10th. They will need to do what they've always done. Han thinks to himself that his total stats is 107, and he's comparable to an advanced 3 star. And he has been here for 2 months, and hasn't taken a single break. The master begins using the recording feature, and Han notices it. And is slightly impressed. Even though the master can't interact with the mission, this will change in higher floors. Han tells the group that this floor will be a special mission, just like the 10th. Party 3 died within 5 minutes and didn't even get a chance to fight. It's because they didn't know the objective. Han's first goal is to find out what they need to do and what the quest type is and make sure not to fail. They have about 15 minutes to do this, and based on what happened to Party 3, a mistake can mean all of their deaths. Han thinks that time flows differently inside of the floors, and taking that into account, he came up with 15 minutes, due to the clues that he knows. He assumes that this floor is a time-sensitive mission. The rift opens and they have 10 seconds to get ready. Han turns back and tells the group that they have 3 minutes to gather information, and they are transported to another city that seems to be bustling with life. But yet again, the humans can't see them, and it's unusually peaceful. Han sees a notification and it's a guard type mission, protect a certain person. Han swests and the quest wants them to protect someone among this crowd. Han thinks that party 3 must have been shocked after seeing this crowd, and without knowing the mission, their first thought must have been to kill civilians. Either two things could have happened, they killed the person they were supposed to protect, or they were attacked by enemies. If they don't want to die the same way, they need to find the quest NPC, and fast. Han tells his party the goal of this stage, which confuses Jenna. Han asks if anyone knows where they are, and Aaron does. He came here as a merchant, it has many interconnected roads, and was a trade capital. Han asks if there's any noteworthy people, and Aaron says there is in the temple in the middle of the city, that is used for worshipping the goddess, and it's a famous white cathedral. Jenna gets excited, but Han asks if Aaron thinks these people are heading there now. Aaron thinks that some sort of event is going on, and Han orders Edith to assist him. They will go to the temple. Edith dashes off to the tallest point and sees the cathedral, towering over the other buildings. Han approaches the guards who try and tell him that he can't enter, but the poor guy is met with a knee to the face, knocking him out. Before Moron Guard 2 can blow his whistle, Han hits him with his shield. Aaron is confused, but Han just tells him to think about it. These guys can see them. It means they are the enemy. The cavalry NPCs and other soldiers on the 10th floor couldn't interact with the heroes, but suddenly these guards can? Something is wrong. He tells his party not to worry, he didn't kill them, and this part of the city is crowded. Han asks Aaron if they arrived at the hall, and he says that they have. On a balcony, an old priest begins walking towards a large group of people, and they wait in anticipation. The priest slams his stick down, grabbing everyone's attention, and casts a large-scale spell, ordering everyone to be quiet. Yavoka notices it and tells Han that it's magic amplification. Han tells the group that they have no time and they need to get inside of that temple. For an event like this to happen on this floor, it must mean that they need to protect a main character of the story. The group approaches, but the guards protest yet again, but Han doesn't have time to waste like this to die. Han asks the guards to move away from that door, unless they want to die. The guard asks if they are heretics, and Han just laughs, kicking down the goddess statue. A warning appears, and now the guards are hostile, rushing in at the group. Yavoka just sighs, and Han asks his party if any of them believe in God. But the only thing they believe in now is themselves. The human soldiers rush in at them with axes in hand, and Han and Eren will deal with these men. The rest will go forward. Han dodges a strike, piercing a guard through the face, and he parries a blow with his shield. He cuts another man in two and rushes at the third soldier, hitting him with a heavy blow in the stomach. The captain orders his men to protect the temple as Han continues his assault. Jenna starts firing as well, and the group continues forward, trying to find the person they are meant to protect. There's a few minutes left. They need to hurry. Han enters the cathedral. Han yells for Yavoka, and she casts Invert, moving all of the debris from the room. A priest asks how these heretics got in here, but Han notices no change in the quest text, so it can't be him. 
He spots a passageway, but the soldiers rush into the room. He orders his group to handle the incoming enemies, while he goes to find the NPC. A soldier tries to chase after Han, but is smacked on the head. Han thinks that the old priest also wasn't the target, so he needs to move fast. He races up the stairs and sees a knight at the top, who is the world's longest introduction. Han just runs right past him before he can finish, hurting the pride of Sir Jerkoff. Han starts kicking down doors, desperately trying to find his target, as the knight keeps chasing him. It seems not everyone can see him, and Han knows that he has less than 3 minutes to find his target. He bursts through another door and sees a beautiful garden, but interrupting his view stands 3 elite knights, ready to strike down the heretic. We shift back to the balcony and a princess is seen talking to the old priest, who informs her that there is an intruder. We shift back to Han's fight and he is desperately holding out against the three adversaries. Blood stains the flowers and these knights are on a different level than regular soldiers. One smacks down on Han's shield but he slashes at his ankle. He wraps around his back dealing a finishing blow to the crippled knight. Two more to go. He blocks another strike and throws his shield at the other knight. He takes his sword and pierces the face of the second knight, which was pretty savage. And now he is one on one with the leader. The two send a barrage of strikes at each other, but neither gain any ground. Han gathers his energy, and with a sword in either hand, he slashes them together at the knight. One of Han's swords breaks, but he doesn't relent, and decapitates the knight captain. We shift back to the princess, who thanks the priest for his help, and she won't forget his loyalty. But all of a sudden, Han enters the balcony, and the priest cries out, but Han is confused. The priest prepares an ominous red spell, die. But he's not aiming for Han, he's aiming for the princess. Han wastes no time and rushes in, removing the head from this corrupted priest. The beam continues firing, but it misses the princess, but unfortunately it destroys a building and rubble falls all over the citizens. Han looks over the dead body, confused on what the hell is even going on, but the princess turns around, asking who Han even is. He tells her that she doesn't need to know, which frightens her, and come on Han, like this is obviously the person you gotta protect, you can be a little nicer. She questions if he is an assassin, here to kill her, but Han grabs her head, shielding her from more incoming attacks. Han cuts down the arrows meant to pierce the princess, and now she starts to catch on. He orders her to stay down as three hooded figures appear. One pulls out some daggers and throws them at the princess. Han intercepts and notices that the daggers are poisoned. They are desperately trying to kill the princess. One lunges out, but Edith snipes him from a nearby rooftop. Han rushes in taking care of the second assassin, but a third appears from his blind side. He throws a spinning shuriken, but Han blocks it with his shield, and slices the remaining assassin. Edith says that the wall she was on was way too high, and asks about who this kid is. The princess also wants to know who these people are, and for them to go away, but an arrow interrupts her thoughts, and asks if she's really sure about that, because if they leave, she will die. He tells her to follow them, or she can stay here. She thinks about it for a second, but has no choice, and a special NPC joins the party. The mission objective has been cleared, and a new one appears. Their objective is now to escape. Han knew it wouldn't be that easy and grabs a crossbow. He will keep the enemies at bay. The rest of party one appears, alerting Han to the soldiers that are gathered at the cathedral. He tells them to memorize this kid's face, and this is the one that they need to protect. She says she isn't a kid, but Yavoka seems to know who she is. Han interrupts everyone, saying that identities don't matter. He ties a rope and orders everyone to take it down. They will secure an escape route. Edith has already thought about this and says the left path has the least resistance, and the best route. Han orders his members to go that way and tells the group the order of who goes down first. Han tells Yavoka to cast a fire wall, blocking the path for the enemies. She does just that and the group begins climbing down. Han grabs the princess and tells her that it's time to go, and jumps onto the rope. Arrows barely miss her head as she grabs on to Han desperately. They reach the bottom and Han tells the girl to let go already, and looks up to see Evoka slowly descending. He yells at her to hurry up and Aaron is busy holding the front line, but a dagger pierces his side. The notification hits Han and he realizes that he has little time. He calls out to Aaron but the man yells back that he's okay. Evoka finally lands and Han knows that they have the target. They need to get out of this field to clear the mission. He orders the party to go left as the soldiers chase. They call the princess a witch, alerting her to this betrayal. A knight turns the corner but Han one shots him and continues moving forward. Soldiers appear from the other side, but Edith calls to Han to continue another way. As they run, Evoka casts a spell to secure their back. They reach the secluded area and Edith signals the party to rest shortly. The princess falls to her knees and Han thinks that Evoka's wall won't last long. It'll be bad if they're surrounded here. He pulls a health potion and looks towards Eren and realizes that he has been poisoned, and the pain won't stop despite 
how many health potions he's drank. Han knows that his time is limited and looks towards the princess, asking if she has any skills. This is their only hope to save Eren. Sometimes a special NPC can contribute to the party. She apologizes and says she doesn't have any, and Han understands. Eren is poisoned and the most time he has is about 10 minutes, and they don't have an antidote and no NPC can heal him. Eren tells Han to leave him behind. He gets up and wants to go stall for time, but Han grabs his face. Jenna wants everyone to survive, reminiscing on the journey the three have been on since the start. Eren curses his own weakness and Han thinks on the situation. The princess is already a burden and carrying Eren might be too much to handle. He drinks a health pot and throws Eren another, telling him to drink it. Eren tells him that it won't help, but Han tells him to drink it anyways. It will stop him from getting worse. Han orders everyone to give their health potions to Eren, telling him to drink one every 10 minutes. Eren thinks this is a waste, but it's a direct order from Han. They will divide up the party and the first group will be Edith, Han, and the child. In party 2 will be Eren, Yavolka, and Jenna. Each will protect their own member until the princess can escape. Han says the enemy is only after the princess, and if Jenna takes the group in the opposite direction, she should be able to find a safe exit. Eren tries to protest, but Han tells him to shut up. Edith says that this plan is too reckless, they might not be able to protect the princess with just the two of them. Han says that they will take a different approach, and they need to escape. They will infiltrate the crowd and escape in the cover of night. They will wait until nightfall to begin their plan, and since they have a new strategy, they don't need to fight head on, and will go forward using stealth. And since they're not fighting a massive enemies, Yavolka can use her magic to distract the soldiers' attention, and Jenna will be with that party for added protection. Eren apologizes again, but Han tells him to shut it. He's not keeping him alive for his sake. He tells the two girls that if push comes to shove, they should just abandon him. Their lives are worth more. The break is over and it's time to move. Party 1 goes left and Party 2 goes right. Han asks Edith if she spotted any hiding places and she says that there's quite a few. They can maneuver inside the buildings. This startles Han since he didn't think the buildings were accessible. This floor seems to be different from the ones before. Party 1 is maneuvering through the slums and a homeless man approaches the princess, asking if she's lost, but Edith just breaks his leg and tells the group to move on. A tip appears telling the master that long term missions can take place and even if he logs out, the heroes will continue continue working. He thinks the kid that he is protecting is also oddly calm. She can't be any ordinary child. She quickly realized the situation and was hardly panicked. Han's group finds a place to hide in to wait until it's dark out, and Edith leaves to go set traps. The princess sits back and Han looks at Edith. She reassures him that she will be right back. She needs to find the path out. Han sits and wonders if he should have switched with Jenna. There isn't much that he can do here. But the girl introduces herself as Phrysis, the second successor of the Empire, and asks where Han came from. But he just says that that's none of her business. She demands to know, but even if Han told her, she wouldn't understand. She asks if he came from a place that she doesn't know about, and that's technically half right. But the next sentence hits Han. The princess asks if he was the soldier that saved Nelsa. Han wonders if that city was the 10th floor, and he overheard NPCs saying something along those lines. Frises sees his reactions and confirms her suspicions. She saw it in her dreams. There were soldiers fighting hard to protect the city, but she couldn't see their faces. And Nelsa's survivors said that a group of people protected them, and if they didn't come, the city would have fell. But no one could see who they were. It was an ominous dream and she also saw the empire burn and the continent on fire. And these dreams made her certain that the world was going to end. Mysterious monsters are invading and Nelsa fell victim to that. Usually they don't invade human territory. Han just wonders why she is telling him this, but the princess says that she needs power. Power to save the world. Han asks if she wants his help and he lays back in his chair and wonders why she needs him. She must have some incredible power. There should be knights ready to support her. The girl just sighs and says that her lineage is meaningless. She has nothing and no one listens or obeys her. Han tells her that if she has money she can just hire some mercenaries. The princess scrambles telling Han that she'll pay him and she might not have power but she does have money. But Han casually tells her to look for someone else. She tightens her grip and no one has ever believed her about her dreams and no one ever listens. But Han is different. He didn't laugh at her story and that's why she wants to hire him. Han thinks that this is annoying and based on what he knows, this is Tano years past. And even if he wanted to help, it wouldn't work out. This child is just an NPC and after they're done this mission, he doesn't even know if they will meet again. Is that a no? She asks. Han says that he has his reason and she might even laugh at them and tells the girl that he's from a different world. She asks what he means but Han thinks it's okay to spill the beans. It's not like it's his game. He tells her that he's from a shitty place and he's here on a mission. 
The world he is from gives them missions, and if he can't complete them, he will die. And today's mission was to protect a special someone. And after not knowing who it was, he realized that it was her. The princess is confused, asking what he means, and Han confirms her thoughts. When they are done here, they will return to their world, and that's why he can't help. The girl wonders if he is lying, but Han doesn't care if she believes him or not. She decides to put her trust in these warriors from another world, and she doesn't laugh at his story, since Han didn't laugh at hers. And she is sure that he has his reasons, and won't bother him anymore, and will continue worrying about her job. Han asks what her job is, and it's to prevent her dreams from becoming a reality. Han asks if she was the one who called everyone to the square, and she did in fact. She wanted to give a speech, and Han asks what for, and the goal was to gain influence. In this moment, she has no power compared to her brother. Han thinks that if they didn't arrive, she would have surely died. If there is a meaning to this game, then that means the princess is an NPC worth saving. Han formally tells the girl his name, and she smiles softly. She thanks Han for what he did, but they're not done yet. Han asks why people are so hell-bent on killing her, but she doesn't know. He throws her a rag and tells her to wear it. She's sticking out like a sore thumb. She questions on what to do, but Han urges her to change and leaves the room. He can hear her and it sounds like she is crying and she's only 15 at this point and anyone in her position would do the same. Her life hasn't been easy. She puts on simple clothes and she says the texture is weird. Han says that he's sure it is, some bugs were laying eggs on it, startling the princess, but he tells her he was only joking. They will leave in a couple hours and tells her to get some sleep. Han knows if something happens to Eren, they will get a notification, and he hopes that he can hold out a little bit longer. Time passes and Han thinks that he talked way too much. Edith comes back and says that she found an exit, but there's a small problem. There is 22 knights blocking the path. Han thinks that this is way too many for them to deal with, and Edith questions if they should try to find another gate. Han thinks that they have no choice, and he could manage himself, but protecting the princess could prove difficult. And the knight captain is level 21, which is 5 more levels than most of the knights he has dealt with so far. He has no choice. He asks Edith if she knows where Jenna's party is. She doesn't, but Han asks if she knows the layout of the city. There's a dress and crown back at the shelter, and he wants her to make Jenna put it on and use her as bait. According to Edith's info, they can't leave another way. They could try something else, but they're running out of time. If Jenna can disguise herself and lure out the soldiers towards her, they will be able to complete the mission. Edith goes to do her task, and Han leaves his shield behind. He doesn't want to take a risk of it reflecting light. He tells the girl to stay inside. In one hour, they will escape. And when he gives her the signal, she has to run, even if Han dies. There's no turning back. She tries to argue, but agrees. She assumes that this is their last moment together, and the two lock eyes. We shift to party two, and Yavolka is tending to Eren, but he's in bad shape. Jenna is begging for this to end, and Edith grabs a disguise, and Han vows to leave this city before dawn. Han thinks that his plan should work, but a notification appears that Eren is inflicted with a deadly poison. His HP will slowly be lost. His condition is worsening. Han begins to move, and he needs to work fast. If the forces gather around party two, they will attract the enemies. But while they're protecting Eren, it will be quite the task. But there's no other option. If they don't end this quickly, they could all die. Han gets a skill awakening, covert movement, and we shift back to party two. Edith brings the clothes and tells Jenna to change. Han is happy with his new skill as he approaches the guards and there's 22 enemies here. He doesn't know how many will leave when Jenna starts her act. Worst case scenario, he will have to kill them all. For now, he will wait for the signal. And all of a sudden, a huge fire storm is created in the center of the city, and all the guards are panicking. They talk to the captain, and most of their troops move to intercept. Now, only four knights remain, but the level 21 knight is still here. This is concerning, but it's more manageable. Han needs to work as fast as he can, and within one second, he chops two guards to pieces. And within the next few seconds, he easily handles the remaining low-level guards, severing their heads from their body. Han stares at the night captain, telling him to move if he wants to live. He draws his sword, and Han thinks that this is bad. His armor is strong. He won't be able to slice through it. He needs to aim for the gaps inside of it. There's no time to waste. He needs to go. Han rushes in, and the knight easily parries, sending him back. The two send a barrage of strikes, but the knight isn't budging. And he's also not attacking Han. Han purposefully left openings for the knight to exploit, but he's only defended that spot. It's almost like he knows that he will win if he stalls for time. A notification appears that Jenna is bleeding, and Eren is on the brink of death. The knight laughs, and Han enters state. He rushes at him, and now Yavolka is in a state of mana frenzy. There's no time. Han tells the kid to run, and he kicks the knight, sending him back, but he rushes in at the princess. Han intercepts his strike, but all of a sudden, an assassin appears, throwing a poison dagger at the princess. Han shielded her from it, but now it pierces him instead, and he's poisoned. He tells her not to stop, and to continue running, and the whole party is in a critical condition. Han spits up blood, but the knight doesn't relent, and charges back into him. The knight sends power into his legs and strikes Han, 
causing him to cough up more blood. And if it wasn't for Han's armor, his ribs would have been shattered. But thankfully, he did just as much damage back as he plunged a dagger into the knight's eye. He asks if it hurts, and now Edith is bleeding. There's no time. Han charges in again, taking the dagger out of the knight's face and throws it at the assassin, killing him. The knight tries to swing on Han, but he leaps over the attack and he drop kicks the knight into the ground. Before he can regain his composure, Han stands over him. And with his devilish aura, he ends the duel. The princess exits the castle when Han unleashes his strike, breaking the knight's face and he stumbles back. The poison is spreading fast. He coughs up more blood and thinks that this is bullshit. He sees the girl exit and he says goodbye. He feels so tired. It looks like this is it. His body begins to light up and we see the rest of the party also on death's door. But as the princess runs farther from the city, a light envelops everyone and the stage is cleared and the MVP is Han. Everyone levels up and Jenna yells that she thought that she was gonna die and yells at Han. He made her wear that dress and run around. Han just laughs mocking her. What? He didn't like it? It looked expensive. So what? No one died. Jenna falls to the floor telling him that that's not the issue. The recording is complete and Han tells everyone, good job. They cleared the stage and the master disconnects. And Han tells Edith that she was the true MVP. And none of this would have been done without her. She smiles but now it's time for her to go back to her party. She has done her part. Han thinks that he will miss her help. Her planning was elite. Evoca yawns and wants to go rest and she needs some sleep. Jenna grabs Aaron telling him not to be sad. He was just unlucky. Aaron stands and apologizes to Han, but Han just reminds him that now he is awake. He won't save him a second time. Aaron asks if that's a promise. Do you intend on taking me to the top of this damn tower? Aaron curses himself again, saying he is much weaker, and the gap between him and the others grows every day. He can't live up to the rest of the party. So? Han asks. Aaron just walks past him, apologizing again, and he was just saying nonsense. Han thinks to himself that it was true the group struggled more than they needed to because of Aaron, and if he wasn't injured, it would have went smoother. Aaron's current level is 14, and his level is the same, but his stack growth is much different. Jenna and Han's stats go up by 5 or 6 when they level, but Aaron's don't change. And it's even worse when it comes to skills. His proficiency is low, and he can't hold many skills. He's good at basic combat, but isn't good at utilizing strategies. They can manage for now, but the gap will continue to widen as time goes on. And in the end, he'll be left out. Or die in a mission. There isn't much left for him in party 1. Han didn't abandon him because they were friends. He hasn't become irrational. If he can't keep up, you'll be left behind. Nighttime comes and Yavoka is so excited. Han is enforcing them to run while threatening them that he will only feed them potatoes. Han doesn't see a reason to make a training schedule and he wants to reward something like a little holiday for like three days. The master won't call them to combat for some time. Han asks Jenna and Aaron what they will do but they don't feel comfortable unless they train. Han begins to run and attaches 10 kilogram weights to his ankles. If he doesn't do at least this, he won't get tired at all. His peak physical ability has been reached. Is this the effect of the intervention power Yussel talked about? After Han gave whatever the guide, the atmosphere changed in the waiting room. Low rank heroes were always on edge and they finally started to relax, since whatever wasn't synthesizing them. They didn't need to compete with each other. A man spits on the floor next to Han and Han wants to know what these bozos want. The man says it doesn't matter who Han was, he needs to prove his use, if he wants to live. Or that was what he was told. This got him excited. This might be a place where anything is possible. He enjoyed fighting with life on the line. But what about now? All he can hear is laughter of those lesser than livestock. This is Belkist, also one of the second generations. A little odd, but has trained relentlessly, and also has amazing talent. And by his side is Nerissa. Belkis draws his sword tired of the calm environment, and he wants to educate the weak, and asks Han for permission to do so. Han tells him not to act out of line, but Belkis says it'll be fine as long as he doesn't kill anyone. Han turns around with his menacing aura and Belkis calms down, and asks if Han was lying. Does proving one's worth not mean anything? This great synthesis I heard about? It hasn't been used once. Han tells the man that he will know soon enough. Just go do your work. He turns and leaves and looks forward to seeing him. Han's rule of thumb was using synthesis with caution. When he operated Niflheim and posted his guide, many tried, but all failed. Fear is the easiest way to control the waiting room. Without synthesis, the heroes won't listen to the master. They become lazy and defy orders. It's similar to the situation now. There is many lazy heroes not contributing much. He turns to see Enok back from a dungeon and wonders if something happened. He asks why he went in there all by himself, and is told that no one is doing any work. 
They only tossed a few branches and lazed around in the forest. Now, thanks to this info, Han knows what to do. A few months ago, people had no choice but to work. But now, they stroll around thinking this is some sort of joke. Enoch asks if the world has gotten better, and Han thinks that the Master should notice what's going on. The daily dungeons and training are not going well. The operational efficiency is declining. There are two solutions. One, mass synthesis. But if he misuses this tactic, the stress level will skyrocket. Solution two is motivating the heroes with something else than fear. We shift to the research building and whatever researches facility improvement. He spends 150 points and it levels up to 1. And more buildings are available for construction. And now the master can edit detailed functions of certain buildings. The facility customizer is an option that allows the master to change certain buildings in the waiting room. Han looks up and smiles. There's gonna be a party soon. Aaron approaches asking to spar with Han and Han mentions that Aaron just finished sparring with Edith. He won't last a second in that shape. Aaron says he's fine but Han doesn't agree with Aaron's reckless training. Training. But the master calls for all the heroes. They appear in the square and Yassel pops up telling everybody to get ready. If everyone's not here, there will be trouble. Yassel orders everyone into the storage room and tells them they might disappear if they're caught up in it. Everyone is confused but Yassel tells them that they are doing a mass renovation. The waiting room begins to shake and the construction begins. The residence has been upgraded to level 3 as well as the training grounds. And Jenna remembers this feeling from before. The residence levels up and Edith is confused. But Jenna laughs mockingly. She is new after all. Also, a bathhouse, lounge, and cafeteria were all constructed. And with all of this, the town square levels up to 3. Han smiles telling Aaron it's not what he's been expecting. Senna tells everyone not to worry, the master is just upgrading the new buildings. Everyone gets really excited and Yassel tells them that they can come out. And they're all completely shocked. The lobby has changed into a modern town. Some buildings, and now the waiting room has more floors. All the buildings are complete and Jenna is excited to check the bathhouse. We see a new three-floored building and people enter and are completely taken aback. There's nothing in the first level. No sofas, fireplaces, not even beds. Jenna wonders how this could have happened, but Han knows why. He tells her to look towards the stairs and they go up and Jenna enters the second floor and sees fully furnished rooms completely in all of her new accommodations. Now there is a clear divide between those who live on the first floor and those on the second. Everyone wonders how the master will assign rooms and the perks on the second floor even include a daily bath. Everyone is arguing at each other and Edith just has a headache from all of this commotion. The citizens are fighting over spots but Yassel tells them that the assignment is very important. The master begins dividing up the areas and he decides the fates of all 35 people. Yassel gathers all the information and applies the changes. Party 1 with 4 people are all allowed on the second floor and they choose their rooms first. Same thing goes for party 2. All the craftsmen and cooks also get to live on the second floor which makes Chloe smile. And everyone outside of that is on the first floor. The regular people are outraged and party 3 comes back, wanting to know what is going on. The angry people start telling them what happened and Jenna whispers to Han. She thinks that this is a bit strange. Han doesn't agree, but Jenna is concerned with only having 13 people on the second floor. The people are yelling and screaming and party 3 questions if they too are on the first floor. Up until now all the heroes have lived similar lives and all the rewards have been the same. And typically this method is fine as long as you have a few heroes and use synthesis often. When you want to expand the waiting room, separation is needed. Evoca explains that this this is like aristocrats and peasants and she actually likes this. She didn't like how the regular heroes were acting. Han explains that Jenna trains all day and goes on hunts. Do you think any of these people do the same? Evoke agrees that most of the people here are pretty much useless and Edith chimes in wondering if the master is assigning ranks. The masses continue to protest and we are introduced to the facility customization. This feature was only used to decorate the lobby a bit in the start of the game until masters realize that the heroes are very similar to humans. Whatever just created a 3D model of Han's beginner version of Niflheim. There are some disadvantages but this is the simplest way to do it. To decrease the use of synthesis. Yassel begins to get angry at these lazy peons and smacks the floor leaving a crater behind. She yells at these fake heroes who are so entitled. A month ago they would have all been synthesized. They don't know how lucky they even are. Their protest seems to come to an end and after seeing Yassel's display of power, she tells Chloe and Amarin that they will continue to only cook for the people in the second floor. One of the first floor residents asks what they are meant to eat but Yassel doesn't care. Figure that out. Also, the first floor is banned from eating meat. There are potatoes in the pantry. Another man says this is some bullshit and they aren't even getting beds and can only eat potatoes? Veins bulge in his head, asking who has the right to treat him like this. He won't take it. But Yassel calmly asks what he's going to do about it. He doesn't answer and Belkis charges in, seemingly at Yassel, but he cuts off the arm of the man protesting, saying it's fine as long 
as he doesn't kill him. I don't care who you are or where you are from. Show your youth if you want to live. Those were Han's words to all of the newcomers. A hero is talking to Belkist, reiterating those words, telling him to follow the rules strictly. And don't bother party one and two. Belkist thinks for a moment and he just saw them train and reckons in a little while. He'll be able to take that Aaron guy and asks how strong Han really is. The man isn't sure and he was never in the party, but he has heard rumors from Jenna. She tells them a lot of things about the adventures that they have. Belkis wants to know if the man witnessed synthesis, but he has not. The master stopped for a while, and that is the reason why he is still even here. Belkis thinks on it a second, realizing that one can get stronger each battle, and gain skills the more that they train. And currently Han is the leader. He smiles and thanks the man for this info, and the guy tries to tell him his name, but Belkis coldly tells him that he's not interested. We shift back to the present, and Yassel coldly looks at this psycho, and he twirls his sword around, saying he's heard of the battles of party 1 and 2, and is a little jealous. He couldn't be a part of any of it. But now, it doesn't look like proving your worth matters anymore. From what he heard, there was a really good system to get rid of trash, but for some reason, the master doesn't use it. Belkis throws the arm back at the man, telling him that he can reattach it if he wants. You wouldn't know about that. You've never experienced death. These words send chills to the rest of the lazy heroes. He came back from an interesting event, and he really likes this world a lot, but is feeling quite bored. So does anyone want their arms removed? And the heroes start to curse this crazy man, but Belka says he'd rather be crazy than a useless pig. And this guy's starting to grow on me a little bit. Han appears asking why Belka intervened like that, but the man says that he was so disgusted his body moved on reflex. Han thinks this man is lucky to only have his arm cut off, and if he continued, Yassel would have killed him. Yassel asks if Belka knows he's on the first floor, and he gets it. The first floor is a shithole, and the second floor is luxurious. He turns to leave, but says that he'll be moving up soon enough. Yassel sums up that out of 35 heroes, only 13 are allowed on the second floor. The second floor people can use all of the facilities freely, and the first floor cannot. If someone is found breaking these rules, they will die. You gotta get better and earn your spot to be able to relax. Yassel points at Han and says he's the perfect role model. His genius techniques clear the 15th floor. Han grabs her by the cheek and finishes her statement, telling the group to show off their skills if they want to live a good life. The master is watching. If he deems you worthy, you will be sent to the second floor. The group just gives the same BS excuse that they were taken here against their will, and it's not fair. Belkis draws his sword again, but Han looks at him. That's enough. Belkis yields, and Han says that he too was dragged here, and it was actually worse when himself and Jenna arrived. They didn't even have food, and one mistake meant synthesis. They didn't train every day because they liked it. The group assumes that Han is asking them to fight like him, and that's actually exactly what he is saying. There isn't a big need for support roles at the moment. Right now, only combat roles who show talent will make it to the second floor. Half of the people accepted this, and the other half is in denial. It could be worse, but at least there is a clear hierarchy for a system transition. You either need to summon more heroes or go about it gradually. There's always bound to be resistance, as another man screams that this is bullshit. They won't fight if they're being treated like garbage, and he won't accept this. Belkis chimes in that they don't even fight when they're well fed, and the man has a small crowd behind him, sweating profusely, but says that he knows the secret that Han is hiding. He knows how to change the master's mind. The master can't put his hands on us, and he is convinced that Han has been hiding this fact all along. He won't stand here and risk his life to fight monsters. That's insane. Some people gather behind him, and now Shatan and two parties are inoperable. A massive strike is ensuing, and Han grabs his sword. And ten people are refusing to fight, huh? They don't know their place. Han kicks the sword in the man's direction and tells the group that for punishment, they will cut off one arm each with that sword. And just like the man over there, if they do so, Han will let them live. The protesters' hearts sink, asking if Han has lost his mind. Han just laughs. If words don't work, then he will have to show him instead. The man regains his composure and says that they already know that they can refuse the master's orders. And technically, they're not wrong. Heroes have a right to obey or disobey. Yassel can't put a hand on you except for special circumstances. Edith tells these people to stop this and they only did that when their lives were at stake. She tries to reason but Han stops her, saying that she has a good attitude. The band continues but Yassel orders Valen and Leslie to enter the synthesis chamber. Belkis is intrigued, wondering if this is synthesis. He is told that it is, and now the two men that are about to die are in shock. Yassel tells them that there is no time. Why are you guys acting surprised? First time seeing it, what are you going to do? Han laughs saying how funny these protesters are, trying to fight a meaningless battle. Jenna scratches her head, they should have paid more attention. It's been a while since synthesis actually happened, but now they are about to experience this fear 
again. The two men are dragged into the chamber and the master approves. Belkis smiles at Alan. Nice to meet you again, friend. Light flashes and the two men are disintegrated and Belkis has a wicked smile. I'm sorry I won't be able to ask you anything now. And the synthesis is complete. Belkis levels up and learns a new skill. He walks out of the chamber with a devilish aura, saying how good he feels. And this isn't enough. He needs more offerings. Han tells the man that it's enough. His turn is over. Belkis says that that's a shame, and now Nerissa is called, with Oliver and Walter. Walter protests since he worked hard, and that was a mistake. Not Walter, Alter, and the young man next to him was called instead. He grabs the leader, saying that he lied. He told him nothing would happen. The man now knows the result of his actions, as Alter is being dragged away to his death. He protests that he was lied to, and he would have acted out if he knew. Yassel doesn't care, and the two men are synthesized into Nerissa, and she levels up. After seeing four people killed, Party 4's leader takes back his refusal, but now Jenna is called with Lawrence. The man screams, saying he will stop, and why are they still doing this? But Han sits and knows that this has to be done. To show the others what happens when you rebel. This is better than having Synthesis as the main operator. Fear is always necessary, in some instances. Edith is called now, and Liddell is the man who will be synthesized into her. He begs for mercy, telling Han to talk to the master, and Han tells the man that if he cuts off his own arm, he will do that. He said earlier that this would be an expensive lesson. Liddell freezes in fear, and Shatan says there's no way they can cut off their arms. That's too harsh. Han asks what's wrong with his request. Is an arm worth more than your life? Liddell asks Han to do it, but he refuses. The man screams if Han wants him to die, and Han says that's actually not such a bad idea. These guys have earned their fate. Han can't be nice to them for the sake of the future. If someone is determined enough to cut off a limb, Han will consider keeping them around. Of course, cutting off an arm isn't easy. A few people tried, but none succeeded. In order to cut off a limb in one try, you need swordsmanship skills related or a high strength stat. Otherwise, you need to hack it off. Sitan is now on the floor and he is called with Han. Han tells him that it's just them now, and the synthesis is complete. Han thinks that nothing happened, but his stats went up. Now, only 25 heroes remain. Someone yells at the fighting heroes, telling them that they are out of their mind. Belkus wants to see who said that, but Han tells him to leave it. Belkus thinks that there's still a lesson to teach, but Han tells him not to be angry. It's over, for now. Belkus doesn't understand why Han is so calm, he could have destroyed them. He turns to leave and tells Han that he will see him on the second floor. The master begins summoning again, and the machine fires up. And Han thinks from now on, the location of summons will be different based on ranks. The free gacha heroes will appear on the first floor, and the paid ones will appear on the second. Soon, that thing will begin. At least two will die here, and only a minority will make it to the second floor. Han tells his party not to relax, they could be downgraded at any time. Han says that in the future, a third floor will be built, and so on, and even their ranks will be divided. The next day, Party 1 wakes up enjoying their new accommodations, and Jenna says that breakfast is really good. Han sits beside her, saying of course it is, not so many people are eating, and Chloe's cooking skills have improved. Han looks out the window, and he can overlook all the facilities from here, and so can the people on the first floor. This should act as motivation for them to try harder. Han goes out to see Aaron training, asking how long he's even slept, and Aaron says only three hours. Han tells him that that's ridiculous, and we find out the newest change to the training grounds made it to where there's individual training areas, as well as a dual center. You can now lock the doors while training, so Han can use his Berker skill without worry. The dual center nullifies the fast regen heroes normally have, so people can duel with real life conditions, and if someone is seriously injured, they need to be pulled out quick. The waiting room has improved, but now Party 1 needs to improve as well. Right now, there's still a remaining slot in Party 1 and 2. Velkist and Nerissa are the best candidates, but Velkist is barbaric and has no fear. But he's talented. The skill he learned yesterday is very rare. It's a passive that changed status effects, like Rage, into Strength. So if you combine this with a status inflicting skill, he can get an amazing synergy. Nerissa falls behind him and she is cold and calm. She is good with stealth and info collection, and has great potential. The rest are pretty useless. Velkis looks over at Han, signaling him to come down. Han approaches and Velkis asks for him to teach him some new moves. His training partners are all pigs afraid of the blade. Han asks why the man doesn't like pigs and dogs. They're all beasts in the end. The two flare up their auras and lock eyes and begin their duel. The first strike sends shockwaves between the two swordsmen. Han dodges the next two slashes and gives Belkis the heavy kick to the stomach. The man coughs up blood but is smiling, loving the heat of the battle. His expression turns demonic and rushes back in at Han. He parries his strike, singing to himself that he doesn't even need to use Berserk in this duel, but down the line, he might have to. We shift to the next day and Party 1 is called. Yvoka comes first, asking what the fairy wants and why are they going out to a dungeon? 
Han says that that's probably not the case since they are down a member, but the master ordered an exploration. Hivoka didn't think that this was possible in this part of the week, and Han thinks that three options are always available. Exploration Dungeon opened ever since they cleared the 10th floor, but they're only now checking it out. Isel opens a rift, but Jenna questions why they can't use the gate they have next to them. Is this exploration thing even necessary? Aaron asks. And Han tells him that it really isn't and it will take a lot of time, maybe one or two days. That will translate to even more time inside of the waiting room. Yvoka questions why they're even being sent away for so long, but Han just tells her that she will see. The master is prompted to give the heroes an allowance to make their exploration easier, and each member is given 3,000 gold. Everyone is happy with their gold coins and the dungeon unlocks. They begin the mission and will return in two days. The party is transported and they are back in Nelsa. Jenna figures out where they are and is curious to why there is no fire or destruction. A lot of people died when they came here, yet it looks like a bustling city. Evoka doesn't even want to question it and Aaron asks what they need to do. Han tells the group that they probably don't need to fight and they should just go take a look around. Unlike main dungeons, exploration ones do not have a clear goal, and sometimes they can bring back amazing items and other times they can bring back nothing. And now the NPCs are able to see our heroes. The guard asks for an entry permit, but Han hands him a gold piece, asking if that will suffice. Another guard happily accepts this bribe and tells the group not to cause any issues. Jenna thinks that these guards are good for nothing, but money but money is excellent for this type of thing. Before they came to Nelsa, the city was absolutely destroyed, but now there is no trace of the fight. The group asks Han what kind of info they should look for, and Han tells them to do whatever they feel like doing. They are perplexed, but Han angrily repeats himself, go do whatever you want. The master gave you guys money, go get some food and look around. Evoka and Jenna get closer, trying to confirm Han's words. Does he really mean it? They can take a break? Han agrees that he will take care of the important stuff, and Yavoka nervously walks away, saying Han shouldn't regret what he just said. She'll leave the city. Han says that that's fine, and there will be no more breaks once they clear the 20th floor, so go have at it. The party gets excited, and Jenna wants to go with Han, but Han looks around and strangely sees a lot of mercenaries, and on a nearby wall sees a wanted poster for the princess that he saved. They charged her with heresy, demon summoning, and even rape. They just listed every crime that they could think of. Han just laughs at this, but a small kid approaches, asking if he is after the witch too. He can have big dreams, but it won't work. The whole nation is after her, but no one has found a clue. Han asks if this kid is calling the princess a witch, and he says that apparently, the princess took out the hearts of babies and sacrificed them, and she used banned dark magic. Han wants to hear more, but this boy says that he is quite busy. Han hands him a gold coin, which makes him rethink his whole attitude. He has all the time in the world now. He tells Han the princess's name, but she got her last name removed. Han asks how long this has been going on for, and the boy confirms his thoughts. Han thinks that a year has passed since he completed the 15th floor. It hasn't even been a week for him though. He's also seen the seal of the wanted poster too. It's the same symbol of the knights that he killed earlier. Putting all this together, the group of people are targeting the princess. She must be alive somewhere. Han asks if any monsters invaded this city and is told that that happened two years ago. But thankfully they got through that ordeal. Rumor has it that the witch herself caused the invasion, since monsters usually don't group up like that. Han thinks that they're really pinning everything on the princess and asks if there's anything else. And the boy tells him that there was a disease and monsters became wild and the weather has been getting colder. But the most noteworthy things are dungeons. This grabs Han's attention and a few years ago, a bunch of places that resemble historical sites popped up in the world. And people have been calling them dungeons. And they're really weird. Ordinary people can't enter and only a specific group can go in. Another rumor says that at the end of these dungeons is a special stone that can grant power. Han catches on and thinks that this can only be one thing thing, an advent stone, a source of the hero's third ability, in printing. Han assumes that there must be one here too, and the boy is surprised that he knew that. Han picked it up based on the amount of mercenaries he sees around. Han smiles and looks at the boy. A gold for talking isn't worth it, huh? How about you guide me to this dungeon? Han sees a man being carried out of the dungeon, missing an arm. This is why the kid didn't want to come. Next to the temple at the center of the city is a dungeon that appeared after the invasion. The stairway is the entrance and Han doesn't think it looks like much. But so many people wouldn't be standing guard if it wasn't. All kinds of treasures can be found inside, but most people don't make it out in one piece. The only way people can get into the dungeon is with an entry permit, and the city takes a percentage of the treasure someone finds inside. The kid thinks that he has done enough for that gold coin and asks to leave. But if Han has any more questions, he can always ask. Han asks how he can find him, but he runs off saying that that's Han's problem. Han turns back and thinks about the equipment people are bringing. They must plan to stay for more than a few days. Han will have to come back after he reassembles his party, and all the mercenaries are looking around in anxiety. No one is actually going in. It seems most of the people can't pass the gate. 
and after watching it for half an hour, it seems less than 10% of anyone can actually enter this dungeon. And if the leader can enter, his party can come with. Han is sure that he will be able to cross it, and the kid ends up coming back. Han asks why he returned so soon, and apparently, the gold that he was given is worth way more than he thought. Han won't give him any more, but the kid wants to give a service for free. He thinks the witch has been slandered by the order, but before he can continue, Han cuts him off. He doesn't need to know anymore. He offers to be a city guide and take Han to all the good places to eat, but Han tries to refuse, asking why the kid is still bothering him. But the reason he won't leave him alone is because Han reminds him of his little brother. Han turns around asking what he means, and the boy says that Han must be from the east. There was someone young that hung around with a group of kids that looks exactly like Han. Black hair and eyes. And the reason he even talked to Han was because of this resemblance. The kid tries to say the name, but Han tells him not to. The kid continues that the name wasn't that unique, but Han tells him to just guide him to a jeweler. Han approaches the shop and sees Jenna inside. Jenna questions who this kid following Han is, and she just bought a longbow. And apparently she can upgrade it for two more gold. Han takes one glance at the D-rank fancy longbow and tells Jenna that it's trash. He tells her to buy something a little bit more valuable like the stones over there. Jenna is surprised to see elemental stones and Han thinks the master would be pleased if they returned with some of these. Jenna is reluctant about returning her bow, but Han tells her to. What they will be getting is a regenerative stone. This stone is an item that allows one to experience boss stages that have been cleared already. It doesn't award experience, but the group will really be able to experience the mission. Han buys it ready to leave and Jenna asks him again about the kid following him. Han pretends not to know who this is, despite the boy's cries. His name is Josh and he is Han's tour guide. He has a secret investment plan and Han throws Josh another gold coin, telling him that his job here is done. The boy lights up with excitement, thanking Han for his investment. Han doesn't want to know about the business, but Josh vows to pay him back, and offers any other service that Han wants. Han doesn't want anything else, but just tells Josh to help the witch if he ever comes across her. He leaves, leaving Josh stunned, and Jenna asks who the witch is. Han gets her up to date and tells her that there's still a lot of time. They can look around. The evening comes and Yavoka complains that she couldn't go to the beach. Han wonders if she really tried and it seems there's a border around the area they're allowed to travel. The more floors they complete, the more they can travel. The group returns to the waiting room and sees a lot more heroes around. They ask how much time has passed and Han says it was about a week. Jenna notices that there is a new assistant in the workshop and is excited to start training again. Yavoka is dreading it but Jenna takes her to the bathhouse. Han asks Eren where he is going and he should rest. Why are you so stubborn? Do you want to destroy your body? Eren tries to argue but Han tells him tomorrow they will train and thinks there was a lot of people in Niflheim just like Eren but most of them did not have good outcomes and not everything is possible through hard work. If they cannot catch their goals by just effort it means they lack talent and should put their uses towards something else or worst case die in a mission. A fight is heard in the training grounds. Edith is training Ursher telling him that he is too slow. Han and Jenna watch, impressed at the intensity, but something has changed. Dika is not present. A notification pops up, changing hero loggings, displaying blueprints. The master drags Velkist and Nerissa to the second floor. Han notices that the newbies are now here as Vessel walk up. Han draws his sword and it seems that it's time for them to get new party members. Jenna wonders if she should go get the straws and Han wonders if whatever is planning something. Han welcomes the two to the second floor and apparently Dika was downgraded to the first since he couldn't kill the human monsters. There are fewer members now and Edith's party is only three people making it harder to advance. This is why Edith's party is training harder, so maybe the master will do an advanced summon. Edith doesn't think he will, and back to the present, smiles at Han, asking what's wrong with his stare. Nerissa asks if they're going to join party 1 and 2, and Han agrees. Nerissa immediately asks to join Han's party. Velkest is annoyed, telling Nerissa to know her place, but the girl thinks that she has other useful skills than just combat. Han approaches, saying they don't get to choose who joins. The master does. Jenna wonders why Nerissa wants to join so badly, but Han doesn't know. Nerissa said the rumors must be exaggerated, but she saw them for herself. Han thinks that the master must have used the regenerative stone. This stone was used to reclear missions, but whatever used it to show a replay of the mission to these two. Nerissa is in awe of how great Han is, and it's only natural she wants to be in the party with him. But what about party two? Edith asks. Nerissa just dismisses this, and she just prefers Han's group. Ursher curses the newbies, but Velka says his opinion doesn't matter. It's survival of the fittest. Velkist also wants to join party one, and swears he'll be more useful than Nerissa. Nerissa knows their luck-based methods to choose party members, but thinks they should try something a little different. Everyone has a suggestion, but they agree that Han should decide. 
Han is torn since Edith's party is missing two people and Jenna tells him that no one would complain if he makes a decision. He thinks to himself that normally he would choose Velkist, but his shitty personality stands in the way. He tells the two that both of them think they're worthy, so they should fight to see who gets to join. Han can't pick unless he sees their abilities in the dueling arena. Healing doesn't work, so fight until one of you surrenders. Velkist enters, never backing down from a fight, asking if it's okay to kill Nerissa. Only if you can, Han says coldly. Han tells him to fight however they see fit. Nerissa pulls out a bottle of poison, making Velkast worried. She coats her weapon with a paralysis poison, and her skills are all related to some sort of poison. And this is the first time she has used it against a human. Velkis smiles and draws his blade, and the two request a duel. They begin as Han watches outside, and the duel starts and Velkast rushes in. But Nerissa prepares a barrage of stabs. He dodges them all and swings at Nerissa, but she manages to parry. The two continue and Ursher yells that Velkist is fighting way different from when they were sparring. But Edith tells her teammate that now this man is using his full power. Han tells the group to watch closely. They might learn something. Both have weapon techniques at around 4, just like Ursher, but have different ideologies when it comes to combat. Nerissa dodges a strike and sends a wide slash that Velkist ducks under. Han notices Nerissa is utilizing her movement, and Yavokal appears, chiming in as well. But Han just asks where the hell she came from, and the two continue. As Nerissa charges in, she pulls a dagger from her back. She throws it at Velkast, but he barely turns his head. But he got scratched with the dagger, infecting him with the poison, and is slowly losing health. The paralysis effect kicks in, and Nerissa thinks she won. But in her hesitation, Velkis rushes in, punching her in the stomach with the hilt of his sword, sending her into the cage. Velkis says he can't move right thanks to this bitch, but he won, and looks towards Han, and asks if he has any complaints. Han makes up his mind, and Nerissa is the one who will join his party, which makes him question Han with anger. Jenna is excited, and Edith and Ursher are surprised. The only ones who really understood what happened were those with a higher level. The fight had a good ending, and Nerissa pushed herself into a corner, on purpose to make Velkis lower his guard. The double dagger technique was all for deceit. It was to get in one attack, but Velkis trusted his own ability and kept pushing. Velkis asks Han to repeat what he said, but Han keeps his original answer. Han explains that his group is made of a swordsman, mage, spearman, and archer. All four are combat-based. They need Nerissa to be able to gather intel. Han thought Velkis would be a lot stronger to compromise, but he was a mistake. Velkist argues that he only got damaged due to a dirty trick. And honestly guys, I would have loved to see Velkist in Party 1. Han says the man is talented, but not needed, and asks if he wants to fight, he will take him on, if he can last at least a minute. Velkist smiles and asks to trade places with a different member, and points at Aaron, the obvious weak link of the party. He's watched all the fights, and it was interesting, one person didn't fit in. Aaron will just drag them down. Jenna protests that Aaron is doing just fine and for him to shut it, but Aaron says nothing. Han tells everyone to be quiet and he agrees that Aaron isn't absolutely needed and they could change formations, but that's if the swordsman is stronger than their spearman. Aaron stands with his spear drawn ready to challenge Velkist. Everyone is in Velkist to stand on his words. Aaron has been here longer than him and is surprised Velkist is even challenging him. The man accepts and agrees to join party two if he loses. Han looks towards Aaron and asks if he wants to accept and it's about time. Han thinks that Aaron Aaron is pushing himself too hard, and at this rate, it won't end well, if he keeps down this path. But Aaron still has a lot of time. He has been with Han for too long, and he can still fulfill a role for the next coming floors. In order to overcome the situation, Han needs to see Aaron's determination. Aaron's eyes glow, and he accepts the challenge. Velka smiles, and the terms are written. Both sides agree, and the door shuts. They stand opposite each other and begin their fight. Jenna is surprised that Aaron even agreed, but Han knows that this will be good for the Spearman. He has a chance to win, if he believes in his training. Both have weapon skills of four, but Velkist has a few more passives. But Aaron overall has the advantage and experience. Velkis swings in, but Aaron intercepts and smacks his chin with the spear. Velkis smiles and the duel is heating up. Aaron is determined to win and he has fought for his life for months on end. And this guy only just got here. Velkis has never even fought a boss monster. Aaron continues to push back and spearmen have an advantage in melee combat. Velkist manages to dodge a thrust, but Aaron swings his spear, smacking his back, and continues his assault. He smacks down on Velkist, and Ursher is loving seeing his senpai own this newbie. Spears have been used for a long time in wars, hunting, and have always proven useful. And thanks to the distances they can cover, they were effective in large-scale battles. But they proved to be useless in one-on-one -on -one battles. There is about a meter difference in a maximum range between a spear and a sword. It is definitely an advantage in some cases, but there's nothing a spearman can really do to react against quick slashes. They prove to be useless even against dagger attacks, and do not have as much range as a bow or an arrow. But this is when you're talking about humans. In a place where humans regularly transcend their limits, this logic doesn't apply. Ursher is loving what he's seeing, and Aaron continues his assault. He takes his spear back, ready to swing 
on Velkist. Velkist manages to jump over and does an acrobatic leap out of range. Han thinks that Velkist had to be talented before coming here, and he instantly accepted the situation as soon as he was brought here. And Eren has dueled Han hundreds of times. He is used to fighting people better than him. A swordman and a spearman have different combat tactics. Jenna is worried looking on and thinks that Eren is doing well, but he's not fighting like himself. Evolka wants to know what she's talking about, it looks like he's winning, but Jenna tells her to look closer. The number of attacks that Eren is landing is starting to go down. Velkest is adjusting and Edith chimes in as well. The man kneels down saying this fight is getting boring. Eren's techniques are precise but very straightforward. His disadvantage is that his strikes are easy to read and Velkest has a sharp eye. Considering the fact that he saw through Nerissa's attack, he definitely has good observational skills and he might obtain a skill called the mind's eye. The two get close in each other's faces and Velkest asks if Eren is playing around. The two disengage and Velkest asks why Eren is going easy on him. Why are you underestimating me? Eren remains quiet. But Velkis says that party one fights each other in training with the intent of killing. But this is different. What's the reason that Eren is not attacking Velkis's weak points? Han has noticed this as well, calling Eren soft, and thinks to himself, Eren's spearmanship is easy to read, but Velkis adjusts fast. There's only one thing Eren could do. He tells the spearman, since when did you consider the life of your opponent? Are you that strong that you can go easy on someone else? Show me what you've got. A sweat beads down Eren's face, and Velkis smiles. He twirls his spear, telling Velkis not to be mad at him if he ends up dying. Velkis smiles, ready to go back into the heat of the battle, and the two's auras flare up. Eren grips his spear and charges right in at Velkist. A stab barely misses his face and it seems Eren is speeding up. The strikes are becoming too fast for Velkist to deal with. Eren takes his low stance and runs towards Velkist, but a stab, but Velkist barely manages to jump over it. The stabs keep continuing and Velkist is getting used to it again, dodging them in quick succession. Eren winds back his spear to send a wide slash, but Velkist dodges under. The spear ends up breaking the dueling arena. Some time passes, but after blood staining the arena, it seems that Eren is the one who lost. After a drawn out battle, Velkist is the one who stands, the victor. Ursher is completely shocked, asking what trick Velkis played. He had to do something cowardly. He tries to argue, but Roderick tells him that that's enough. Velkis has won the duel, and Evoca thinks that Eren was gonna win. It's really weird. Jenna has the same thought, but in one attack, Eren lost. Just one attack. Han thinks that it's hard to describe. Velkis just doesn't have good senses. Something else is here. As the fight went on, he read every attack that Eren threw at him, and it's certain, and over time he'd started taking less and less attacks. As the fight went on, Velkis had the advantage. He waited for a chance to turn the tables, and in one attack was all he needed to win. And when his opportunity arised, he took it without a second of hesitation. He possesses a cold logic and observational skills. He uses methods that require patience. Velka says that it's quite a shame. It would have been more fun if Eren didn't go easy from the start. Eren grips his bleeding shoulder saying that he agrees. Nerissa chimes in that she's dissatisfied with the results, but she didn't think that Eren is ready. Han understands the meaning of this duel and will keep his promise. Velkist will join party one, and Eren is out. Han suggests a different party formation, and now the new party one is made. The master agrees, and now Eren is without a party. Eren comes to terms with the outcome, and everyone watching is feeling the same sadness for their comrade. Han tells them that they're here to survive, and not to build friendships. And anyone who doesn't understand that will die. Jenna tries to say something, but Han cuts her off, telling her to go to sleep. But now, party one is absolutely stacked. Han tells the two newcomers that life doesn't get easy after joining his party. It actually only gets harder. But this is exactly why Belcast is here. He wants to get stronger. Everyone leaves, leaving Han watching Eren defeated inside of the cage. He tells him to leave the dueling center so he can heal, but Eren doesn't want to. Han begins climbing the stairs, asking Eren why he didn't target Belkist's weak points, and basically gave him a chance to win. Eren says he doesn't want to kill his own teammates, but Han doesn't believe that. He didn't raise Eren to be this soft. But it turns out, Eren could have won against him, but he knows his own lack of talent. And after fighting Belkist over time, the man became stronger and stronger. Eren doesn't have the right to kill him, someone who shines brighter than him. And after watching the two new recruits, he realized the wasted effort that he puts in every day into training. Han understands his reasoning, because Eren doesn't want to cripple the master. He needs these two prodigies. And Eren can't even begin to compare to Han or Jenna. Han understands and offers a new role to Eren as an instructor. The job is to teach newbies on the first floor, and Eren is perfect for it. 
Usually this job is fought after, but Han will make sure Aaron can get it, and asks the man what he thinks about it, teaching others. Aaron hesitates, which makes Han question what his goal is, to get back to his family or to become stronger. Aaron looks up and sheds a tear, and accepts his position, but Han tells him to quit it. There's no point in doing a job you don't want to do. Han used to know someone just like Aaron, really untalented. His spearmanship was only level 2, and no matter how many times Han tried to throw him away, he always came back. Do you want to get stronger, Aaron? The man doesn't answer at first, but as Han turns to walk away, he gets down on both knees, begging Han to teach him, with tears coming down his face. He never wants to think these pathetic thoughts again. Is it possible for someone like me to get stronger? Han says that there is. Wait for the second floor gate to open. Han will take him to Niflheim. Aaron questions where that is, but Han tells him not to worry. It's a great place to be. We shift now to Jenna, introducing herself to the new party members, but they straight up ignore her. Han notices this awkwardness and tells the two that they should be aware of the battles with the regen stone. They fight with fire, so they are going to need to get used to it. Learn the fire resistance skill as fast as you can. Belkis questions the method of plunging his hand into fire, but Han says it's effective. Belkis promises to learn it in four days, and Han tells Jenna that she needs to make up for Aaron's position, and now himself and Belkis are short range. But Han warns Belkis not to fight out of their support range. Self-belief is good, but being cocky and not listening makes you useless. Belkis agrees, and Han looks towards Nerissa. She has many useful skills. Swordsmanship, dagger throwing, fast movement, stealth, Poison? Han asks what she was doing before coming here. An assassin, maybe? Nerissa answers vaguely, something like that, and Han thinks to himself that she would have had to be an advanced summon if she was a real assassin, but she must have had some experience. He tells the girl that she will have a mid-range position, and she will switch depending on the situation. She will also be in charge of collecting information. Han knows that someone like her will agree verbally, but if they don't like their role, conflict will soon arise. Evoca questions what she should do, but Han just tells her plainly that she just needs to run away, which turns her into stone. Edith is listening in, telling Han that her party is still short members. Han tells her to go to the first floor if she can't find anyone. There's bound to be useful people shortly. Dika took up a role as an instructor, and was ordered to focus on the students who show the most determination. If there are no summons, this is their only option. Free summons are still being used, and at least one talented person should arrive from them. Edith sighs, but doesn't see an alternative. Han warns her not to show favoritism too soon. It might lead to discrimination. Bullying, you mean? As we see this exact thing happening to a blue-haired fellow on the first floor. We shift to the next day and Han is in the dueling center with his new comrades. He tells them today they will fight to learn each other's weaknesses. Velkest is excited to fight Han and Han tells Nerissa to come as well. Velkest, however, wants to duel Han one-on-one -on -one, as the two men's aura flare up. But we get a flashback when Velkist went to the first floor and found a group of people who had been excluded from Party 3. They tried to fight Velkist, but it ended just as you would expect, with them missing limbs. And that same group seems to be going around bullying heroes they don't like. It didn't cause a huge problem right now because there aren't many heroes that match the second floor candidates. We go back to Han's duel as Velkist happily makes the first move. Han parries, sending his sword flying that there are people levels above him, taunting the man. Seems you're tough when fighting people on the first floor, huh? Velkist smiles with sweat beating down his face. Han sure is strong, but he is happy he got to join party 1. He's gonna need Nerissa to help him fight. The girl coats her blade and the two take their stances. Han is ready to take them on. We don't see the actual fight, but of course Han whooped both of their asses. Velkis and Nerissa are visibly exhausted. They thought they would have a better chance together, but Han tells them they have absolutely no teamwork, and at their level, they might not even be able to take Jenna. Jenna hears this and comes up, and it seems Han wants her to fight them next. She seems scared, but Han tells her that she is much stronger, and he orders the two to fight Jenna, until they can win. Velkest asks if Han is messing with him, he would never lose to Jenna, and Nerissa is slowing him down. It seems the two can't stand each other. Han tells them to fight instead of talk, and he will give them the duels they want, if they can beat Jenna. Velkas tells Nerissa to step back and he will handle this. The fight begins and Jenna lets off the first arrow and Velkas blocks, but starts to panic after he sees a dozen more fired at his compromised position. Jenna activates her find weakness skill and pelts Velkas full of arrows, sending one a centimeter from his neck. Han laughs since he tried to warn the man, but Velkas just smiles. It seems he is smaller than he thought. Han tells them again that the two of them need to work together to defeat Jenna. They have two days, and as they saw through the regenerative stone, the party has fought against countless enemies during their mission. So why are you trying to fight alone? You two don't even have the basics down. But the two are still stubborn, as Nerissa wants to take the next one-on-one. -on -one. But after a short amount of time, Jenna painted a picture around her full of arrows. Han sighs since neither of them even lasted a minute. And now the two understand that they need to work together in order to win, even if they don't like it. 
they have to try. They charge in at Jenna, but their teamwork is still lacking, as Jenna systematically handles them. Han yells, asking what the hell the two are doing. They are fighting worse than if they were fighting alone. Nothing is going to change no matter how much you curse each other. If you can't handle this, you'll be switched to party two. The two argue at each other, but both of them can't land a single hit on Jenna. Han watches on, and he knows their egos are hurt by this display. Jenna grew up in the wild, and she's used to fighting beasts. You need to learn quickly when fighting intelligent creatures. The two rush in again, but at the end of the day for Jenna, these two are nothing more than prey. Nighttime comes and the two are riddled with arrow wounds. Han orders them to step out. They are too injured to continue. They do so exhausted from their battle and Yavoka comes out of nowhere commenting on the duo. Han asks why she is here and she's supposed to be training. And Han warns her that if she doesn't go back to that, he's gonna tell Chloe to only feed her potatoes. Han tells the two newcomers that training is done for today, despite their cries. Jenna didn't even get a chance to train at all by herself. They need to respect other people's time. Han is going to look for different members tomorrow, if the two can't beat Jenna. And Han isn't joking. They get one more duel in 24 hours. If they lose, it's over. Don't disappoint me. Jenna is shocked at Han's request. Are you serious? Han asks when he has ever lied, but Jenna remembers multiple times where he's done so. But she is bonked in the head for talking shit. Han tells her that they are useless if they can't work together. But Jenna questions who else they could add. Han knows that today's display showed the two newbies that distrusting each other will be their downfall. If they can't change that, it's already over. The next day comes and Jenna is at the dueling center asking where the two are, but finds out that they requested some additional time to train. Yavoka knows what is about to happen as Han tells her that today's training will be extra hard since it's only the three of them. But out of the corner of Jenna's eye, she spots the newbies approaching. They are ready. The same rules apply. This is their last chance. They need to show some good teamwork, even if they don't like it. Jenna prepares her bow but is shocked. Instantly, both of them are standing still. She lets off a volley of arrows at Nerissa but Velkis blocks for her. Nerissa uses this opportunity to throw daggers at Jenna. Jenna dodges and lets off more arrows, but now Belkis can see her shots. He blocks the flurry and learned the projectile resistance skill. The two rush in at Jenna and she shoots another barrage, but the two fall into formation, blocking as they run. And after a second, they disperse left and right, attacking Jenna from both sides. Jenna manages to jump away, but a dagger is thrown at her. She barely dodges that, but as she lands, she feels an intense bloodlust as Velkest is ready to kill her. He lunges his sword, but she falls backwards to dodge. She jumps away, but Nerissa was waiting. She puts her dagger at Jenna's throat, ending the duel. Velkest is happy, and so is Han. It seems the two finally learn to fight together. He analyzes their plan, and Nerissa was able to hide her presence, and it gave her the opportunity to end the duel. They improved a lot in one day, and the strength of the group is more important than the strength of any one individual. Belkis wants to know if they can beat Han fighting like that, but of course, they didn't stand a chance, and Han beat them close to death every time. There is still time until the real tower floors, and whatever hasn't sent them on any missions, giving them time to adjust. But little by little, Party 1 was becoming a team. Han lets the two rest after whooping their ass, and lets them know starting now, him and Jenna will fight them two on two, which completely depresses them. He tells them to loosen up since they'll be shifting teams, so they can all learn combination attacks. They need to be able to work with everyone else. Velkis questions why they're training like this. Watching Han on the 5th and 10th floor, it was him doing everything. What's the point of this training? Han tells Velkis that he's retarded. Han wasn't able to do anything by himself. If it wasn't for the sacrifices of Zidin Hansen and Yavoka fixing the dam, he wouldn't even be here to train them. Teamwork is the only thing that will take them high in this tower. But even Han isn't strong enough to carry them alone, here on out. He thinks that the two new recruits he has are growing fast, and soon they will be up to par. And now the group spends most of every day sparring. They take turns fighting in different pairs, learning different combinations. There was a little effect where whatever team Han was on would always win, but over time the balance started to shift. And after a week they put Yavolka in as well to practice formation training, and began teaching the two how to utilize their strengths. Nerissa is more impressed after each lesson that Han teaches. She can't even imagine what he used to do before coming here. But still, no one believes that he was a farmer. Interrupting the group is a call to battle from the master. Everyone gets up in excitement, and Eren wishes Han well. Han asks who these people are at the gate, and Nerissa tells him that this is the third generation. The people who came after the floors being separated. These newcomers watch on, shit-talking party one, which makes Velkis turn with rage. A man comes over to Han, begging to be moved to the second floor. He has a chronic illness, but Han just smacks the shit out of this motherfucker, asking why he's lying. Anything you could possibly have is being healed constantly. Don't you dare show me your face again. Yassel pops out, warning the newcomers not to mess with party one. Han asks when the people started getting like this, but Nerissa tells him it happened ever since the floors were divided. But they don't have time to worry about that. 
The gate opens and Han tells the two newbies to follow his orders closely. They are transported into the 16th floor. The mission type is exploration. Valkus is confused, but Han tells him that something like this has been done on the 6th floor. It shouldn't be too difficult. As the team looks around at this mansion that they're transported to, Larissa thinks that she might know where they are. But once she is certain, she will let Han know. Han orders everyone to investigate, but a lot of the doors are not usable. Han orders Nerissa to look around in stealth and report back when she is done. For now, the group will move in formation. They maneuver the mansion, and Yvoka questions why there isn't anyone around. But I guess they'll find out pretty soon. Velkis comments on the weird layout of the space, and how it doesn't really make sense. It has to look strange on the outside. Yvoka comments on how smart Velkis is, which makes him start to get angry. Han tells the group to be quiet as they approach three different paths. They are in a labyrinth. This isn't a normal mansion. The paths twist like a maze. Han orders the group to stand by until Nerissa comes back. Jenna starts to get worried and Velkus is pretty bored and wants to fight some enemies. Han tells them to relax, they'll get their chance soon enough. There is 100% enemies on this floor. Five minutes pass and Nerissa returns. She went down the middle path and realized the maze isn't too complicated. There isn't any traps or enemies, but she did stumble upon something, as you see a maid hunched over the floor, covered in blood. A door opens up as party one approaches this crying maid. She isn't reacting to our heroes, but begins coughing up blood. The group wonders whether or not to kill her, but Han's rule of thumb is not to mess with something if they don't know what will happen. Jenna thinks the girl is suffering from an illness, but the group cannot afford to help her. Unfortunately, they still can't find a way out and are seemingly trapped in this room. Belkis bites his lip, bored out of his mind, but Han tells him to keep his head in the game. Something could happen soon. Han starts thinking about the labyrinth, but Nerissa interrupts. There's enemies on the way. They're in the next hallway. Several armed guards with swords, spears, and crossbows. Han wants to ambush them and orders Jenna and Nerissa to take care of the ranged enemies, while the other three handle the melee ones. Han peeks past the door looking at the helpless soldiers and counts down from three. And on one, the entire party moves out, killing soldiers almost instantly. Velkis starts to laugh as he decapitates two men, and the rest are handled easily. But Han is not convinced that this is over, and he takes a look around. He throws his shield towards the second floor door, and as he's suspected, it's locked. Han tells Yavoka to prepare a spell towards the other doors, and just as he says this, and more level 17 human soldiers pour out ready to fight. Yavoka, with a shortened cast time, immediately begins to cook them alive. Han orders Nerissa and Velkis to support him. The two follow as they engage the remaining soldiers in melee, while Jenna supports with her arrows. Han slices the last one and tells the group to rest for now. Yvoka asks how Han knew there would be more enemies, and he told her that it was from hitting his shield on the second floor. It wasn't opened, so it signaled their fight wasn't done. But now they are free to proceed. It seems this mission is over. Velkis isn't too satisfied. Han just calls him a bonehead and the group climbs the stairs, clearing the stage. Velkis and Nerissa level up and Yavoka is the MVP. The master gets 50 gold. Jenna asks Han if the next floor will be similar, and Han thinks that it might be. As he is pondering, Jenna leaves. Nerissa sticks around saying that she has some information about the place they were at. We shift to Han's room as he sits with Nerissa and she starts explaining what she knows. She used to work inside of that mansion. That place is called the Golden Mansion, home of the Haojian clan, one of the famous four clans. Han just laughs since what would he know about that? He's just a simple farmer. But Nerissa still doesn't believe that lie. What Han understood from her conversation is the continent of Tanoir is dominated by a single country, the Empire, and inside exists four major clans that each possess as much power as the Imperial family. Asinus, Lantia, Schutenberg, and Haugian. Nerissa assumes that the stage was the Golden Mansion, but there was some major differences from when she worked there, so she can't be 100% certain. She doesn't know why they are doing these missions, but feels a strange connection between them. Han confirms that she said there is a total of 5 floors, and asks if this clan has any relation to monsters. Nerissa says that there isn't a connection, but it is said that this family has the blood of dragons flowing within them. Han takes a sip of his tea. A dragon, huh? The 20th floor is a serious achievement in Pick Me Up. This is the part of the game that separates the noobs from the real masters. The floor is the same for everyone. A boss monster appears, depending on the account. And the strength of these monsters can't be compared to the previous floors. And less than half of the total player base can actually get past this floor. Nerissa saw Han rescue the princess, but can't understand why they're in the Haojian mansion. Han asks if their mission is a conflict of interest with her, killing the people inside of this mansion. But she just smiles, saying that this is something she was hoping to do one day. And she says that a little bit too happily. This chick is crazy, but I mean, I kind of like it. This was all the information that Nerissa had for Han, but Han asks Yassel to come out of hiding. How long is she planning to sit there in the corner? 
She comes out embarrassed, but Han asks her what she wants. She says she's just nervous since Han is climbing the tower again, but Han just tells the fairy that the real test is coming. We will see if whatever truly wants to play this game. Yassel asks on the info that Nerissa gave, and it was indeed helpful to Han. The order to capture the princess came from the Haugen clan, so Han is beginning to understand the full picture. There is two things that he learned from Nerissa. The Golden Mansion has five floors that matches up perfectly with floors 16 through 20. Next, the bloodline is related to dragons. Dragons, so the boss monster most likely is a dragon. They are absurdly strong creatures without many weaknesses. But Han is relieved that it won't be a pure-blooded dragon. Right now, Han needs to thoroughly prepare for this boss fight and tells Yassel to be ready when he needs it. Party 1 is thrusted into the 17th floor and now they are on the second floor of the mansion headed to the third. This place has more passageways than the last and Han tells his group to prepare themselves. If this is a real labyrinth, it could take them a couple days. Jenna is scared they might starve to death but Han tells her not to be. He thinks to himself that the difficulty on this account isn't normal. The group easily completes this floor, slaying enemies and avoiding traps. The stage is cleared and Velkist is the MVP. They immediately go into the next floor and maneuver the maze as well. They clear the 18th floor and the 19th soon after, and the group exits back to the waiting room. Jenna is just happy that they didn't starve to death, but the reason they were able to do it so easily was because of Han. All of a sudden, the master constructs a new building, the Depository Level 1. Evoka questions what this is, but Han tells her it's a place to store many different things. But there's a difference. It's used to bury heroes. The master may look back on heroes that died in the game, and can even check their memories. Han is now seen in the training grounds and notes how the master has spent time letting Party 2 climb the 16th floor, and also Party 3. He tells the group that shortly they will try the 20th. He tells Jenna to focus on learning the strongbow skill, and Yavoka is ordered to increase her power with flame magic up to the fourth circle. Larissa offers to go into the weekday dungeons to prepare some lethal poisons, and Velkist just wants to spar with Han with real weapons. Han just laughs. First thing in the morning, huh? Han actually likes the man's personality. He never gives up no matter how many times he loses. He's much different than Eren. Yvoka pops out of nowhere and she also wants to do combat training. But Han just reminds her that she said she didn't want to participate. But after seeing the depository, she changed her mind. We flash back to Han explaining this building and although he can't bring back dead heroes, it's used to get back the gear that they had. Velkist and Jenna have funny reactions to this but Yvoka is stressed out. She's worried someone's going to die on the 20th floor. Jenna just hugs her and they have Han so they have nothing to worry about. But this makes Jenna even more worried, since they almost died on the 15th floor. Han talks to Nerissa, asking if she's scared, but she smiles confidently. If she was scared, she would have never offered to join Han's party. We shift back to the training grounds, and Yavoka and Velkist are tag-teaming against Han. Han sidesteps the flame spell, and Velkist rushes in. Han blocks his first strike, and Velkist levels his sword skill to 5. And Han also levels his to 8. Jenna continues her training and unlocks the strongbow skill. Han drops his wrist weights that he was using, and on some Dragon Ball Z shit, they break the ground. The preparations for the 20th floor are going smoothly, and we see a snapshot of Han's level. He has 43 strength, 10 intellect, 39 HP, and 37 agility, and a drop down of all his skills are shown. And during this time, they received some useful people for the second floor. A pharmacist was added and was assigned to create healing potions, and Dika was allowed back into the second floor from being a good instructor. And he immediately thanks Han for recommending him. However, just getting better at fighting isn't enough to progress. The support jobs are also important, and each one has more trainees. The blacksmith can now make up to D-plus rank weapons, and Party 3 properly started climbing the tower. There is a possibility they might be needed on the 20th floor, since it could be a raid type dungeon. The warehouses are full of equipment, and there will be no better time to try the 20th floor. It will be difficult, but whatever should know that already, from reading Han's manual. Even he had a hard time. Everyone he had died three times attempting that floor. But they cannot afford to fail. Not once, and not ever. Party 1 approaches the gate, and Han tells them this is the last chance they will have to do what they need to do. Han tells him that it's too late to write a will, and actually Yavoko is writing one with magic. Everyone else is confident as Party 1 is ready to attempt the boss floor. They get a warning and it seems that this floor actually is a raid type floor, and requires 3 parties to enter. Parties 1 through 3 are grouped, which makes Jenna excited. The master did get better at the game, and sent the sacrifice in to see the floor first, before the main force goes in. But this guy is not excited to be killed like this, but Yassel forces him to enter. The guy didn't last even a few minutes and now it's party one's turn, as they agree to enter first. 
Yassel tells everyone to listen to Han, which makes Felkis question why she kisses his ass, and the group enters the 20th floor. Han sees a similar hallway to the previous floors. Han tells his party to get ready. The mission will start once he opens these doors. He does so and a red light shines through, and more warning signals appear. Floor 20. Mission type? Subjugation. The heroes face a single man who curses them. It's all because of them this is happening. Han doesn't let him speak and orders Jenna and Yavoka to fire. They do so and Jenna puts a hole in the man and Yavoka sets him ablaze. Han isn't foolish and orders the rest of his party to flank him. The melee members start to rush in but the real enemy is revealed. A level 42 half black dragon. The master gets a notification that this is a unique monster. Han tells his party to stay focused and Jenna continues using her strongbow skill. But her arrows cannot pierce the dragon's skin. Yavoka tries as well, but the dragon is resistant to physical and magical spells. Even Han rushes in to strike the beast, but it's also blocked. The same alert pops up. This enemy is resistant to physical attacks. Nerissa and Velkist try, but get the same result. Han orders them to back off for now, as the dragon balls up and starts shooting its scales into our heroes. Nerissa is caught by one and is bleeding, but quickly prepared a health potion. Han is concerned that nothing is working on this beast. Velkist smiles, but he's also worried. Han explains that their attacks are not getting through, which makes his party worried. How are they supposed to kill this thing? But there's no time to talk, as the three engage the dragon again. All of the party's attacks have no effect. As they scream out, Han orders them all to retreat. He will fight this thing alone, but even his attacks don't work. He tells his group that the dragon only focuses one person, don't waste energy attacking, but they have another problem, as the scales start to turn into new enemies, corrupted shadows. Han will tank the dragon as his party handles these new shadows. Han tells his party that there's definitely a way to handle this dragon, as he blocks a strike head on. Velkis starts making quick work of the shadows, and the rest of party 1 follow suit. Han thinks about the monster's attack pattern, it's not too complex. But this resistance is starting to piss him off. Han continues his assault, but nothing is changing. He gets hit in the leg, causing him to bleed, but quickly pops a potion and charges back in. But he's hit again and again, causing him to bleed once again. Jenna tries to help, but Han yells for her to take care of the shadows first. Yavoka and Velkist question what to do, but Han can't think of anything. When will this phase end? An invincible foe? An endless wave of summoned creatures? A hopeless fight? Han notices the soldiers watching the fight from the ramparts. Velkis is enjoying this floor, but Han isn't having a fun time. A notification is seen. Field formation is complete. The master can now deploy the other squads. He summons them on the ramparts and they see what's going on. They try to help but they can't pass the barrier. But they have their own problems, as the twisted soldiers turn towards them. There is a goddess statue with mysterious energy around it, with human soldiers blocking their path. Roderick understands the goal and Han tells the other parties that he's counting on them. Party 2 starts their assault and Han tells his own party to focus down all of the adds. Yvoka prepares a spell as the rest of Party 1 defends her. Han continues to take away the dragon's attention and Yvoka casts, dealing with a large amount of the shadows. She follows up with a burn and transcend, but is starting to feel fatigued. Jenna hands her another mana potion and the minions are handled. Han looks at the dragon and is struggling, and the dragon swings its tail, but all of a sudden, Han's sword begins to glow, and now his strikes make the dragon bleed. Party 2 has captured the altar, weakening the dragon. The goddess blessing is activated, and the master gets a prompt to swipe on the screen to empower his heroes. And now everyone in the raid's weapons begin to glow. Party 1 has a new confidence as they finally get ready to take on this son of a bitch.